Chapter 1 Yearning for Necromantic Originality In the quiet of the night, a lone figure sat in their room, shrouded in darkness, saved by the erratic flickering of their computer screen. The room itself seemed to breathe in the soft glow of the monitor. The room's walls were adorned with striking posters depicting fantastical landscapes and eerie mythical creatures, including menacing skeletons, zombies, and enigmatic figures found only within the realms of fictional fantasies. On one side of the room, a substantial bookshelf held its ground. Its shelves were meticulously arranged with well-loved volumes encompassing a diverse array of epic fantasy tales, such as light novels, mangas, and comic books. Each of these books shared a common, haunting-themed necromancy. A floor-to-ceiling window on the opposite side of the room was veiled by thick curtains, barely allowing slivers of moonlight to infiltrate the room. The ambient darkness cocooned the space, creating a desolated ambience. Seated in a plush, high-backed chair, the solitary figures stood in place. Their fingers danced gracefully across the keyboard and mouse, their gaze fixated on the glowing screen. The screen displayed a sprawling landscape. Lush forests extended as far as the eye could see, their towering trees swaying gently in the night breeze. Shimmering waterfalls cascaded down emerald cliffs, their crystalline waters reflecting the moon's radiant beams. In the distance, a colossal, ancient castle perched atop a hill, its spires reaching for the sky. The individual's in-game avatar, a heroic figure with a formidable cane at their side and a billowing black cloak, stood poised at the forest's edge. By their side, an entourage of numerous figures loyally stood, responding to their every command with unwavering loyalty. Yet, in the midst of this enchanting digital realm, the individual's increasingly frustration began to show. Bathed in the glow of the computer screen, they couldn't help but feel a growing sense of annoyance. Ah! What a joke! Become a storyteller? Weaving my own narrative? Unparalleled freedom? He scoffed, his voice tinged with incredulity. What a load of bullshit! With a frustrated sigh, the individual pushed the keyboard away, his hands dropping to the mouse figure as to log out from the game, abandoning their digital adventures. He rose from his chair, left it behind, and walked over to his bed, where a hoodie laid in plain sight. Slipping it on, he headed to his small balcony. Outside, the city street sprawled before him, its alleys and avenues veiled in the night. The chill in the air nipped at his skin as he withdrew a pack of cigarettes and a lighter, extracting one with practiced ease. Igniting it, he inhaled deeply, watching the tendrils of smoke intertwine with the cold breeze. His gaze was fixed on the cityscape below. Tisk! Tisk came the reproachful sound as the man indulged in his nightly ritual of smoking. His tranquil moment was abruptly disrupted by the disapproving noise from someone nearby. Huh? Come on, not again. Can I enjoy a quiet cigarette in peace? His neighbor stood just a breath away, separated only by the narrow gap formed by the balcony and the enclosing walls. Ever even felt a damn shred of shame, huh, the neighbor sneered, their voice dripping with disgust. Night after night, you strut your lazy ass out here, puffing on those damn cancer sticks. Back in my day, I busted my ass to scrape by. And you? You've got everything handed to you on a silver platter, yet you're holed up in your cave, glued to those damn video games, jerking off like it's a full-time job, and sucking down those damn cigarettes like they're air. Look, old lady, he retorted with a touch of frustration, every single fucking night, it feels like you're waiting here just to pounce on me with your useless lectures. Does that really make you feel good? Does berating someone somehow add meaning to your own miserable fucking life? He paused for a moment, his eyes narrowing with intensity. Yeah, I'm living in a world loaded with resources and knowledge, but it's no walk in the park either. Back in your day... You put in your time at 16 bucks an hour, maybe snagged a mortgage in a decade. Nowadays, even if I grind away at a $40 an hour gig my whole life, I'd barely make a dent in this never-ending stack of bills. How dare you speak to your elders in such manners? How did your parents raise Y- dash? Before the neighbor could continue her scolding, the man cut her off with a puff of smoke he inhaled from his cigarette. Cough, cough. Ah. I've had a lousy day already, 
I don't even feel like smoking anymore, the man grumbled. With a resigned sigh, he plucked the cigarette from his mouth, cast it to the ground, and extinguished it with the sole of his sandal. He retreated to the sanctuary of his chamber, closing the balcony door firmly behind him, letting the neighbor's voice gradually fade into the background. The man shuffled over to his kitchen, his footsteps echoing through the empty apartment. He opened the refrigerator door, only to be greeted by its desolate interior. The fridge held a scant few items, hardly enough to put together a proper meal. He cast a stoic gaze at the sparse contents, closed the door with a sigh, and reached into his hoodie pocket for his wallet. He peered inside the worn wallet and retrieved a handful of coins, counting them slowly. One, two, three, three dollars and fifty cents, he muttered to himself. I suppose that should be more than enough to grab a cup of instant noodles. The man left his shabby apartment behind, the door closing with a creak as he stepped into the dimly lit hallway. The faded wallpaper and worn carpeting in the corridor seemed to mirror the weariness that clung to him. As he descended the narrow staircase, each step echoing in the silence. He reached the ground floor, passing by rows of locked doors, each hiding its own set of hardships. Stepping out into the chilly night, the man buttoned up his hoodie against the crisp breeze as he walked on the cracked pavement beneath his feet shone by the faint glow of streetlights. He navigated the dimly lit streets, his path ultimately leading him toward the distant beacon of fluorescent light, an unassuming 24-7 gas station. Ding. The subtle chime resonated through the store as he stepped inside. His arrival barely registered among the disinterested glances from the night shift gas station clerk. Unperturbed by the indifference, the man advanced further into the store, guided by the convenience store's well-stocked shelves. With a confident stride, the man navigated the aisles of the store, seemingly unswayed by the tempting array of delicious options that surrounded him. His purposeful journey led him to his intended destination, where he paused to examine the item he planned on buying. Cub Noodles Chicken One Seventy Two Dollar Without hesitation, he selected two of these cups and proceeded to the cashier's counter. The cashier, comfortably seated in a plastic chair, engrossed in his smartphone, was quick to pocket his device as he noticed the approaching customer. Not a word was exchanged as the man placed the two cup noodles on the counter. The cashier mirrored his silence, efficiently scanning both items and revealing their prices. Convenience store receipt. Item, quantity, price. Cup noodle chicken, two one dollar and seventy two cents. Subtotal before tax, three dollars and forty four cents. Tax sales tax rate, ten percent, zero point three four four dollars. Total three dollars and seventy nine cents. The man took out his change from his wallet and glanced at the money laying on his palm and then back at the cashier, knowing full well that he lacked the necessary amount needed to purchase the items. Without a word, the cashier reached out to the man's hand and took the change, processed it, placed the receipt and the two cup noodles into a plastic bag, and handed it over to the man. Sensing the cashier's act of kindness, the man accepted the bag in silence and whispered his gratitude. Thank you. With a mixture of gratitude and a touch of embarrassment, the man walked out of the store. The warm act of kindness from the cashier had left an indelible impression on him, and he couldn't help but feel a sense of shame for being in a situation where he needed such help. As he stepped out, clutching the bag containing the two cup noodles, he couldn't shake the feeling of vulnerability that had washed over him. With a humble heart, he continued his journey, silently making his way home. Upon arriving home, the man set the plastic bag containing the two cup noodles on his kitchen counter. With a sigh, he filled a small pot with water and set it on the stove, waiting for it to come to a gentle boil. Once the water was boiling, he carefully opened one of the cup noodles and poured the steaming water into it, watching as the dried noodles and seasonings began to transform into a warm, comforting meal. The aroma of chicken and spices filled the air. He let the cup noodles sit for a few minutes, allowing the flavors to meld together. With the cup noodles in hand, the man decided to take his meal and enjoy it at his computer. He carefully carried the steaming cup to his desk, placing it beside the keyboard. Slurp. With a sip of the flavorful broth, he began to eat his meal while browsing the internet, catching up on some work. 
Search. Tap. Tap. Search. Rumthaven.net. Tap. Post. Tap. Tap. Post. WTS full set of level 100 necromancer items. Whisper with price. Tap. Post sent. Ding. 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 Messages X37. A wry smile crossed his face as he observed the flood of incoming messages. Ha, huh, must be nice to be rich, he mused, shaking his head. Those fortunate brats can toss around their family's wealth for virtual crap. Must be nice to not care about bills and rent. Mr. Necromerchant, I wish to purchase your items for $300. Necromerchant, you bastard. This time you better sell me your items. I've been trying to buy from you for the past two months. What's the highest bid? I'll double it. Hello, Necromerchant. I'm interested in purchasing your Necromancer LV.100 equipment set for $550. Holy shit, finally. I've been waiting for an entire week for you to sell your stuff, refreshing your page every other hours. I'd like to offer $1,000 x33 others necromerchant was the alias the man was known within the rmt real money trading world of gaming he had spent countless years from childhood to adulthood immersed in the realm of popular rpg games over the years he had earned his reputation as a seasoned player and trader focusing his endeavors on the exclusive trade of necromancer items his dedication to this niche had made him a legendary figure within the gaming and RMT community. Known for his unwavering commitment to quality, Necromerchant's items were considered the gold standard when it came to Necromancer's items. Gamers that could afford purchasing his items far and wide sought out his wares, confident that what they received would be nothing short of exceptional. He had honed his craft, ensuring that each item he sold was of the utmost quality. Though Necromerchant wasn't amassing vast fortunes, he had managed to turn his passion into a way of life. It provided him with more than just enough to survive. With the money from this trade, I should be able to cover the rent and bills. There might even be some left for other things. Ah, forget it. It's probably going to be the same bullshit and uninspiring narratives anyway. The man channeled his earnings into a variety of avenues, all in the pursuit of indulging his fascination with necromancy. Whether it was delving into countless light novels on the subject, poring over manga and comic books, or immersing himself in video games, he spared no expense to satiate the profound curiosity he had harbored for this particular class. Despite his firm belief that necromancers were the most captivating class among the vast array of fantasy archetypes, he couldn't ignore the subtle deficiencies that he perceived, shortcomings that might not be readily seen as such by the general public. Throughout the years, as he experimented with countless variations of necromancers in video games, explored diverse portrayals of necromancers in literature, and even contemplated the imaginative interpretations of others, he couldn't help but feel that none of them truly captured the excitement he craved. As a devoted necromancer main, he had come to a realization that consistently bothered him. It revolved around a particular aspect of the class that never failed to irritate him. At a certain point, the class began to appear rather uninspired and lacking in originality. You might wonder what may have been the cause of this disquiet. Well, why the hell is it always this same damn trope? Oh, I can summon a whole freaking army of undead, or I've got minions from one to one thousand, baby. Can't it ever be just one? One summon, one beefed up, steroid-induced mammoth of a minion. Why's it gotta be thousands of these wimpy, bony little shits that keel over with one poke? Why not just one badass minion that can take a thousand hits and still be like, is that all you got? It stemmed from the fact that a necromancer's strength and utility were seemingly determined solely by the quantity of summons they could maintain simultaneously. Throughout his years of relentless pursuit for the necromancer, he found himself unable to resist the allure of daydreaming about the perfect scenario. He made efforts to sway game developers, light novel authors, and even artists with his view. However, the majority of them dismissed his ideas as absurd and unnecessary, essentially delivering a verdict that he was attempting to mend something that was never broken. 
I mean, come on. Imagine it. One goddamn minion strutting through the battlefield like an undead behemoth, unstoppable in the face of puny heroes. A minion that could tank a thousand attacks, and how about this, the thing actually learns some damn skills. These freaking minions, they're just hanging around, and swinging their weapons, auto-attacking the heck out of a fucking dragon. How awesome would it be if your summon could learn active and passive skills, maybe even use equipments? But now, they're like, let's just level the skill up increasing their health with it and expanding the quantity of the same shitty skeleton. That's cool, right? Hell no. Ha, whatever. While the man vented his frustrations to himself, he soon came to the realization that his complaints were futile, and he pressed on with his trade. Once his tasks were complete, he shut down his computer and sprawled out on his bed, preparing to call it a day. He laid on his bed, a distinct lack of enthusiasm coursing through him. The thought of grinding through the early levels with a new necromancer held zero appeal. Originality had taken a vacation from the books he'd been reading, and contemplating what ifs felt like a tiresome exercise in futility. In that moment, all he craved was a spark, something to rekindle the same fervor he'd felt when he first stumbled upon the world of fantasy and the class of necromancers. Ding. With a sudden, eerie sound, a mysterious holographic image materialized right in front of him. His eyes widened in surprise as he read the message. The Tower of Awakening has opened its doors. What's this? he muttered, curiosity peaked. Before he could delve deeper into his thoughts, an overwhelming sensation washed over him. It was as though an invisible force was engulfing him, pulling him down into the abyss, deeper and deeper, as if he were descending into the unfathomable depths of the ocean. Wad MMFP. I can't breathe. The Tower of Awakening welcomes you. Asher Gray. Tower of Awakening? What the hell is going on? Please select your difficulty. The rewards received during your time in this Tower of Awakening will be based on the difficulty chosen. I don't know what's happening, but... Easy. Normal. Is this finally the spark I was graving for? Hard. I, I can't live the same way I used to. Make me feel. Alive. Difficulty has been chosen. May your results reflect your hard work. Transferring Challenger to the first floor of the Trials of Awakening. A radiant brilliance enveloped Asher, encircling him until he was completely submerged in its luminous embrace. Shortly thereafter, he discovered himself in an unfamiliar realm, distinct from the comfortable chamber he had previously occupied. Bah, H-A-A. I can finally breathe. W-H, where am I? A grassland? The trial will begin shortly. Please prepare yourself. Trial's objective, survive. Huh? Failure from completing the trial closure to further floors. Reward for completing the trial class selection and unique skill awakening. Class? Unique skill? The first trial will begin. Good luck. Trial of Awakening chosen difficulties hard. As the holographic image heralded the commencement of the trial, an abrupt, thunderous rumble reverberated through the surroundings, accompanied by a tremor that could be both heard and felt. It was in this moment that the unforeseen event began to unfold. W. What the hell is this thing? Chapter 2 Unlocking the Unique Skill Trial of Awakening chosen difficulties hard. Trial's objective, survive. As the system signaled the beginning of the trial, a low, ominous rumble echoed across the grassy terrain, steadily growing louder. In the distance, a cluster of trees in the Greenland stood witness to the approaching danger, their branches and trunks crumbling as something formidable drew nearer to the challenger's position. Not wanting to face whatever danger approached, the man swiftly hid behind the largest tree he could find. Before long, a massive bear emerged from the grasslands. This bear was unlike any he had ever seen, easily twice the size of a normal one. Its fur had a mix of green and brown, making it blend into the grass. Its eyes shone with primal ferocity, and its claws were enormous and razor-sharp, like deadly scimitars ready to strike. 
This was no ordinary bear, it was a true giant of the grasslands, and Asher realized he was in for the fight of his life. Savage Woodland Bear has appeared. W. What the hell is this thing? Survive or defeat the enemy within the allocated time. 5 minutes. 4 minutes and 59 seconds. Fear gripped Asher's every fiber, his heart pounding like a relentless drumbeat in his chest. Beads of sweat streamed down his forehead, forming a small pool of moisture at his feet. He dared not move a muscle, desperately hoping that the monstrous bear wouldn't sense his presence. But the bear, with its keen sense of smell, proved to be a formidable tracker. It didn't take long for the massive creature to hone in on his location. In an instant, the bear charged towards the tree where he cowered, its earth-shaking footsteps heralding its approach. Bam! Bam! Ah! Boom! With a deafening roar, the bear's massive claws slashed through the air, obliterating the tree in a single devastating sweep. Asher's instincts kicked in, and he leaped away from the crumbling tree just in the nick of time, narrowly avoiding the lethal strike. His heart continued to race as he realized the dire peril he was in, knowing that escape from this adversary would be no easy feat. With the echoes of the shattered tree still ringing in his ears, Asher wasted no time. Panic lent wings to his feet as he bolted away from the hulking bear, terror propelling him forward. Behind him, the bear gave chase with an unrelenting fury. It crashed through the grasslands without a care for the obstacles in its path, like an unstoppable force of nature. Rocks and trees were torn to shred as the bear's sheer power sent them flying in all directions. Asher's lungs burned with each gasping breath as he pushed himself harder, his life depending on the desperate race for survival. He darted between trees, leaped over rocks, and veered sharply to avoid the bear's swiping claws. The bear's relentless pursuit left him with a sinking feeling as it steadily gained ground with each powerful stride. The hot, Labored breaths of the beast and its thunderous growls grew ominously closer, sending shivers of dread coursing through him. He stole a quick glance at the timer, yearning for even the slightest reward in the form of precious seconds gained. Three minutes and twenty-six seconds. As the seconds ticked away, escape appeared nearly impossible. The colossal predator bore down on him, driven by insatiable hunger and unbridled aggression. His heart pounded in his chest as he realized that his only chance lay in devising a way to outweat or outmaneuver its chaser before it was too late. This ain't gonna work. If I keep running like this, I'm gonna puke my guts out from being dead tired. I'm no athlete, man. I'm just a gamer, and these legs ain't built for this kind of action. Why is this big, fat bastard so darn quick? Is this really what they throw at you on the first floor? As the relentless pursuit continued, racing thoughts desperately searching for a way out of this dire situation. He considered his options, but it became painfully clear that running was his only one, even though the bear was gaining on him. I've struggled my whole life, scraping by, barely getting a taste of what others enjoy. Is this how it all ends? Chased down by a giant bear in some crazy trial? His voice grew more somber as he continued to reflect on his existence. Maybe, maybe this is what I deserve. Always taking the easy way out, never pushing myself. The one time I actually decided to push myself. Well, here's the price I pay. But in the depths of his self-critique, a glimmer of insight emerged. He remembered a story he'd once read in one of the numerous novels he had read. For some reason, this specific quote came to mind. In the stark realization of our own mortality, we discover the warmth of our resilience through the stark contrast they offer. So even in the cold grip of death, the embers of life persist, pushing us to defy it. Inspired by these words that came to mind, he realized that even as the cold grip of death was within reach, there was still a glimmer of hope, as long as he pushed himself to defy his fate, then the embers of his life could still persist past this challenge. He had to seize that chance, however slim it might be, and do whatever it took to survive. It was a turning point in his desperate struggle against the pursuing bear. With the bear closing in and no clear escape, Asher noticed a rocky outcrop in the distance. His desperate mind latched onto an idea. He sprinted toward it, his heart racing, and reached the rocks just in the nick of time. 
As the bear lunged forward with a mighty roar, Asher scrambled up the rocks. The bear's enormous claws struck the stone, shattering it into pieces, but missing him by mere inches. The shockwaves from the impact knocked the man off balance, sending him tumbling down the steep. His body battered and bruised, he crawled into a narrow crevice between the rocks. The bear, frustrated and unable to reach him, paced angrily above. The seconds on the timer continued to count down without stop. With every ounce of willpower, Asher focused on slowing his breathing, making himself as small as possible within the crevice. But with the bear's relentless fury, even the crevice in the rocks proved no sanctuary. The man's heart sank as the bear's mighty paws shattered the remaining stone barrier, sending shards flying. Realizing there was no place left to hide, panic surged through him. But then, in the midst of the chaos, he spotted a nearby thicket of thorny bushes. With no other options, he crawled toward it, praying the bear would lose sight of him in the dense foliage. The bear, enraged and disoriented by his maneuvers, roared in frustration as it searched for its prey. The seconds ticked away relentlessly, and the man nestled deeper into the thicket, his skin punctured by thorns, every muscle aching. As the timer reached its final moments, the bear's massive head swung inches from the thicket, its hot breath causing the man's heart to pound even harder. The bear's keen eyes scanned the area, and for a fleeting second, it seemed as if his fate was sealed. The thorny bushes proved no match for the massive predator. As the bear's massive paw tore through the underbrush with ease, time seemed to slow to a crawl, and the seconds on the timer dwindled down to the very last. In the agonizingly tense moment, the bear's claw was a split second away from making contact, when suddenly, with a deafening tick, the timer reached its very last moment. Two seconds. One second. Midnight. You have survived the allocated time. In an instant, the world around blurred, and an otherworldly surge of energy. His senses reeled as he found himself transported from the jaws of death to safety. He stood in a dimly lit chamber, battered and trembling, his pants soiled from the extreme stress and fear. You have completed this trial of awakening first trial. I, I really did it. I really survived against that thing? Clearance will provide points. These points can be used in the Tower of Awakening store after clearing the second floor's trial. Additional points can be earned if you display outcomes past the required clear condition. You have earned 100 points for clearing the first floor. For clearing the first floor of the trial, you will be rewarded with a unique skill based on the class you select. Please select your class. Warrior. Mage. Rogue. Cleric. Archer. Paladin. Sorcerer. Bard. Druid. Monk. Ranger. Necromancer. Alchemist. Barbarian. Warlock. Enchanter. Knight. Elementalist. Trickster. Illusionist. Asher's heart continued to race as the holographic interface prompted him to select his class. He had just survived a life-threatening encounter with a giant bear. Previously, he couldn't properly question all of the expected events that had occurred, but those very inquiries started to nod at his mind like an itch he couldn't scratch. The place he found himself in was rife with mysteries, and now he had to make a choice that would determine his path in the enigmatic realm he now found himself in. He stared at the holographic interface, pondering his choice carefully. This was a crucial decision that would shape the course of his journey through the enigmatic Tower of Awakening. He fixed his gaze upon the luminous interface, each option beckoning him with promises of fantastical power. Each class seemed more fantastical than the last, some of them he had no idea what they entailed. The list stretched before him, seemingly infinite in its possibilities. It was like being in a video game, but the stakes were all too real. As Asher's eyes traversed the extensive roster of classes, his heart settled upon one that had always held a special place in his soul, the Necromancer. There's no need to search any further. It's obvious as heck. I'm gonna be a Necromancer. You have selected the Necromancer class. Providing Asher Gray with the best suited unique skill. Congratulations. You have acquired the unique skill Animate Guardian. Animate Guardian? 
As Asher questioned the unique skill's name, a sudden prompt appeared, providing the skill's details. What the? Chapter 3 Animate Guardian and Character Window Having successfully navigated the initial trial, Asher eagerly anticipated his reward, having chosen the coveted class of the Necromancer. To his astonishment, a truly unique skill was bestowed upon him, a gift beyond anything he could have imagined. It felt as though the universe had heeded his heartfelt plea and bestowed upon him the fulfillment of a cherished desire and necromantic ability that perfectly aligned with his pursuit of originality. As he laid eyes upon the skill's description, a sense of awe and disbelief washed over him. Is this for real? Has the big guy upstairs finally heard my pleas? After reading the skill's description, a whirlwind of emotions swirled within Asher. A profound sense of excitement surged through him, like a spark of untapped flames igniting his soul. The idea of harnessing the power of an animated guardian, customizing it with weapon and armor pieces, and nurturing it into an unyielding ally filled him with a thrilling sense of anticipation. The idea of taming the raw power of a loyal minion, adorning it with weapons and armor, and nurturing it from the ground up was an aspiration that had long fueled his dreams. It paralleled the satisfaction of watching a video game character grow from a humble level 1 noob to a formidable level 100 powerhouse, each skill acquisition and equipment upgrade a step closer to virtual glory. But this time, the excitement was twofold. Why, you ask? Because this adventure didn't just involve his avatar, but his summon as well, intricately managing both his own character development and that of his summon companion. Finally, the thrill is real. Oh baby, what's my customization game plan here? Should I turn it into a tank, a sneaky ranger, or unleash the inner warrior? Hang on a second, what about me? Should I play nice and be the support? Damn it. The excitement. Wait. Yet, there was a nagging sense of caution that put a damper on his excitement. The gravity of the responsibility weighed on him. Equipping the Guardian was not a mere formality, it was a critical decision that directly influenced its combat prowess. Every choice had consequences, and the prospect of losing precious items and hard-earned skills in the heat of battle cast a shadow over his excitement. He couldn't forget that this was real life and not a game. He had no clue how tough it might be to find items and learn skills. What if the choices he made for himself and his summon were bad? And what if his summon bit the dust, making all that customization useless? As he contemplated the trade-offs, a sense of dedication washed over him. The animated guardian wasn't just a tool, it was his so desperately sought after companion. Why am I playing Doubtful Debbie when I've finally got the golden ticket to the path I've been craving for so long? It's like the very first time I played an RPG as a kid. I'm practically bursting with excitement. Heck, I'll make this experience sing, just like those magical early gaming days. I'm going to craft the mother of all necromancer builds. Those legion spammers won't know what hit him. Watch out, world. One summon to rule them all, and I'm going for the necromancer hall of fame. In the height of his excitement, Asher stumbled upon an unexpected revelation. As he squinted his eyes in eager anticipation, he discovered that the skill had more to offer. To his amazement, he could also access the status window for his animated guardian. Without a moment's hesitation, he decided to put his newfound skill to the test. With unwavering confidence, he extended his hand, aiming it at the ground below. With a booming declaration, he shouted, Animate Guardian! Arise! Much to his chagrin, nothing happened. The reason for this apparent failure soon became glaringly clear as a system notification illuminated the situation. Please attach an item to your animated guardian in order to summon it. Attach an item. Asher muttered to himself. He stared down at his empty palm, the realization hitting him like a ton of bricks. I don't have anything to attach to him. In order to summon his guardian, he needed at least one item, a weapon, armor, or even an accessory would do. But here he was, empty-handed, thrust into a life-and-death trial with nothing to his name. Panic began to set in as he frantically scanned his sparse surroundings, desperately hoping to find anything that would suffice. 
Unfortunately, the room he found himself in resembled a small, featureless white cubicle, furnished with only a narrow bed and a toilet. Asher couldn't help but mutter, Well, this is just great. What am I supposed to do? Have him fight with bed sheets? Wait. Asher's eyes widened with a spark of inspiration as he hurriedly approached the room's solitary bed, his gaze fixed on the sheets neatly draped across it. A sudden thought struck him like a bolt of lightning. If there was a system and a skill interface, there had to be an item interface as well, right? He concentrated all his attention on the bedsheet, desperately hoping his realization was correct. And just as he had dared to hope, a prompt from the system interface materialized before him, displaying the description of the bedsheet. Asher squinted at the less-than-impressive stats displayed before him and let out a resigned sigh. Well, these are some seriously trashy stats. But hey, beggars can't be choosers, right? Guess I'll have to roll with it. Animate Guardian As if heeding his call, the bedsheet stirred to life, exhibiting an eerie animation. It was as though an invisible entity had taken hold of it, causing the fabric to lift and contort in midair. The edges folded together as if an unseen pair of hands were gently gripping it, creating a surreal spectacle that left Asher bewildered. You have summoned Animate Guardian. Your Animate Guardian has equipped the one-handed whip clean bed sheet. Animate Guardian status window can now be opened. I did it. Asher exclaimed, his excitement palpable. He couldn't wait to inspect the status window of his newfound, bedsheet-clad guardian. As Asher gazed upon the status window of his animated guardian, a surge of emotions welled up within him. It was like discovering an unexpected treasure trove of information. His heart raced with fascination as he took in every detail. He marveled at the health and mana bars, the numerical values representing his guardian's vitality and mana. They seemed almost tangible, like lifelines to a new companion that had just come to life. His eyes traced over the section displaying the equipped items, his imagination running wild with possibilities. Even though the bedsheet was hardly a formidable set of weaponry, it somehow made the whole experience even more endearing. And then, the active and passive skills section caught his attention, even though they remained empty for now. It was a blank canvas, waiting for him to mold his guardian into a force to be reckoned with. The sight of those placeholders for future abilities filled him with a sense of potential and ambition. Overall, Asher's feelings were a mix of wonder, anticipation, and a touch of pride for having brought his bedsheet guardian to life. Well, look at you, you might not be a knight in shining armor, but you're my trusty fabric friend. Let's show him what we're made of, or, well, what you're made of. If I can see his status window, it only makes sense that I should be able to see my own character window too, right? Asher mused aloud, and in the next instant, the window displaying the animated guardian status seamlessly transitioned to reveal his own character details. Check this shit out. There's my face, all 2D and pixelated. This is like stepping into a vintage video game. Hmm. I notice my health and mana are pretty much mirroring my guardians. Is this a buddy system where we share similar stats? If so, I might have to consider increasing my health and mana when I get the chance to start customizing my character. Asher chuckled at the thought. As Asher delved into his character window and scrutinized his stats, a vague understanding of the system began to dawn on him. The attributes seemed to align with the principles of classic video games. Strength, he presumed, would likely dictate the sheer force behind his physical blows, while vitality appeared geared towards beefing up his health pool. Dexterity was an intriguing enigma. Did it bolster his critical strike chances, or perhaps his accuracy, or both? Intelligence, on the other hand, hinted at influencing his magical prowess and mana capacity. Though these were nothing more than educated guesses at this point, Asher decided to shelve his speculations for later. After all, there wasn't much he could do with these attributes at the moment, aside from letting them simmer in the background until the day he had points to allocate. But what truly piqued his interest was the subclass section. This single category hinted at the tantalizing prospect of acquiring a second class to complement his current one. 
the sheer variety of options he had glimpsed previously ignited a boundless surge of excitement within him, like a rocket about to launch into uncharted territory. As if to mark the culmination of his tutorial, there came the anticipated yet still somewhat surprising prompt, beckoning him to take the next step on his journey through the trial. The second floor is about to open. Please prepare yourself to face the second part of the trial. Back during his initial encounter with this prompt in the first trial, it had been a harrowing experience filled with questions and trepidation. However, at this pivotal moment, Asher was brimming with anticipation and a fierce sense of competitiveness. His sole objective was to embrace the exhilarating challenge of molding his summon into the mightiest entity to ever grace existence. Bring it on. I don't care. I've finally been granted this opportunity, and I won't let some puny trial stand in my way. Asher exclaimed with unbridled determination. Transporting Asher Gray to the second floor. Best of luck. Chapter 4 Second Trial Dizziness and blurriness enveloped Asher's vision, guiding him to the second level of the trial. To his astonishment, he found himself in a serene haven teeming with lush greenery and vibrant trees. The atmosphere was rich with the earthy scents of the forest, a harmonious blend of pine, moss, and wildflowers. Sunlight streamed through the leafy canopy above, casting shadows on the forest floor. Asher's ears delighted by the melodious chirping of birds and the soft rustling of small creatures in the underbrush. Initially, he hadn't noticed, as he had been pursued by a massive bear upon his arrival in this place. But now, as he marveled at the verdant paradise surrounding him, he couldn't help but be awestruck. Towering trees with emerald leaves reached the sky, their branches swaying gently in the soft breeze. All seemed peaceful until a realization struck him. Wait! Am I going to get attacked by that bear again? Anxiety gripping him at the thought of facing the massive bear again on the second floor, Asher swiftly scanned his surroundings for a suitable hiding spot. However, his concerns were swiftly laid to rest as the true focus of this trial revealed itself before him. Trial's objective, eliminate 25 goblins within the allocated time limit. Failure from completing the trial closure to further floors. Reward for completing the trial random common skill book. Time remaining, 10 hours. 9 hours 59 minutes and 59 seconds. Goblins? Considering the trial's goal, Asher didn't see it as particularly challenging. It felt more like a standard task you'd give to new players in video games. It was quite straightforward, like entering a level 1 to 5 area, avoiding the simple rabbits and boars, and going straight for the third weakest enemy in an RPG game, those small and seemingly weak goblins. Asher knew what goblins usually looked like from depictions in all the books and video games he has consumed in a daily basis, small humanoids with green skin, pointy ears, and a knack for causing trouble. What puzzled him was why this objective was so different from the tough trial he faced on the first floor. It felt more like an average difficulty task, which was a stark contrast to his earlier experience. Asher's train of thought might have seemed reasonable in the context of a video game, but this was reality, and the trial of awakening didn't bend its objectives to accommodate progress. It was at this very moment that Asher was about to discover the stark reality of the situation. As he ascended to the second floor, his life teetered on the precipice of danger. While he took in the beauty of his surroundings and contemplated the trial's objectives, a sudden projectile hurtled toward him, aimed directly at the back of his head. In an instant, his attention was drawn by a swift movement, and as he turned his head, he was met with a shocking sight, an arrowhead embedded in a familiar object, a clean bedsheet, the very same one he had attached to his animated guardian. Ah! What the hell? Unbeknownst to him, the trial had already commenced, and Asher was not just the hunter, but also the hunted. This fact became painfully evident as he realized that his head would have been pierced had it not been for his animated guardian, which had used the bedsheet as a makeshift shield, halting the arrowhead's advance midway through its deadly trajectory. Where on earth did that arrow pop out from? Asher was utterly bewildered by the sudden projectile. He squinted and scanned the area, but the situation was as clear as mud. The surroundings were quieter than a mouse in a library, and there wasn't a soul in sight, except for himself and his floating bedsheet. 
It was like a magician pulling a rabbit out of a hat, except, in this case, it was an arrow seemingly conjured out of thin air. In a swift and unexpected move, Asher's guardian extended the bedsheet once more, now forming a makeshift shield of considerable size. Just as the sheet unfurled, a second arrowhead pierced through it, leaving another hole in its fabric. Seriously? Again? Where's the bastard that's pulling these tricks? Asher grumbled, frustration creeping into his voice. He was growing more and more anxious by the mysterious assailant who seemed to have a bone to pick with him and a talent for hiding. How am I supposed to find him? I can't make sense of his location. Wait! As Asher pondered a way to uncover the assailant's whereabouts, a sudden revelation struck him. How did his animated guardian always manage to intercept the arrows hitting his way? Each time an attack was about to find its mark, the guardian somehow pinpointed it and deflected it just in the nick of time. What if? His thoughts materialized into a plan. Animate guardian, seek out the bastard that's been raining arrows on me. Asher commanded, determination in his voice. Following his orders, the bedsheet began to float away from him, leaving him momentarily exposed, vulnerable to yet another arrow. He's actually going for it. That means he knows where that scoundrel is. I've got to limit the open space of his firing zone until it captures him. Asher's heart raced, his senses on high alert. He could feel the tension in the air, the anticipation of the next arrow's flight. It didn't take long. A third arrow whizzed toward him without him noticing. Dot pain surged through Asher as the unexpected arrow embedded itself in his right shoulder. He grimaced, gritting his teeth to suppress a cry of agony. Agger. That fucker. Through clenched teeth, the pain was excruciating, but he knew that attempting to remove the arrow would only exacerbate the situation, turning the scene into a gory mess of spurting blood. With his fingers trembling from the agony, he reluctantly made the gruesome decision to leave the arrowhead buried in its bloody enclave, opting to avoid further damage. As Asher grappled with the searing pain in his shoulder and the gruesome decision to leave the arrow in place, a sudden scream shattered the silence of the forest. His head snapped in the direction of the cry, eyes widening in shock. To his astonishment, his animated guardian had not only tracked down the elusive assailant, but had also taken matters into its own spectral hands. It was dragging the assailant in question toward him fully tied up by the bed sheets, restraining its movements. Asher watched in awe as the archer was deposited at his feet, disheveled and sheathing with anger. It was a sight to behold, the hunter becoming the hunted. Is that a goblin? To his amazement, the very entity responsible for his current predicament was none other than the infamous low-intelligence goblin. Yes, those goblins widely known for their lack of intellect compared to other races. However, contrary to Asher's preconceived notions, this particular goblin seemed like a masterful hunter. Its emerald green skin was expertly concealed by a carefully applied coat of mud and crushed leaves, making it nearly invisible against the woodland backdrop in addition to his small stature advantage, making even harder to locate. Every inch of exposed skin had been obscured, allowing it to seamlessly blend with its surroundings. Its keen eyes darted around with a purposeful intelligence, searching for an escape from its current situation. A gnarled and weathered bow, along with a quiver of arrows, were strapped to its back, though its captor had rendered it unable to utilize them, having tightly bound the goblin. In that very instant, Asher came to realize how ignorant his earlier assumption had been, entirely off the mark. This was no run-of-the-mill quest, it was precisely what he had willingly committed himself to, a hard difficulty trial. Without the aid of his guardian, he wouldn't have had the faintest chance of locating, let alone apprehending, a solitary goblin. And yet, his mission entailed not just confronting one of these creatures, but rather with a tally of twenty-five of them. Grux Shemlot Blork Asher furrowed his brow, trying to decipher the goblin's bizarre words. It was clear that whatever message the goblin intended to convey was utterly unintelligible, leaving him both puzzled and intrigued. What is it? Huh? Let me guess, are you asking me to free you? Zig Morlock Mukuldoodle. The goblin's attempts at communication continued, each phrase more nonsensical than the last. 
Asher couldn't help but chuckle at the absurdity of the situation. You're quite the linguist, aren't you? I wish I spoke goblinese. Hashtag, hashtag, hashtag. Whoa there, buddy. I have absolutely no clue what you just uttered, but it doesn't seem like the friendliest of phrases, does it? Let's put an end to this goblinious ridiculousness, shall we? Clabberoo? Kill him. Following his master's command, the guardian swiftly untied the goblin, setting him free from his restraints. Thinking that he had escaped, the goblin lunged at Asher. However, in the blink of an eye, the bedsheet wrapped around the goblin's neck, halting his movement once again. With a deft motion, the bedsheet ascended to a sturdy tree branch, and with a quick but forceful tug from the guardian, the goblin found himself suspended in the air, gasping for breath. As the goblin dangled helplessly, its face contorted in desperation, struggling for even the slightest breath, Asher couldn't help but wonder if perhaps he had taken the goblinious ridiculousness a bit too far. But that fleeting thought was quickly dismissed as he laid his eyes on the arrowhead still embedded in his right shoulder. You have killed a goblin hunter. You have earned 5 EXP. 5 out of 100. Kill count, January 25th Goblins. While his summon dangled the goblin from the tree branch, a message materialized before Asher, its vibrant letters confirming the successful kill. He couldn't help but arch an eyebrow at the sudden and unexpected notification. Here, right before him, was tangible evidence of his very first experience points, something he had anticipated based on the character windows he had observed in the lobby. Yet, it felt oddly surreal to actually obtain them. I suppose one way to earn experience is by genuinely grinding monsters. Asher mused, contemplating the adventure that lay ahead. As Asher gazed down at the lifeless goblin swinging gently from the tree, he couldn't help but feel a mix of emotions from the strangeness of the situation to a hint of remorse. I'm sorry, but it's a matter of survival, kill or be killed. As Asher looked at the lifeless goblin, something caught his eye. Right beside the goblin lay its belongings, including the same bow it had used against him. Bending down, Asher picked up the goblin's bow and the nearby quiver. An idea struck him this could be a useful tool, especially in a tough trial like this. With a knowing grin, he stowed the newfound weapon and handed it to his guardian. It's amazing I'm already getting an upgrade. This should make things a bit easier for us. Here, use these instead of the bedsheet. Your animated guardian has unequipped the one-handed whip clean bedsheet. Your animate guardian has equipped the two-handed bow wooden crude bout and the offhand quiver rusty quiver. Now, let the hunt commence. Chapter 5 The Bear and the Boy You have killed a goblin scout. You have earned 5 EXP. 20-100 Kill count, April 25th Goblins since acquiring the bow and arrows, Asher had managed to hunt down three more goblins since the first encounter. He had instructed his guardian to take down any enemy that displayed hostility towards him. It was as though the guardian could sense the aggression directed at Asher, promptly shooting at the exact location from which this hostile aura emanated. During this time, Asher came to the realization that his animate guardian resembled a robot in many ways. It operated without emotion, adhering to three fundamental principles. Its primary focus was protection, prioritizing the safety of its summoner unless instructed otherwise as if it was programmed this way. This was evident during Asher's initial encounter with a goblin hunter. The second principle was unwavering obedience to commands, even if it meant jeopardizing the summoner's well-being. This was exemplified during the capture of the first goblin, where the guardian had been tasked with apprehending it, taking a risky gamble that ultimately led to Asher being struck by an arrow in his right shoulder. The third and final principle governing the animate guardian's behavior was its adaptability. Every weapons he had equipped so far, it showed an amazing capability to adjust its actions and tactics based on the items it held. However, it was clear that while the animated guardian wielded these weapons with impressive usage, its mastery remained somewhat limited compared to those who had dedicated themselves to honing their skills with their primary weapons. Its movements and actions resembled those of a machine more than the fluid flexibility of human joints and thought. 
Asher had mixed feelings about these principles, but in this moment, he had no complaints because the Guardian was proving itself highly effective in guiding him through the second trial. With his newfound skill and class, Asher understood that there was a vast uncharted territory ahead of him. He was well aware that the journey would transform rapidly, influenced by the skills and items he could acquire along the way, and this was glaringly apparent through the altered playstyle that the anime guardian had exhibited ever since it had changed its weapon. But what am I going to do? The number of arrows I have is limited. At this juncture, every goblin had been dispatched with a single arrow to the head, a method that had proven highly effective. Asher now found himself with a mere seven arrows remaining, which meant he could potentially eliminate a total of eleven goblins before depleting his ammunition. However, a sense of unease began to settle within him. He had anticipated that the other goblins might carry weapons he could use once his arrows ran out. Unfortunately, all the goblins he had encountered thus far were goblin scouts, as their name suggested. Their primary role was to scout the forest and alert their companions to potential threats. These scouts didn't carry any equipment, likely to maintain their agility for a quick escape. This left Asher pondering his options as he ventured deeper into the forest. Asher realized it was time for a change in strategy. All right, let's get resourceful, he whispered to himself. He began scouring his surroundings for any signs of useful items, hoping to find something he could fashion into makeshift weapons or traps. Then, a revelation struck him. The solution was simpler than he initially thought. All he had to do was eliminate a total of 21 goblins. With around 7 hours remaining, as long as he managed to kill all 25, he would be transported back to the lobby. He pondered the quickest and easiest way to take down a group of enemies within a forest. Fire. Acting swiftly, Asher gathered as many dry leaves, twigs, and branches as he could find. These materials were essential for starting and sustaining a fire. He scouted for a suitable location to ensure that the fire would spread in the desired direction to deter the goblins. Okay. I've got my location and the materials, but how am I going to start a fire? To ignite the gathered materials, Asher needed a way to create a spark. He grouped the dry leaves and pieces of wood together and carved a small notch near the edge of a flat wooden board, forming a small V-shape. This was where the ember would eventually take shape. Give me an arrow, Asher commanded his guardian. Following his command, the guardian provided him with an arrow. Asher held the wooden arrow spindle upright, pressing the pointed end into the notch on the fireboard. He began applying downward pressure while rapidly rotating the arrow between his hands, even though it strained his right shoulder. This friction generated heat, causing dust from the wood to accumulate in the notch. With determination and a steady, rapid pace, small sparks of glowing embers started to emerge, forming in the notch. After displaying patience and maintaining his consistent drilling rhythm, he finally achieved success, a small flame. I did it! Asher retrieved the bedsheet he had taken from the Guardian and added it to the fire. Once the sheet was engulfed in flames, he carefully removed it from the notch and hurled it toward the nearest tree, creating a fiery distraction. The fire roared to life, casting a radiant and fierce glow that flickered wildly in the forest. A smoky haze billowed upward, shrouding the trees in an eerie, dancing glow of red and orange. As the fire spread, Asher quickly retreated, distancing himself as far as he could from the inferno as he watched the flames devour the forest floor, creating an ever-expanding ring of searing heat and destruction. He knew that this desperate gamble was his best chance to deter the goblins and complete the trial. Guardian, stay alert. Asher commanded, his voice tinged with urgency. Shoot down any goblins that manage to escape the flames. The animate guardian, unwavering and emotionless, stood next to Asher, arrows notched and ready. The goblins, startled and disoriented by the sudden inferno, screeched and howled from within the blazing walls. Some attempted to flee through the fiery barrier, their shrieks drowned out by the crackling flames. With every moment that passed, the fire advanced further, pushing the goblins back and forcing them into a corner. The intense heat and suffocating smoke created a chaotic, nightmarish scene. You have killed a goblin scavenger. 
You have earned 5 EXP. 25 slash 100. You have killed a goblin scout. You have earned 5 EXP. 30 slash 100. You have killed a goblin soldier. You have earned 5 EXP. 35 slash 100. You have killed a goblin. Time raced forward, the flames showing no mercy as they devoured the forest. The act of dispatching goblins unfolded at an astonishing pace, and as the one who had ignited the fire, each goblin's demise was credited to Asher himself. Every kill contributed to his growing kill count, accompanied by the precious experience points he earned. In a matter of mere minutes, Asher achieved his objective. You have killed a goblin hunter. You have earned 5 EXP. 100 slash 100. Congratulations for reaching LV.2. You have acquired 5 attribute points. Kill count, 23 slash 25 goblins. Asher blinked in surprise at the unexpected notification. He quickly checked his character window, confirming the increase in his level and the availability of attribute points. I'll hold on to my points for the time being, Asher mused. I need to gather more information about the attributes and gain a clearer understanding of how to tailor my build to complement my class and guardian. You have killed a goblin scout. You have earned 5 EXP. 5 slash 200. Kill count, 2425 goblins. Asher scratched his head, puzzled by the sudden change in requirements for leveling up. Huh? Did the leveling up requirement just double? He pondered aloud. Does this mean that each subsequent level will demand twice as many experience points, or does it increase by a fixed 100 points with each level? The uncertainty of the leveling system added an extra layer of complexity to his journey, and he knew that understanding the mechanics of this world would be crucial to his success. As Asher pondered the intricacies of the leveling system, a sudden, thunderous rumbling echoed in the distance, rapidly drawing nearer. This unmistakable sensation had coursed through him in the past, and he instantly recognized its source. You have killed a goblin scavenger. You have earned 5 EXP. 10 slash 200. Kill count, 25 slash 25 goblins. You have completed this trial of awakening second trial. For clearing the second floor of the trial, you will be rewarded with a random common skill. Despite having successfully completed the trial's objective, the relentless rumbling persisted, closing in on him with unyielding intensity. Asher couldn't help but wonder why he hadn't been transported out of this floor, as he should have been upon completion. While the prospect of a reward intrigued him, his primary concern now was finding a way out of this perilous situation. Ding! Congratulations! You have earned the inspection skill book. Would you like to learn it? Yes slash no. I don't have time for this. Yes, yes. Asher exclaimed in frustration. Just get me out of here, before whatever I suspect it is, arrives. His urgency and impatience were palpable as he yearned for a swift escape from the impending threat. Having finished the second trial early, do you wish to remain in the floor in order to acquire additional EXP and achievement points? Yes slash no. The rumbling grew stronger, and a flaming tree crashed to the ground, consumed by the approaching force, hurtling toward Asher at an unprecedented speed. Huh? Oh. I recall it mentioned that surpassing the quest requirements could earn me extra points for the store, but... I don't think I can stay here with this big guy present. Boom. Emerging from the inferno of the forest was a familiar, dreaded presence. It was the same menacing adversary that had instilled fear in Asher from the moment he had set foot inside the Tower of Awakening, the very first and formidable threat he had ever faced. Inspection is being used, providing targets information. A colossal bear emerged from the blazing forest, its massive form akin to an elephant's. As it descended gracefully, its gaze locked onto its prey, and with ferocious determination, it lunged forward as if seeking retribution against the very intruder responsible for igniting its once peaceful home. Get me out of here. You have selected an O. Transporting player to the lobby. In an instant, the world around blurred, and an otherworldly surge of energy. 
His senses reeled as he found himself transported from the jaws of death to safety once again. Chapter 6 Store and Community Tab In a matter of mere seconds, Asher swiftly retreated to the lobby, narrowly evading a ferocious attack from the bear. As he sprawled out on the floor, he made a conscious effort to suit the rapid drumming of his heart. Phew, he gasped, collecting his thoughts. Is this a sign? Two encounters in a row with this big guy. If this isn't a foretelling of a boss battle, then I don't know what is. You've completed the second trial. The following features can now be used. Store page, community page. You have earned 200 points for clearing the second floor. As Asher gazed at the system notification, he was genuinely surprised by the feature that had been unlocked after successfully completing the second trial. While he had anticipated accessing the store page, as he had been informed about it earlier, he had not expected to find himself on a community page. Community, he pondered aloud, his curiosity piqued. Is this akin to a chat room or perhaps a forum of some sort? You have entered the hard difficulty community page. Please provide a username for the community chat underscore. A username. I've got the perfect one. Are you sure you want to use the username Necromerchant? Yes slash no. Yes. As Asher confirmed the prompt, a series of texts appeared before him, displaying the ongoing conversation between various individuals. Banana Bard, what's happening here? Is there anyone else around? Zigzag Zephyr, how the heck should I know? One moment, I'm watching TV. And the next, a hologram pops up in front of me, and here I am, barely surviving after a showdown with a freaking bear. Jellybean, are you dumb? Don't tell me you think it's just happening to you. We've all faced the same enemy and made it through the second trial. That's why we can access this community feature. Zigzag Zephyr, did you just call me stupid, you jerk? You asking for trouble right now? Silent Watcher. Cucumber connoisseur, you guys need to chill out. Approach this calmly and with awareness. Sword and syllable, can you elaborate, connoisseur? Cucumber connoisseur, absolutely. If you go to the store page and search using the keyword, you'll find a single item for sale, a question voucher. Sword and syllable, a question voucher. Cucumber Connoisseurs, yes, as the name suggests, this voucher allows you to ask a single question to the Tower of Awakening. I've already used mine to ask it why we're here. Silent Watcher. Banana Bard, well, what did it say? Zigzag Zephyrs, yeah, spit it out already. Cucumber Connoisseur, the response they gave was as follows, you've been summoned into this trial of awakening as a chance to confront your impending doom. This trial is humanity's last opportunity to protect itself, an opportunity extended out of pity for your feeble existence. As Asher absorbed this information, it was far from a casual revelation. The single sentence that struck him the most was, confront your impending doom. There was only one possible interpretation. Sword and syllable this, what's happening on earth right now? Silent Watcher. Zigzag Zephyr, what are you talking about? How does this have anything to do with Earth? Jellybean, you're seriously clueless. Zigzag Zephyr, I swear, if I ever figure out who you are. Banana Bard, all right, everyone, let's take a step back. It's clear from that statement that something significant is happening on Earth. It could either mean that Earth is on the brink of a global crisis, or it's already in one. It's just as he mentioned, Asher added with a solemn tone. The response we received from the question voucher leaves no room for interpretation other than the impending doom of Earth. It seems we, the chosen challengers summoned for this trial, have been specifically selected to awaken powers and confront whatever threat is endangering our lives and our homes. Cucumber Connoisseur, now that you're aware of the existence of the question voucher, I would kindly request that you share the question you intend to ask and the response you receive from the system. Even if the question seems mundane, this information could prove to be valuable for all of us. He's right, Asher concurred. I should definitely explore the question voucher. But before that, let me take a closer look at this inspection skill I acquired after completing the second trial. 
It's no surprise that I could access information about that savage woodland bear. This could prove to be quite valuable in the future. Considering it's a skill I acquired randomly, it's not too shabby. Now, it's time to explore that store. Asher's emotions surged as he gazed upon the store page, feeling overwhelmed by the seemingly infinite array of choices. It was as if he had stepped into a realm of limitless possibilities, where countless build options and synergies danced before his eyes. The store offered a treasure trove of items, from skill books spanning all rarities and classes to equipment and consumables, each possessing unique and unexpected utilities. The sheer magnitude of options left him in awe, his mind racing with the potential paths he could now tread on his journey of growth and exploration. However, he refrained from making any immediate purchases and opted to leave the tantalizing array of items untouched for the time being. His initial acquisition would be the coveted question voucher, a recommendation he had received from one of the individuals in the chat. Just search with the keyword, duh. He mumbled to himself as he typed, let's see, ah, uh, there it is. Only five points? Well, ain't that a steal? I can practically buy these like candy and ask a gazillion questions, right? Wait, hold on, uses, one? Ah, uh, figures. I guess it's one question per voucher. They had to rain on my Q&A parade, didn't they? You have purchased a question voucher for five points. Hmm. I believe I'll hold on to the voucher until others have used theirs. This way, I can gather more information about this place while reserving my question for when it truly becomes necessary. All right, enough with the formalities. Time to snag some gear that'll help me wipe the floor on the next level. What's the plan? First up, my animate guardian needs a real weapon. That bow and arrow won't cut it for long. As for me, forget about personal stuff for now. What I really crave is a monster magnet to keep those bastards off my back and have them fixated on my summon. Let's see what's in the arsenal. Bingo. This ought to do the trick. You've purchased. Skill book for 100 points. All right, I've dropped 105 points out of my initial 300. I still have a solid 195 to deck out my guardian with some real gear. Time to see what's up for grabs. A note from First Bite. Based on the skill icon, what do you think it is? Chapter 7 Question Vouchers Asher's first choice in the shop was a rather unconventional one, a taunting skill. While most individuals would opt for an offensive skill to gain an early advantage in the trial, Asher was acutely aware of a significant vulnerability shared by all Necromancer class practitioners. This vulnerability lay in the risk of their summons being isolated from them. In stark contrast to the typical necromancer, Asher did not command a legion of summons capable of fending off formidable foes or groups of enemies. Instead, he had a sole, faithful summon by his side. To safeguard against the peril of being singled out by adversaries, Asher made the strategic decision to teach his ally with a taunting skill. This skill would divert the attention of his foes away from him, granting him precious moments to control the battle. Fortunately, he stumbled upon the Provoke skill, which was a common rank and a more budget-friendly price tag, making it accessible for him to acquire. Would you like to learn this skill or teach it to your Animate Guardian? Teach it to my Animate Guardian. Your Animate Guardian has learned Provoke. All right, now that we have a means to redirect the enemy's focus away from me, it's time to find a suitable weapon for him. Let's explore the equipment section of the shop and see what options we have available. A plethora of choices flooded Asher's senses as he perused the shop's offerings. The array of weapons was staggering, each varying in type, rank, and effects, accompanied by a diverse range of price points. To narrow down his options, he wisely utilized the shop's filtering feature. He set the filter to display only weapons with a price tag below 195 points, aligning with the remaining balance he had at his disposal, and he then filtered that option to first showcase the highest point choices. Huh? This is exactly what I needed. Asher exclaimed, his eyes lighting up as he spotted a particular item amidst the filtered results. It was as if fate had guided his search. The item before him was a perfect match for his current needs. 
As Asher scrutinized the spike shield, a smile spread across his face. It struck him that this wasn't merely an ordinary shield, it was the Animate Guardian's best option at this very moment. His reasoning was quite simple. The newly acquired Provoke skill, instilled in his Guardian, could seamlessly synchronize with the Spike Shield's versatile attributes. With the Spike Shield firmly in the Guardian's grasp, it could now entice adversaries, coaxing their focus while wielding the shield for a blend of offense and defense. The shield's menacing spikes not only deterred attackers, but also doubled as close combat weaponry. What's more, it possessed an additional bone, reflecting 5% of damage back at the assailant. This feature rendered it the perfect choice, granting his guardian the ability to safeguard itself while augmenting its close quarters combat prowess. Asher found himself realizing that he didn't require a separate sword. The spike shield, in essence, was both his guardian's protector and its weapon. Despite its relatively steep price compared to other options, it was the sole magical grade item available within the filtered selection he had been presented with. This find left him with no doubt that he had made the most strategic choice he could secure at this time. Items come in a hierarchy of power and rarity, each tier stronger than the next. At the bottom of the hierarchy lie the common items. These unassuming tools are as numerous as grains of sand on a beach. They are the simplest, the most easily obtainable, and often the most overlooked items. Rising above the common, we find the magic tier, where items are imbued with lesser enchantments. Magic items are quite uncommon, but still acquirable. They can either be looted, bought, or crafted. They usually are imbued with a single enchantment, providing advantages that the common could never provide. Beyond magic, we venture into the realm of rarity. Rare items, as their name suggests, are not only imbued with formidable power but are also exceptionally scarce, often acquired through arduous trials, victorious battles against formidable foes, or by exchanging hefty sums of currency. Much like their magical counterparts, rare items possess enchantments, but these extraordinary enhancements draw from a pool of choices that far exceeds the ones available on a magic item. What sets them apart is the astonishing capacity for enchantment, with some rare items boasting up to five imbued properties, each carefully selected from a vast reservoir of possibilities. At the pinnacle of the hierarchy, we encounter the unique items, legendary in every sense of the word. Each one is a singular creation, unparalleled in its might. A sword forged from a fallen star, a bow that never misses its target, a mirror that reveals hidden truths, these are the game changers, the artifacts that turn ordinary beings into legends. The ranks of common, magic, rare, and unique can also be seamlessly applied to skills, enhancing the complexity and depth of the abilities wielded. You have purchased a spike guard shield for 180 points. Your animated guardian has unequipped the two-handed bow wooden crude bow and the offhand quiver rusty quiver. Your animate guardian has equipped the offhand shield spike guard shield. Having expended every hard-earned point at his disposal, Asher felt a sense of readiness washing over him as he prepared to confront the looming challenge of his next trial. With his strategy meticulously crafted around the synergistic pairing of the spike guard shield and the provoke skill, he was poised for what lay ahead. His plan was simple, to allow his animate guardian to bear the brunt of the battle while he focused on accumulating more points to enhance not only his own stats, but also those of his faithful summon. However, the system had yet to signal the commencement of the forthcoming trial. While awaiting its notification, Asher decided to re-enter the community chat room, anticipating that fellow participants might have already made use of their question vouchers. He hoped to glean valuable insights about this place and the intricacies of its workings from their knowledge sharing. Cucumber Connoisseur, has anyone put their question vouchers to use? Sword and syllable, indeed, I did. I inquired about the creator of the Tower of Awakening, only to be met with a response that my voucher rank fell short of accessing that information. Interestingly, the system permitted me to pose another question, as if unanswered responses didn't count as responses. I then tried to inquire about the number of floors in the tower, only to encounter the same prompt. Cucumber Connoisseur H.M. It appears that the scope of our questions is restricted by the rank of our vouchers. 
Given their common rank, it seems that we are limited to asking straightforward and uncomplicated questions, not delving too deeply into the intricacies of this place. How about posing a query regarding the consequences of failing to successfully complete a trial? Sword and syllable let me make an attempt. All right, this time I received a response. It appears that failing to progress beyond the first five floors of the trial will result in our return to Earth, with no possibility of returning here. However, if we fail beyond the fifth floor, Cucumber Connoisseur, what is it? Sword and syllable failing beyond the fifth floor means death. Zigzag Zephyr, death. Jellybean, how can that be? Silent Watcher. As I suspected, if my grasp of this is accurate, the initial five floors serve as tutorials, while progressing beyond the fifth floor marks the commencement of the true trial. Sword and syllable, how about you guys? What question did you ask? Jellybean, I was concerned for my family, and so I posed a question about Earth and what was currently going on there, only to receive yet another unanswered response. Similarly, when I inquired about the number of individuals who had been transported to this place, I encountered the same silence. Frustrated by these broad questions leading to no answers, I shifted my focus and asked the system to explain the attributes and their functions. Cucumber Connoisseur O. What a great question to ask. What did it say? Jellybean, here's the detail I've been provided. Strength bestows a 1% increase in physical damage for each point invested. Vitality offers AL 10-point boost to maximum health with each allocation. Intelligence augments both mana reserves and magical potency. Each point contributes an additional 0.5 mana and amplifies magic power by 0.5%. Dexterity for every point invested, it enhances critical strike chance by 0.5% and amplifies critical damage output by an additional 0.5%. Sword and syllable, those stats do indeed make sense. Thank you for sharing this valuable information. It will undoubtedly assist us in tailoring our skills and abilities more effectively. How about you, Zephyr? Zigzag Zephyr, ha! Huh? You bet I asked the most crucial question. Jellybean, really? I have my doubts. Zigzag Zephyr, pfft. As if someone like you could grasp the mind of a gamer. Jellybean, gamer? Wait, don't tell me. Zigzag Zephyr, that's right. I had the system handpick the absolute best skill for my class, taking into account my unique skill. Ha ha ha. Silent Watcher. Cucumber Connoisseur. Sword and syllable. Jelly bean, that idiot. Zigzag Zephyr, why is everyone suddenly so quiet? The system provided me with the answer, and it's the most game-breaking skill that perfectly suits me. All I need is to save up, let me see, oh yes. 19,705 points. Is he a fool? Cucumber connoisseur, ahem. Anyway, what about you banana bard? Banana Bard, oh yes. I asked if there was a way for us to return to Earth without failing a trial, and there is. Upon clearing the fifth floor, we'll have the opportunity to return to Earth for a limited time. While it didn't provide specific details, it did confirm that this option becomes available at that stage. Jellybean, oh my god, thank god. That is great news. Sword and syllable, indeed, it's a relief to know that we have the option to return to Earth after clearing the fifth floor. This information brings a sense of reassurance. Thank you, Bard. What about you, Silent Watcher? Silent Watcher. Subclass. When? Answer. Floor 10. Sword and syllable, oh ho, that is a great question to ask. So will we be able to select our subclass after clearing the 10th floor? The 10th floor, huh? It looks like I'll need to ensure I've developed a solid build by the time I reach that stage, or else my foundation will be all over the place. Asher listened intently as the conversation in the community chat room continued, and he learned two crucial pieces of information. The first was about the 10th floor, where he could finally choose his subclass, a prospect that filled him with anticipation and excitement. 
However, when the topic shifted to the fifth floor and the possibility of returning to Earth after clearing it, Asher's reaction was surprisingly muted. The reason was simple, yet profound, he had no one waiting for him back on Earth. His family and friends were distant memories, lost in the transition of passing time. While the option to return held meaning for many, Asher had become disconnected from the life he had left behind. His focus remained on the path ahead, the mysteries of the Tower of Awakening, and the excitement it provided to his doled-out life. For him, the fifth floor's promise of returning to Earth was a gesture from a past life that held little sway in his current journey, yet, like anyone else, he still harbored a few tethers that kept him anchored to the mundane world known as Earth. The third floor is about to open. Please prepare yourself to face the third part of the trial. Transporting Asher Gray to the Third Floor Best of Luck Chapter 8 Normal, Elite And Boss Ranks Asher blinked, disoriented, and realized with a sinking feeling that he was back in the same forest for the third time in a row. But this time, things were different. Instead of the sunny breeze he'd experienced before, he found himself in a heavy rainstorm. Rain dripped from the twisted branches above, pattering onto the damp ground. Dark clouds covered the sky, making it feel like night was coming, even though it was still daytime. Distant thunder rumbled through the woods, adding to the eerie atmosphere. Again. I should have seen it coming, I guess. Seems like these trials stick to certain themes, and I'll be dealing with this one across a bunch of levels until it's no longer relevant. But how long is that gonna be? Asher had a growing sense of familiarity with the forest and its trials, but he couldn't help but wonder how long this cycle of trials would continue. It seemed that each trial was based on a specific environment, and he had already encountered challenges related to survival and combat with goblins. The consistent presence of the savage woodland bear in this forest suggested that it might play a crucial role in the final trial regarding this specific zone slash area, a boss battle of sorts. As he looked around, he noticed something else that surprised him. The trees that had been lush and green in his previous trials were now shedding their leaves in a multitude of colors. It was as if the forest had transitioned from summer to fall overnight. The ground was carpeted with leaves in various shades of red, orange, and yellow. The change in the season added to the unsettling feeling that something was amiss, leaving Asher even more perplexed. Trial's Objective, Destroy the Goblin Settlement 0-1 Duration, 10 Hours Failure from Completing the Trial Closure to Further Floors Reward for Completing the Trial Random Equipment More Goblins? An Entire Settlement? How many of them are in there? Eliminating Goblins had initially been a breeze for him back at the second stage, but this time, the odds were stacked against him. It felt as though the tower was determined to prevent him from succeeding the same way he had done in the second trial. While the forest had been set ablaze in his previous attempt, this time he found himself in the same place, facing off against the enemy in the pouring rain with their numbers far surpassing the previous one. A full-fledged settlement of goblins, and the challenge ahead seemed much more daunting. Fortunately, there seemed to be no imminent threat concealed behind the bushes, judging by his guardian's behavior. It appeared that the goblins had decided to stay indoors as soon as the rain began pouring. Despite the rain putting him at a disadvantage, it offered several advantages. Asher could move through the forest without alerting them to his presence due to the masking of his footsteps sounds and the reduced likelihood of them scouting the area in such a heavy downpour. With determination, Asher chose to press forward, intent on locating the settlement. Drawing from his past experiences, he had learned that whenever the trial transported him to a new location, the trial's objective tended to be nearby rather than distant. As he had anticipated, it only took a few minutes of wandering before he stumbled upon the settlement. The goblin settlement was nestled within the heart of the forest, concealed by thick foliage and strategically hidden from prying eyes. The surroundings were a tangled mess of towering trees. The settlement itself was a network of crudely constructed structures, seemingly haphazardly assembled from scavenged materials. The main focal point of the settlement was a central hut, noticeably larger than the others, with a crooked thatched roof that sloped at odd angles. 
Its walls were a patchwork of various wooden planks, bark, and woven vines. Surrounding the central hut were several smaller hovels, each equally makeshift in appearance, housing the goblin inhabitants. These huts were scattered irregularly, giving the settlement an organic, chaotic feel. The atmosphere carried the unmistakable fragrance of moist earth as Asher approached the settlement's entrance, carefully hiding himself behind a large bush. Positioned at the gateway were two guards, clad in tatted armor that bore the marks of wear and tear. They clutched spears in hand, their makeshift weapons, ready to ward off any potential intruders who dared to approach. They all seemed pretty similar, with the only thing setting them apart being their clothes and weapons based on their roles. Like, for example, the goblin hunter had a bow and arrow and wasn't wearing much armor. Now, how should I approach this? The task at hand was quite complicated, leaving Asher with limited options. He had initially considered ambushing them one by one, but lacking the necessary gear for assassination attempts made him abandon that idea. Next, he thought about setting traps, but with no prior experience in doing so, he doubted his ability to set one up effectively. As he contemplated his strategy, a sudden figure emerged from the large central hut within the settlement. Its massive, corpulent body wobbled as it took a step outside, catching Asher completely off guard. He hadn't expected to encounter such creatures here. This being resembled the goblins, but one could say it was an evolved version of a goblin, like a piku evolving into a Pikachu. As it emerged from the hut, it began to wobble around in anger towards a nearby goblin, seemingly pleading for mercy. The goblin knelt down, pressing his face against the creature's feet, kissing and licking them in submission. However, the creature showed no mercy. With a sudden and swift motion, it withdrew its feet from the goblin's embrace and, in one stomp, reduced the goblin's head to a pulpy mess of remains. How on earth am I supposed to take down this place? I mean, look at that fatso. He could eat me up in one bite, and I've also got to deal with the other goblins hanging around. How am I going to do this? As he continued to observe the settlement, the situation grew increasingly perilous. His available options dwindled, making it incredibly challenging to devise a viable strategy. Setting the place on fire was out of the question due to the ongoing rain. Assassination was ineffective because he lacked the necessary gear to eliminate all the goblins inside. Setting traps was also a fruitless endeavor, as Asher lacked the expertise to set them up effectively. What else can I do? Wait. Then, a sudden realization dawned upon him. Within the context of this trial, his objective wasn't to kill the monster within the settlement, but rather to destroy the settlement itself. One thing he could count on was the presence of the imposing figure in this place. I suppose that's my only option. This time, I'll put you to use, the least you can do after nearly getting me killed twice in a row, right, big guy? Chapter 9 Unexpected Harvest to accomplish his objective in this challenging trial, Asher needed to tap into his creativity and audacity. Alone, he couldn't destroy the settlement, so he had to seek external assistance, and who better to approach than a massive and ruthless bloodthirsty beast? Over the past few hours, Asher had been cautiously traversing the forest, doing his utmost to evade both goblin scouts and the formidable bear itself. With just two hours remaining in his time limit, Asher stumbled upon a suspicious-looking cave. Its entrance was littered with numerous bones and bore the telltale signs of dried blood splatters. Only the forest sovereign could leave such a macabre decoration behind. With heart-pounding and visions of a bear three times his size filling his imagination, Asher cautiously crept toward the cave. As he peeked inside, half expecting the bear to be actually waiting to pounce at him, to his simultaneous astonishment and predictability, there was the bear, laying on the ground, curled up, and snuggling with what appeared to be its uncooked and unfinished meal. It had made itself a cozy nest of torn-up meat and was deeply engrossed in a food-induced slumber. The bear was nestled in a carnivorous comforter, snoring away in a protein-packed dreamland. Okay, how should I approach this? Asher kept his distance, thinking hard about how to get the bear to the settlement without risking his life. However, no matter how he thought about it, he had only one option. I've got to draw it toward the settlement and play the bait. 
Ha, huh, I really hope this plan pans out. Fortunately, Asher still had the bow and quiver he'd taken from his animated guardian when he had switched it with the spike guard shield. He settled into a comfortable yet close position to the bear. Slowly, he pulled back the bowstring, an arrow delicately knocked, and with focus and patient precision, Asher released the string, sending the arrow hurtling towards the bear's sleeping area. And then, bam! Well, not that I expected to actually cause any significant damage with that shot. Having managed to land a rather measly amount of points of damage on the bear, Asher now was confronted a furious and agitated beast, its sights locked firmly on him. With a deafening roar, the bear charged towards Asher, ready to unleash its fury. Roar! Time to run! Asher exclaimed as he broke into a sprint toward the goblin settlement, with his guardian right beside him, matching his pace. As Asher dashed through the dense forest, the enraged bear hot on his heels, chaos unfolded amidst the towering trees. Twigs snapped, leaves rustled, and the thunderous pounding of paws echoed through the woods. Dodging between gnarled roots and darting around trunks, Asher weaved through the forest like a dancer in a high-stakes ballet, leaves and twigs crunching beneath his feet. The bear's ferocious growls were a relentless reminder of the peril at his back. Finally, Asher burst through the forest's edge, arriving at the goblin settlement. His sudden appearance jolted the goblin guards stationed at the gate. Swiftly assessing the situation, one of the goblins produced an unusual instrument resembling a horn. With a quick breath, they blew into it, unleashing a resounding noise that reverberated throughout the settlement, serving as a warning to the horde within that danger was approaching. It's your turn. As Asher neared the entrance to the settlement, he swiftly veered to the right, heading in the opposite direction of the gate. Before the bear could react to his unexpected turn, a sudden taunting cry pierced the air, bringing the bear to a halt as it shifted its focus to the source of the noise, Asher's animated guardian, which had just unleashed its newly acquired provoke active skill. With the bear's attention now diverted, Asher seized the opportunity. Good. Now head inside the settlement. Following his command, the guardian made a beeline for the settlement. Two goblin guards stationed at the entrance attempted to block its path, but the imposing figure charging behind the guardian was too menacing. They hastily stepped aside, anticipating the inevitable collision. With a swift charge, the guardian rammed the wooden gate open, gaining entry to the settlement. Following suit, the bear charged in, crashing through the gate and the walls that had held it together, debris of the once sturdy gate flying all around, crashing on the close huts. The abrupt intrusion into their homes had the goblins on high alert. They swiftly encircled the bear from all directions, while the leader of the settlement, a menacing hobgoblin, emerged from its dwelling and cautiously advanced toward the massive bear. Zarvok Norkel, the hobgoblin uttered, attempting to communicate with the intruder. Roar, the bear continued to roar in a frenzied state. Meanwhile, the guardian's taunt had served its purpose, and its duration came to an end. It successfully diverted the bear's attention and returned to its master's side. The goblins, armed with crude weapons and warily eyeing the frenzied bear, formed a tight circle around the intruder, lending an eerie atmosphere to the tense standoff. The hobgoblin leader approached the bear with slow, deliberate steps. Zig Morlock, the hobgoblin repeated, attempting to assert dominance while its fellow goblins muttered nervously. The bear responded with another deafening roar, its massive frame quivering with aggression, a daunting adversary to any creature in its path. The tension in the air was palpable as both sides held their ground, uncertain of what would happen next. Amidst this nerve-wracking confrontation, Asher watched from a concealed spot, carefully planning his next move, knowing that the outcome of this encounter could shape the fate of his trial. With the tension reaching its peak, Asher swiftly knocked an arrow onto his bowstring, drawing it back. His target was the bear's broad back, a vulnerable spot exposed to his attack. You'll have to kill each other for me. Asher muttered to himself, his voice barely audible over the tension-filled air. In a split second, he released the arrow, and it sailed through the darkness and the falling rain, finding its mark with accuracy. The arrow struck the bear's hind, eliciting a howl of pain and fury as the bear's frenzied rage intensified. 
the goblins, startled by the sudden turn of events, took it as a signal to attack. With a chaotic battle cry, they descended upon the bear, brandishing their crude weapons, while the hobgoblin leader seizing the opportunity to strike with them. The battle raged on, a gruesome scene, with numerous goblins meeting their gruesome end at the hands of the bear's raw strength and razor-sharp claws. The forest floor became a canvas of carnage as the unfortunate goblins fell victim to the beast's relentless onslaught. Yet, the bear was not impervious to their relentless attacks. The sheer number of goblins allowed many of their strikes to find their marks on the massive bear's body. Each wound, though small individually, collectively added to the bear's pain and determination to fend off its assailants. The hobgoblin leader played a pivotal role, skillfully directing the bear's attention towards himself. The hobgoblin maintained its position as the primary focus of the bear's wrath, allowing the goblins to exploit the opportunity to their advantage. My EXPs. Asher muttered, remaining hidden as he bore witness to the massacre unfolding before him. His thoughts fixated on the numerous fallen goblins, each one a missed opportunity for experience points. Minutes dragged on, and the battlefield dwindled to just the hobgoblin, barely standing, and the bear, its fur matted with blood from the numerous wounds it had sustained. Both combatants understood that the impending outcome would determine the victor of this gruesome duel. Observing how events had transpired, Asher couldn't afford to let this opportunity slip through his fingers. He waited patiently, allowing them to continue their brutal exchange until their health pools had significantly depleted, seizing the perfect moment to make his move. Now, use provoke. Just as the bear was about to land its final blow on the hobgoblin, Asher quickly commanded his guardian to use its provoke skill. This unexpected move halted the fight between the hobgoblin and the woodland bear, making both of them turn their attention to the guardian. During this brief pause, Asher told his guardian to do its best to keep the adversaries at bay and strike when possible. In the background, Asher made the most of this momentary distraction, firing his remaining five arrows at the hobgoblin. With the injuries it had suffered from the bear, Asher's attacks, his guardian's counters, and the reflected damage from the spike guard's effect, the hobgoblin found itself overwhelmed and defeated. This victory meant Asher was the one who took down the hobgoblin and reaped the rewards. You have killed the hobgoblin, elite. You have earned 55 EXP. 55 slash 200. Although Asher yearned to celebrate his recent victory, he couldn't afford to linger as his attention now shifted to the wounded bear. Fortunately, there was no need for him to flee this time. It was a now or never situation. The bear itself was on its last legs, a formidable opponent, but barely clinging to life. If Asher could muster the courage to stand his ground and face this colossal creature head-on, the potential rewards were beyond imagination. He had every reason to accept this daunting challenge. With his quiver depleted, Asher made a quick decision, opting to pick up one of the goblin guard's spears. The provoke skill may be on cooldown, but that doesn't mean my guardian can't draw its attention, Asher muttered to himself. Guardian, attack it, and whenever it retaliates, use your shield for defense. Position yourself opposite to me so that I can strike from behind. When it turns to face me, you strike from behind. We've got this. Asher and his guardian moved into position. The bear, weakened and disoriented, struggled to maintain its footing. Asher held the goblin guard's spear tightly, his hands trembling with a mixture of fear and anticipation. The guardian, true to Asher's command, engaged the bear, drawing its attention by bashing the spikes of his shield into the bear's body. As the bear roared in pain and anger, it attempted to lash out, but the guardian skillfully defended itself with its shield, deflecting the bear's attacks and allowing the reflected damage to do its job. Asher approached from behind, with a swift and measured movement, Asher thrust the stolen spear into the bear's exposed flank. The bear howled in agony as the weapon found its mark, inflicting a significant wound. Asher withdrew the spear, readying himself for another strike. This synchronized dance of offense and defense kept the bear off balance, preventing it from focusing on a single target. As Asher and his guardian continued their coordinated assault, the bear's strength waned further. 
The forest echoed with the sounds of their struggle, each strike and roar bringing them one step closer to victory. Their perseverance and tactical prowess paid off as the most long-awaited prompt appeared before him. You have killed Savage Woodland Bear, boss. You have earned 150 EXP. 205-200. Congratulations for reaching LV.3. You have acquired 5 attribute points. You have completed this trial of awakening third trial. You have gone past the required objective. Calculating reward. You have earned 300 points for clearing the third trial. You have earned an additional 100 points for killing an elite mob. You have earned an additional 300 points for killing a boss mob. Whoa! Asher exclaimed, his eyes widening as the numbers of prompt kept scrolling, revealing the unexpected bounty of points he had earned from this single trial. I've earned 700 points. I guess they weren't joking when they said I could gain extra points by exceeding the trial's objective. For clearing the third floor of the trial, you will be rewarded with a random equipment. You have gone past the required objective. Reward will be upgraded, matching your achievement. Congratulations. You have earned the Woodland Bear's Body Armor, Magic. Having finished the third trial early, you may remain until the end of the allocated time. Yes slash no. Before Asher could respond, a sudden glimmer caught his attention, emanating from the defeated Hobgoblin and the Savage Woodland Bear. He approached the fallen adversaries, his curiosity piqued. To his astonishment, resting atop each of their lifeless forms were two enigmatic gem-like stones, each sculpted in the likeness of their respective vanquished opponents. As Asher picked up these radiant treasures, he couldn't help but marvel at the dazzling spectacle they presented. The gem corresponding to the hobgoblin was a regal shade of purple, skillfully crafted to resemble the hobgoblin's face, while the one representing the bear bore a fierce red hue, its visage etched onto the gem's surface with a small green leaf atop its head. W what? Asher exclaimed, unable to contain his astonishment as he read the descriptions of these remarkable gems. Chapter 10 Upgrade, Upgrade, Upgrade A note from First Bite Enjoy! Asher reclined on his bed in the lobby, fixated on the system prompt showcasing the items he had acquired during the trial. His eyes remained locked on the mesmerizing array before him, refusing to divert his attention. The system had granted him a precious eight-hour respite, a welcome break following his consecutive participation in the first three trials. Asher deeply appreciated this opportunity to unwind and rejuvenate, having pushed himself relentlessly. During this well-deserved pause, he took his time carefully scrutinizing the descriptions of his rewards, pondering how best to allocate them. Let's not touch those points just yet. I don't want to accidentally buy a bad combination item or skill. I'll first figure out what these acquired items can actually do and then invest in things that won't turn my adventure into a circus act. All right, let's kick things off with the main reward of the trial, the Woodland Bear's Body Armor. I hope it doesn't make me or my summon look like a bear-sized fashion disaster. This is pretty decent, not too flashy, but better than nothing. Hmm. I think the best candidate for rocking this woodland bear's body armor would be my anime guardian. After all, he's currently on the close combat focused role. Asher was meticulous in his approach to equipment and skill allocation. Despite being naked in a broad sense, he made the strategic choice of outfitting his guardian. The rationale behind this decision lay in the fact that, at the moment, he faced no immediate threats from the rear. Moreover, his animate guardian already possessed a set of items and skills that harmonized well together, and Asher was keen on preserving his guardian's strength rather than risking its demise losing all the progress he had made up to this point. Thus, he opted to bolster its defenses early on, recognizing that a good defense would eventually become the best offense. You'd expect that the trial's main reward would be the juiciest item in the loot bag, but oh no, not in this case. What had Asher truly mesmerized and intrigued were these two peculiar, gemstone-like items he had looted from the lifeless corpses of the Hobgoblin and Woodland Bear. Every time he read their descriptions, he couldn't help but feel as unyielding as a rock in, well, let's just say a rather private place. What a beady! The real treasure of this trial. 
Asher's excitement reached such dizzying heights that it bordered on the creepy side of enthusiasm. He practically vibrated with glee, his eyes wide and unblinking, a grin stretching so wide it could have circled the earth twice. It was the kind of excitement that made you question whether he just won the lottery, which he did. Neither the hobgoblin and the woodland bear showed any flashy active skills. Which probably means I'm in for a round of back-to-back -back passive skills. Are you certain about trading your crystallized hearts? Bear in mind that the skills book granted are random, drawn from the monster's skill pool. Yes slash no? Hell yes. You have traded crystallized hearts, hobgoblins, savage woodland bears. You have acquired goblins rejuvenator, passive, and bared heart fortitude, passive, skill books. Reading the prompt sent Asher's excitement skyrocketing to new heights, and impatiently, he promptly tore open each skill book to devour the information inside without a moment's delay. Asher stood in stunned silence, incapable of uttering a single word as he absorbed the astonishing contents of the skill books. Both abilities were nothing short of extraordinary. Not only did they harmonize seamlessly with each other, but they also bestowed formidable defensive capabilities, benefiting both himself and his trusty anime guardian. Given the intertwined relationship between his health and mana, choosing to bestow the bare heart fortitude upon himself wasn't merely a personal gain, but also a boon for his guardian. This choice would bolster not only his health points by 50, but also those of his anime guardian. In contrast, allocating this skill to his guardian would be counterproductive. While the guardian would enjoy the benefits, Asher himself would be left without, making it a clear choice to master the skill personally and extend its advantages to all parties involved. Admittedly, he would gain an additional physical damage reduction that his guardian wouldn't, making this decision still appealing to him. Would you like to learn Bear Heart Fortitude, Passive, or teach it to your animate guardian? Teach it to me. You have learned Bear Heart Fortitude, Passive. HP 100 150. As for the other one, Goblin's Rejuvenator was undeniably an intriguing skill, yet Asher recognized that it was a perfect fit for his guardian. As the leading force of his team, his guardian often bore the brunt of enemy attacks, making it a wise choice to equip him with means of regenerating his life. Would you like to learn Goblin's Rejuvenator, passive, or teach it to your animate guardian? Teach it to my animate guardian. Your animate guardian has learned Goblin's Rejuvenator, Passive. This single trial had significantly bolstered his abilities, yet Asher found himself with a plethora of options left to explore. Among them were the allocation of his 10 attribute points and the tempting pool of 715 currency to spend on new skills or equipment from the system store tab. Time to beef up our attributes. Now, which one should I choose? As Asher contemplated which attribute to invest in, he methodically crossed out the ones that held no appeal. First to go was strength, as it offered a mere 1% increase in physical damage per point, hardly a match for his preferred role, which was not in the front lines as an attacker. Yeah, strength's out of the picture. And as for dexterity? Dexterity met the same fate, as it was an offensive attribute that didn't align with his strategy. You might assume Asher could make use of offensive spells, but the pesky downside of his anime guardian skill squashed that idea. It explicitly stated that while the guardian was active, Asher couldn't utilize offensive skills, rendering increases to critical chance and damage rather pointless as long as this drawback remained in play. Now that only leaves us with vitality and intelligence. Vitality emerged as the most enticing choice from the lineup. The boost in health was an undeniable asset, enhancing the overall survivability of both himself and his guardian. As for mana, while the increase in magic damage was of no use, the expanded mana capacity was invaluable. Asher recognized that although he didn't currently require the extra mana, it would become a necessity as he acquired more and more skills over time. Ensuring he had sufficient mana reserves for casting a growing arsenal of active skills would be paramount, especially if he found himself wielding numerous active skills in the future. For the time being, I'll go with increasing my vitality. With no active skills in my possession, boosting my intelligence is pointless. 
it would only jeopardize my advancement into the deeper floors. You have allocated 10 points into vitality. HP, 150-250. As Asher gazed at his current status window and his guardians, a surge of accomplishment washed over him. It seemed like he was steering his build in the right direction. The final piece of the puzzle to fully maximize this upgrade was deciding what to buy from the store. Now, what should be on my shopping list? Chapter 11, Fourth Trial With the system store page open, Asher found himself at a crossroads, contemplating his next strategic purchase. His guardian had laid claim to most of the valuables he had amassed thus far, leaving Asher with the realization that it was time to invest in himself. He couldn't remain ill-equipped indefinitely. Determined to make a wise choice, Asher applied a thoughtful filter to his options, necromancer only, equipment only, costing less than 700 points. Despite having the option to acquire classless items and skills like the Provoke skill, he remained steadfast in his identity as both a necromancer by class and by heart. With a sense of purpose, he delved into the available inventory, scouring for anything that might prove beneficial in terms of equipment, determined to enhance his abilities and carve a path toward self-reliance. Asher thought about his choices, a bit puzzled. Well, there are some good necromancer items here, but they seem to be more for people who can summon a bunch of minions at once. Like this one, he said, pointing to an item. It gives you a speed and attack boost if you have five summons nearby. But that won't help me since I can only summon one minion. He sighed and kept looking for something that would be more useful to him. The filter displayed the cheapest items first. As he scrolled through the list, he found nothing that seemed particularly worthwhile. However, he continued to scroll, determined to explore every possibility. Finally, he reached the very bottom of the list, where the last item was priced at a hefty 700 points. Asher stared at it, his curiosity piqued, wondering what this expensive item had to offer that might make it worth the investment. His eyes widened as he examined the item at the bottom of the list. This is quite useful. Asher exclaimed, a spark of excitement in his voice. It seemed he had stumbled upon something that had the potential to help him in his advancement. As Asher read through the ring's description, a sense of hesitation crept over him. The item did indeed seem useful, but its steep price made him question its worth. Comparing it to the spike guard shield he had previously purchased for 180 points, the cost of this rare item was nearly four times higher. His eyes lingered on the corrupted modifier, and he couldn't help but speculate that it might come with a curse or some form of trade-off, a classic case of great power at a price. However, the limitation regarding the summon capacity didn't concern him much since he typically only summoned one minion. What truly weighed on his mind was the damage transfer aspect. While the ring appeared to be an excellent defensive choice for him, it came with a significant drawback. Any damage taken would be redirected to his summon, putting it at greater risk. If they both happened to be hit by a powerful area of effect attack, not only would his minion endure its own damage, but it would also bear the brunt of Asher's, increasing the chances of its demise when not wearing the ring might have prevented such a fate. Asher couldn't deny the potential benefits of the item, but the risk involved gave him pause. He had a difficult decision to make, one that could significantly impact his effectiveness in combat. It's not worth it. If my guardian kicks the bucket because of my slip-up, I'd be in a perilous spot, stranded on the higher floors with no guardian backup. It's like playing a high-stakes game of D&D, and trust me, there's no respawn button in this tower. The fourth floor is about to open. Please prepare yourself to face the fourth part of the trial. Well, I guess I have to save my points for now. It might be a good idea. I can buy better stuff when I've got more points saved up. Transporting Asher Gray to the fourth floor. Alert! Modification to the fourth trial's original design has been put in place. Reasoned defeat of the fifth floor boss encounter before reaching the fifth floor. Huh? Difficulty has increased by a small margin. New trial generated. Best of luck. Asher's head began to spin, and his vision blurred, causing him to feel dizzy and disoriented, a feeling he had experienced for a fourth time already. 
the world around him had suddenly shifted. As he struggled to regain his senses, he realized that something was different. Gradually, his surroundings came into focus, and he found himself inside a dimly lit cave. The only source of light was the soft, silvery glow of moonlight filtering in through a narrow opening in the cave ceiling. This new environment was a stark contrast to the familiar woodland forest he had been in just moments before. The cave's walls were rough and uneven, composed of weathered rock formations that jetted out. Stalactites hung from the ceiling, their pointed tips reaching menacingly toward the floor. The air was cool and carried a musty, earthy scent. In the distance, Asher could hear the faint drip of water, suggesting the presence of an underground stream. As he cautiously took in his surroundings, his surprise and confusion deepened. He had been transported to an entirely new and mysterious location, far removed from the familiar landscapes of the woodland forest. Asher furrowed his brow, perplexed by the recent alert. Wait, what was that alert about? They changed the initial design because the fifth floor boss was defeated? Does this mean that defeating the savage woodland bear ahead of schedule altered the course of my journey through the tower? It specifically mentioned the fifth floor, so if I hadn't taken it down, would I have faced two extra trials in the forest, with the fifth one being a boss battle? Trials objective, reach the end of the pathway. Time limit, none. Failure from completing the trial closure to further floors. Reward for completing the trial random miscellaneous item. A pathway. Well, it looks like the only way to go is straight ahead. I'm curious about the kinds of enemies I might encounter in this place. Asher cautiously took a step forward within the cave. Each passing step, he began to notice something unsettling. The cave's interior seemed to be cloaked in an ever-increasing number of webs. At first, the webs were sporadic, stretching across crevices and corners. Yet, as he ventured deeper into the cave, their presence became more pronounced. Thin, glistening strands crisscrossed the rocky walls, forming intricate and extensive networks. The more he walked, the denser the webbing became, like a labyrinth spun by an unseen weaver. His sense of unease grew as he realized that this cave was not as abandoned as it initially appeared. The web suggested the presence of a hidden, arachnid inhabitant, and Asher was quickly welcomed by one of its inhabitants. Huh? What's this sticky liquid? As Asher continued his journey through the cave pathway, a gooey substance suddenly plopped onto his shoulder, drenching his pajamas. Intrigued yet cautious, he gazed upward, only to be taken aback by the unexpected sight that met his eyes. Above Asher was a menacing spider clinging to the cave ceiling. Its ebony exoskeleton shimmered, adorned with large glistening red eyes that fixated on him. The spider's spindly legs bristled with sensitivity, and its sharp mandibles twitched in eerie anticipation. H-Hello From a hidden crevice in the cave ceiling, a second spider descended, its eerie eyes fixed on Asher. Then, another and another, until a relentless swarm of arachnids emerged. Panic seizing him. Uh, hey there, little guys. I didn't realize this was your hangout. Don't suppose we could, you know talk this out? You're right, that was a weird thing to say. Well, I'll be on my way. Goodbye then. Asher fled in terror, the relentless descent of the spiders driving him deeper into the cave, fear coursing through his veins with every step as the relentless group rushed at him. Chapter 12 Web Peril Run! Asher shouted to his guardian, his voice trembling with fear. The abrupt appearance of these nightmarish spider creatures sent shivers down Asher's spine. Their sheer multitude was an overwhelming force, far beyond anything he could hope to confront alone. Panic seized him, and he had no option but to flee desperately for his very life. As he raced through the cave's dark recesses, Asher found himself torn between gratitude for the tunnel's straight path and dread as he had to constantly dodge sticky webs that clung to the cave's walls slowing him down in the process. His guardian struggled to keep pace, following closely behind as they sprinted for their lives. Just when he believed the nightmare couldn't possibly intensify, fresh hordes of spiders emerged from hidden crevices within the cave. They descended from the ceiling, lurked along the cave's walls, and their numbers seemed to multiply with every passing moment. 
Asher glanced back, eyes wide with terror. It's like they're coming out of nowhere. We have to keep going. What had started as a mere dozen spiders had rapidly transformed into a nightmarish horde, so numerous that Asher lost all hope of counting them. Yet counting was a luxury he couldn't afford, not with his heart pounding, and every ounce of his strength channeled into the desperate race for survival. As they ran, the spiders grew bolder, shooting sticky webs in their direction. Asher watched in horror as some of the webs hit his guardian, ensnaring them in a tangled mess. No! Asher cried out, looking back in worry. But thankfully, his guardian reacted swiftly. With a swift motion, he made use of his spike guard shield, the gleaming sharp spike cut through the restrictive webs like a hot knife through butter. Without missing a beat, he continued towards his summoner. Thank God. Don't lag behind. Asher panted, worry and exhaustion evident in his voice. With each passing moment, the situation grew more dire. Asher and his guardian struggled to keep ahead of the web-shooting creatures, their breaths coming in ragged gasps. As they pressed deeper into the cave, their path became more treacherous. The passage seemed to narrow the further they went, squeezing their pathway, and the spiders, with their unnerving agility, made every effort to close in on them. Asher's guardian fought off the webs, but they were visibly tiring, and Asher could feel the weight of desperation pressing down on them. What's this? Finally, as hope was dwindling and his energy waning, Asher spotted a glimmer of salvation. Ahead of them, bathed in a dim, eerie light, was a large metal door. Its surface bore an intricate design of spider webs etched into the metal, intricate and foreboding. There! Asher exclaimed, his voice filled with newfound hope. We need to reach that door. The spiders, sensing their impending freedom slipping away, redoubled their efforts, shooting webs with even greater fervor. Just as Asher's heart swelled with anticipation, a sudden sensation erupted in his feet. He stumbled, his legs entangled in a sticky, silken trap. Panic surged through him as he fell to the ground, his hands instinctively clawing at the webbing that constricted his ankles. The spiders, sensing Asher's vulnerability, closed in with even greater speed. They scuttled over the web-covered walls, their eyes glinting with malevolence as they prepared to make their strike. Just in the nick of time, Asher's guardian swiftly positioned himself in front of Asher, acting as a protective shield against the relentless barrage of webs. Given the chance to free himself from the sticky webs ensnaring his feet, Asher pressed on. He couldn't help but glance back, witnessing his guardian being overwhelmed by the massive web assault, his movements restricted and his struggles futile. Stay strong. Once I reach the end, we'll make our escape. Asher shouted over the cacophony of scuttling spiders. With a heavy heart, Asher made the agonizing decision to use his guardian as a distraction, hoping to buy himself enough time to reach the end of the treacherous pathway and trigger their return to the lobby before it was too late. As Asher sprinted toward his goal, his heart pounded in his chest. Every step felt like an eternity as he fought against the exhaustion that threatened to overwhelm him. Immobile and helpless, it was inevitable that Asher's guardian became ensnared and besieged by the relentless horde of spiders. A cascade of notifications scrolled down before him, each one a reminder of his minion's rapidly dwindling health point. But just as he approached what he hoped would be their salvation, a stroke of misfortune struck. Dozens of new spiders emerged from a previously unseen crevice just in front of them. They skittered out with terrifying speed, surrounding Asher and his guardian on all sides. Panic surged through Asher as he realized they were now trapped, with nowhere to run. The spiders closed in, their eight-legged forms moving with eerie coordination. They hissed and screeched, their fangs dripping with hunger. Once again, he cast a desperate glance back at his guardian, who struggled valiantly but was barely able to fend off the overwhelming horde of spiders on him. Asher, on the other hand, knew that their only chance lay in reaching the end of the pathway. With a deep breath, he summoned all the strength he had left and charged forward. With a solemn emotion, he screamed out his order of desperation, Guardian. Use provoke. Just as the spiders were about to lunge at him, the sudden shout diverted their attention. Asher kept his eyes closed, sprinting with all his might, dozens of spiders closing in from the front. 
To Asher's hopeful expectation, they ignored him, their focus now squarely on his guardian, who had successfully taunted their attention away from Asher. Despite Asher's closed eyes, the interface displaying his guardian's health pool remained visible in the darkness behind his eyelids. With each passing second, the health bar dwindled significantly, and his guardian's health regeneration struggled to outpace the relentless barrage of damage inflicted by the horde of spiders. It was a race against time, and the odds were growing increasingly dire. Fuck. Let me make it in time. Asher screamed out in desperation as he pushed himself past his physical limits, sweat pouring down his face without cease. His body moved with a frantic desperation, his legs and arms stretched to their absolute limits, every muscle straining as he tried to gain even an extra inch of distance. His head bobbed up and down rapidly, his entire body contorting with the urgency of his movements. He could feel his own strength waning with every passing second, but he couldn't afford to slow down. The notifications about his guardian's diminishing health haunted the corners of his vision, a constant reminder of the dire situation. As he neared what he believed to be the very last inch of his guardian's life, a sensation of cold, hard metal met his forehead. In his haste, Asher had slammed headfirst into the imposing, metallic surface. Disoriented and gasping for breath, he opened his eyes to find himself standing before the massive steel door adorned with intricate spider web designs. I, I made it. Ah. Oh. You have completed this trial of awakening fourth trial. Having finished the fourth trial, would you like to remain in the floor in order to acquire additional EXP and achievement points? Yes slash no. No. Get me the fuck out of here now. In an instant, the world around blurred from a surge of energy. His senses swayed as he found himself transported back to the lobby, his guardian laying next to him barely alive. Chapter 13 Broodmother Asher reclined on the lobby floor, still recovering from an intense cardio session that had left him shaken. This experience served as a stark reminder that he needed to broaden his focus beyond mere defense. Gazing at his anime guardian, Asher observed its health gradually replenishing. This rejuvenation stemmed from a combination of the goblin's rejuvenator passive skill and the lobby's enhanced natural healing properties. Recalling a previous trial where he had been struck by a goblin's arrow in his right shoulder, Asher couldn't help but appreciate how swiftly the lobby had healed his wound. Did me focusing so much on keeping my minion alive actually make things worse for me? This trial had served as a wake-up call, highlighting the pitfalls of concentrating solely on one facet of a build to the detriment of others. His unwavering emphasis on his minion's defense had hindered its offensive capabilities and agility. By neglecting its offensive potential, he found himself ill-equipped to handle hordes of foes, and as he progressed through the trials, it became increasingly evident that he would also be lacking the necessary power to tackle individual targets effectively. Moreover, his agility was sorely lacking, with his speed mirroring his own. Equipping more items had only exacerbated the problem, burdening his minion and slowing down both its movement and attack speed. This made it vulnerable to pursuing enemies and rendered its attack sluggish, compromising its ability to defend him effectively or mount a swift escape. I've got no other option. I'll have to set aside my own progress and prioritize making my anime guardian more stable. The next floor is the fifth and the last one before going back to Earth. Failing on the upcoming floors means certain death, so I can't afford to keep doing things the way I used to. Asher had a clear idea of how to move forward, based on his experiences on the fourth floor. What he needed most right now was an area of effect offensive skill. If he had possessed such a skill back then, his minion could have easily taken out all those spiders that swarmed him. They had low health and likely weak defenses, so he could have taken advantage of their numbers and gained a significant amount of experience points. I'm such an idiot. Currently at level 3, he knew he could have been at least level 5 if he had been more strategic about it. Another realization struck him, his over-reliance on his guardian. He not only needed to acquire an offensive skill for his guardian, but also a supportive skill to assist it in battle. The likelihood of being outnumbered in the next trial was almost a certainty, especially considering he might have to face the area boss as well. 
fueled by a determination to correct his past errors and enhance his odds of victory in the upcoming trials, Asher pressed on. The first thing Asher did was take a close look at the reward he had received for completing the fourth trial, a random miscellaneous item he had been holding onto since arriving on this floor. He carefully examined the mysterious item, pondering whether it could provide any assistance in the upcoming challenge. Asher couldn't hide his disappointment as he gazed at his reward. He had hoped for something immediately useful, but what he had received was a map fragment. As the name suggested, it was just a piece of a larger puzzle. To create a complete map, he would need to collect all the required fragments. While it hinted at unexplored treasures and potential unknown adversaries, it seemed like this item wouldn't be of much use to him for quite some time, if ever. Looks like the store is my best bet. At the moment, Asher had a total of 1105 points. Since he hadn't spent any of his points previously, plus the 400 points he earned for completing the trial, he now had a budget of over 1,000 points. This gave him more flexibility in his choices. Initially, he had contemplated buying an expensive yet powerful item or skill, but he quickly dismissed the idea. Instead, he decided to explore the common and magic rank skills. This approach would allow him to diversify his character customization, addressing his weaknesses and giving him a broader range of abilities. As he reviewed the available options in the filtered store, a sense of disappointment washed over him. Asher had noticed that most of the area of effect skills either demanded significant mana costs or relied on a specific weapon to be effective. He had hoped to find something with more versatility in its requirements. However, just when he was starting to lose hope, it was at that very moment that his prayers were answered. This. While this skill didn't fit the exact definition of an area of effect skill, it still allowed him to target multiple enemies in succession. It had all the essential features he was looking for, the ability to strike multiple foes at once, a short cooldown, low mana cost, versatile, and it was relatively inexpensive. It marked a significant step forward in enhancing his offensive capabilities. 100 points, the same price as Provoke. Common skills really offer great value for their cost. I'm glad I found something affordable early on, and it's already addressed one of my concerns. Now, let's search for a single target skill, something that could come in handy against elites or bosses. Asher knew that building a well-rounded set of abilities was crucial for his survival in the upcoming trials. Asher began his search for a single target skill, hoping to find something that would complement his current setup. As he scrolled through the options, he noticed that many of the skills required a main hand weapon, something he wasn't willing to invest in at the moment similarly to the AOE, area of effect, skills he was looking into. Others demanded too much mana, making them impractical for repeated use in battle. He continued to sift through the choices, feeling a bit frustrated. B he knew he would eventually find something tailored for him, the choices provided to him was nearly infinite and almost by chance, he stumbled upon something that matched his needs once again, another shield-based skill. A wave of relief swept over him as he delved into the skill description. This skill didn't demand a weapon and boasted a manageable mana cost. It appeared to be the perfect addition to enhance his offensive capabilities and render his guardian more fit to face against formidable adversaries. Notably, it offered not only a substantial base damage but also a crowd control, CC, advantage, all at an affordable price. Without a moment's hesitation, he quickly confirmed the purchase. This decision infused him with renewed optimism, bolstering his confidence for the impending trials. Okay, I think that's enough for the Guardian. I've given him two new skills, one for handling groups and one for taking down single targets. Those should work for now. What I really gotta find is a support skill, something to mess up the enemy or help my allies out. What I really need is a healing skill. A healing skill was an essential for most necromancers, for a simple reason, the downfall of their summons often meant their own defeat was imminent. The fourth trial had made this painfully clear, as his guardian's health had plummeted close to zero. Consequently, Asher had made a deliberate decision to obtain a healing skill early on, no matter the cost. 
as he filtered through the options, expecting to spend only around 100 to 300 points, Asher was taken aback to discover that the lowest ranked healing skill available was a whopping rare rank. As expected, the price had skyrocketed from magic to rare, sitting at a minimum quadruple the price range. This meant that in order to obtain the most budget-friendly healing skill, he would have to part with all his remaining points. I'll take the risk. With a determined resolve, Asher decided to take the gamble. He knew the importance of having a healing skill in his arsenal, and the trials ahead demanded that he be prepared for any challenge. With a wave of his hand, he confirmed his choice, sacrificing his hard-earned points for the promise of greater survivability and adaptability in the trials to come. Having acquired the rare rank healing skill, Asher felt a mix of relief and anticipation. He had invested heavily in this ability, but he believed it was a necessary investment for his survival in the challenging trials. Armed with a newfound confidence in his guardian's upgraded skills and his own healing abilities, Asher was ready to venture forth to face the fifth floor, the final stage before returning to Earth. The fifth floor is about to open. Please prepare yourself to face the fifth part of the trial. Transporting Asher Gray to the fifth floor. Asher's head began to spin, and his vision blurred, leaving him feeling dizzy and disoriented. When the fog cleared, he realized he was standing before the very same place he had left earlier, the imposing metal gate adorned with intricate web-like designs. Despite the imposing aura that emitted behind that door, Asher still moved forward pushing open the gate and entering the door beyond, where even greater challenges awaited him. As he stepped into the unknown, the atmosphere grew tense, and he could sense the presence of a formidable adversary lurking in the shadow. As Asher ventured further into the fifth floor, his gaze fell upon a peculiar and unsettling sight. There, on the ground, lay a massive, obese spider. Its body was covered in a striking pattern of black and white hairy skin, and its face was predominantly white. The spider's enormous frame seemed to be struggling under its own weight, making it appear almost immobile. Its legs twitched weakly as it attempted to lift itself, but it was clear that the creature was in a state of extreme exhaustion. The sheer size and unusual appearance of the spider sent shivers down Asher's spine, as he couldn't help but wonder what had led this formidable arachnid to such a weakened state. As he cautiously approached the creature, he couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to this encounter than met the eye until beside the massive spider was surrounded by a swarm of smaller arachnids, each with gleaming red eyes that seemed to glow in the shadows. These smaller spiders, the very same he had encountered in the previous trial, exuded an eerie aura of malevolence as they moved about with unnerving coordination. Trial Objective, Defeat the Broodmother The air grew thick with tension as Asher braced himself for whatever confrontation lay ahead in this eerie and dark place. Chapter 14 Unexpected Sacrifice Surrounded by dozens of spiders, each with their large, crimson, compound eyes locked onto the intruder, a peculiar aura of patience radiated from them. It was as though they possessed an innate understanding, waiting for their mother's command before taking any action. The scene before them was nothing short of repulsive, with piles of bones melding together, dried blood scattered throughout, and intricate webs draping the entire area. In this vast expanse, the brood mother found ample room for her sizable frame to recline comfortably. Upon sensing the intrusion into her domain, a resonant screech emanated from the brood mother. In response to this eerie sound, the surrounding spiders sprang into action, moving with uncanny synchrony as they surged towards Asher and his guardian. Their movements were a grotesque spectacle to behold, resembling a nightmarish ballet. The spiders, with their angular, arachnid limbs, moved in a twisted harmony, their crimson eyes gleaming with malevolence. Their steps were unnaturally coordinated as they closed in on Asher and his guardian. It was a chilling display. There were around six of them that had been sent out to kill them, as they approached Asher stayed composed, appreciating the fact that it wasn't hundreds of them that came at once. As they closed in close enough, it was time for Asher to make his first move. Guardian, unleash your new ability shield throw. Upon receiving the command, the guardian hurled his shield towards the nearest spider with precision. The shield cut through the air, spinning horizontally, and its impact was imminent. The moment it struck, half of its potential damage had already been inflicted. 
with a base damage from his skill ranging from a minimum of 10 to a maximum of 15, further enhanced by the shield's added damage, offering a supplementary 5 at the least and 6 at most. The combined damage of this attack promised a devastating output, ranging from 15 to a staggering 21 in damage. Considering the Duskbiter Spider's 30 health points, a single blow from the Guardian's shield throw would undoubtedly cleave away at least half of its vitality. The initial strike had landed, but the shield displayed a relentless determination. Upon making contact with its first target, it rebounded with surprising agility, seeking out the next enemy in its path. With uncanny precision, it ricocheted three more times, striking each adversary with relentless force. Then, upon reaching its fourth intended victim, it swiftly reversed course, returning to the Guardian's waiting right arm. Asher couldn't help but draw parallels to Captain America's iconic use of his shield. In a swift and decisive move, Asher's Guardian delivered a powerful basic attack that sealed the fate of the weakened spiders. The attack both from the raw force of the swing and the reflected damage when he deftly blocked their retaliatory strikes with his shield, proved overwhelming. The remaining two healthy spiders fared no better, succumbing to a combination of skillful strikes and expertly timed blocks from the Guardian. Their resistance crumbled, and the threat they posed dissolved into the darkness of the cavern, leaving Asher and his Guardian victorious in the wake of their fierce battle. You have killed a Dustbiter Arachnid. You have earned 6 EXP. X6. EXP, 41 slash 300. Their fleeting victory was abruptly shattered by the bone-chilling shriek of the broodmother, heralding a looming, more ominous threat. Responding to her command, a dozen spiders burst forth, as if she had astutely gauged their strength and orchestrated a challenge of greater magnitude. The odds had doubled, and Asher and his guardian now confronted a new wave of onslaught. On my command. With resolve in his eyes, Asher positioned himself behind his guardian, who took on the role of the vanguard against the upcoming horde of spiders. The arachnid foes skittered relentlessly toward them, yet Asher remained poised, patiently waiting for them to draw nearer. Now. Use provoke. The guardian stood firm, executing the provoke ability with unwavering composure, taunting all dozen spiders in their direction. A barrage of attacks descended upon him, but in a brilliant twist of strategy, a portion of the inflicted damage was deftly reflected back onto their assailants. The battle had escalated into a thrilling contest of wit and resilience. As Asher observed his guardian's life steadily diminishing, he remained steadfast, resisting the urge to act prematurely. The dire situation demanded patience and precision, and he bided his time, waiting for the opportune moment to make his move. You have killed a Dustbiter Arachnid. You have earned 6 EXP. 47 slash 300. Asher's strategy played out as he had envisioned. The unrelenting assault from the spiders resulted in significant reflected damage, gradually wearing them down until their health plummeted to the brink of defeat. It was a daring gambit, requiring his guardian to absorb multiple blows at the expense of his own health. But Asher knew the opportune moment would come, and when it did. Now. Soulful restoration. He would unleash his healing powers to rejuvenate his guardian and turn the tide of battle in their favor. The battle was a high-stakes dance of risk and reward, and Asher was determined to emerge victorious. You have killed a Dustbiter Arachnid. You have earned 6 EXP. X11. EXP 113-300. Asher wasn't foolish. He knew this strategy had its limits and couldn't be used too often. One big issue was mana. His skills and his minions' abilities used up mana, so he couldn't overdo it. That's why he waited until his guardian's health was close to half before acting. By healing him just above 60%, he could let his passive skill gradually bring his guardian back to full health. Asher was playing it smart, knowing when to use his skills and when to let nature take its course. Asher could sense the birdmother's growing irritation as she watched her offspring fall one by one. Realizing that her forces were dwindling rapidly, she let out one final, furious shriek, commanding the remaining spiders to end the intruders. Nearly thirty spiders began advancing toward them, a formidable force that Asher knew he couldn't handle alone. 
he swiftly ordered his guardian to prepare. With a keen eye, Asher assessed the formation of the spiders, pinpointing the spot with the highest concentration of arachnids lined up in a row. He saw an opportunity not only to eliminate as many of them as possible, but also to advance toward a specific destination. She'll charge over there, and keep going even after passing through them. The Guardian followed Asher's command without hesitation, launching into a powerful charge that mowed down any spider unfortunate enough to cross its path. With a base damage of at least 50, the spiders stood no chance, crumbling under the force of a single blow. The Guardian surged past about five of them, reducing their numbers to around 25. You have killed a Dustbiter Arachnid. You have earned 6 EXP. X5. EXP 143-300. As Asher watched the spiders change course abruptly, heading back to protect their threatened mother, he couldn't help but let out a wry chuckle. Huh? Ha! Huh. I was planning on running around until my guardian's provoked cooldown was finished, but I guess there's no need for that now. With the spiders retreating to shield their broodmother, the immediate threat had temporarily subsided, affording Asher some respite. Shriek! A deafening screech reverberated through the cave, signifying the successful hit from Asher's guardian's shield charge on the massive broodmother. Trapped by her own size and the confined space of the cave, she had no means of evading the inevitable attack. The returning spiders, driven by a desperate need to protect their mother, hurried back to her side. Seizing this opportunity, Asher ordered his guardian to assault the immobile broodmother relentlessly, aiming to stack as much damage as possible. Inevitably, the spiders reached their mother's defense, swarming the guardian. Just as before, Asher allowed the spiders to assail his guardian, knowing it couldn't continue indefinitely. He provided two more rounds of healing to bolster his guardian's resilience, and when the cooldown on his shield charge was finally over, he issued the command once more. The guardian plowed its way through the clustered spiders, decimating most of them in the process. You have killed a dustbiter arachnid. You have earned 6 EXP. X14. EXP 227-300. Things are actually working out well for me. There's only a few dozen spiders left. Things should end soon, Asher remarked, his gaze fixed on the current state of the battle. However, his optimism was short-lived. What? What is it doing? To his shock, the broodmother began cannibalizing her own offspring, consuming their flesh and swallowing even those that had fallen in battle and were near her. The gruesome turn of events added a chilling and unpredictable dimension to the already intense battle. Something unexpected was unfolding, a development that threatened to dramatically alter the course of the battle. Broodmother used sacrificial birth. Sacrificial birth? Objective updated. Trials objective, defeat the broodmother widow blood, the bloodborne. Suddenly, the broodmother let out a chilling shriek, an ear-piercing scream that echoed with agony. Her abdomen throbbed violently, visible bulges surfacing and receding like unborn creatures pounding from within, reminiscent of restless entities pressing against the confines of their mother's womb. The crescendo of these convulsions built to an unbearable tension, and then the grotesque revelation, eight long, sharp spider legs pierced through the birdmother's distended abdomen, ripping and tearing their way out, as if desperate to escape their fleshy prison. From this macabre birth emerged a new monster, born of brutality, horror, and sacrifice. Chapter 15 Widow Blood, The Bloodborn In the Tower of Awakening, monsters are classified into four distinct tiers, common, elite, boss, and champion. Common-ranked monsters are the most frequently encountered adversaries. Typically weaker, they serve primarily as a means for challengers to accrue experience points. They often swarm in groups and possess less health and damage potential compared to their higher-ranked counterparts. Elites stand a cut above the common foes. While rarer, they showcase greater strength and can be found guarding specific landmarks, treasures, or acting as formidable mini-bosses. Unique abilities and distinct attack patterns are hallmarks of these creatures. They may stand alone or lead a group of common monsters in their pursuits. Boss-ranked monsters represent the ultimate challenge within a specific zone or area. 
Often, they have their own designated combat arena and may even sport unique designs, setting them apart in both appearance and size. Their intricate attack sequences often demand specialized strategies to overcome. Conquering these behemoths yields substantial rewards, including rare loot and a bounty of experience points. Lastly, there's the Champion Monster. This exceptional, ultra-rare breed emerges only under unique conditions, like the completion of an intricate summoning ritual or the fulfillment of specific prerequisites. Their power is unparalleled, occasionally overshadowing even the boss-ranked monsters in terms of challenge. Champions bring with them exclusive abilities and mechanics, and might even necessitate challengers to surpass their own limits to defeat them. Often linked to special events, secrets, or achievements, vanquishing a champion could bestow a prestigious title upon the victor. The Widow Blood, also known as the Bloodborne, is a prime example of a champion monster. Its existence defies the natural order. Its origin stems from the unique ability of the Broodmother called Sacrificial Birth. This harrowing skill allows the Broodmother to sacrifice her unborn spiderlings and her very life essence as a catalyst to summon this terrifying being. The result? A monster forged from and sustained by blood. This adversary was far from any typical spider. It was an embodiment of terror. Despite its modestly sized body, a sleek, jet-black exoskeleton enveloped it, gleaming with an unsettling crimson hue. Instead of the customary eight, this creature boasted ten sharp appendages, each echoing the lethal curve of a blood-soaked blade. Twin eyes, vast and blood-red, bore into the onlookers with a piercing intensity. From them emanated a mournful sorrow, as though they were the very conduits for the birdmother's sacrificial grief. Protruding menacingly were two formidable fangs, their dark, obsidian hue stained and wet, with saliva pooling ominously below. Its abdomen was a mesmerizing sight, pulsating rhythmically, veins with a red luminescence, a macabre dance of circulating blood was faintly visible. The widow blood reared, its eyes focused intently on Asher. With a sudden, swift motion, it unleashed a barrage of blood-red webs. The web spread out, seeking to ensnare both Asher and his guardian. With unwavering loyalty, the guardian swiftly positioned himself as a shield between Asher and the oncoming web, his own protective barrier at the ready. As the crimson web struck him, Asher had initially believed it was merely a binding maneuver. However, to his alarm, he watched the guardian's vitality begin to wane. No way! For Asher, this marked his first encounter with an adversary wielding offensive ability. The Crimson Web wasn't merely entangling, it siphoned the life force of those it ensnared. Is this some sort of damage overtime spell? Quickly realizing the sinister nature of the web, Asher managed to dispel it by tearing apart, halting the continuous drain on the Guardian's vitality. Relief washed over him, but it was short-lived. The widow blood unleashed a deafening shriek, a sound so chilling it seemed to freeze the very air around them. In a flurry of rage, it thrashed about, its massive limbs aiming to land devastating blows on both Asher and his guardian. The battle was far from over. Asher narrowly evaded a swipe from one of the spider's glistening appendages, ducking and rolling to one side. The guardian, struggling to regain his strength, was less fortunate. One of the Widow Blood's sharp limbs knocked the Guardian's protective stance, sending him skidding back several meters. But the Widow Blood's primary focus remained on Asher. Its twin eyes, now glowing more intensely, fixed their gaze on him. Suddenly, from its abdomen, the spider began to form condensed orbs of blood. With a flick of its limbs, the orb sped towards Asher in rapid succession. Each blood orb was deadly accurate, and their speed left almost no room for Asher to react. As they came in contact with the ground or nearby structures, they exploded in a splash of sanguine web essences, leaving behind patches of blood and webs that would cling and seep vitality from whatever touched them. Asher felt trapped. The continuous onslaught of the blood orbs combined with the ever-growing pools of blood made it nearly impossible to find safe footing. With no offensive capabilities, Asher felt helpless. His only skill was healing, which he quickly used to mend the Guardian's wounds, but that did little to change the tide of the battle. Recognizing Asher's vulnerability, the Guardian roared, activating his provoke skill. 
the widow blood's attention was instantly diverted to the guardian. Taking advantage of this, the guardian hurled his shield with the shield throw skill. The shield struck the spider's abdomen, causing it to recoil slightly but, given its champion status, it dealt minimal damage. However, it bought Asher a precious moment to reposition. The Guardian then sprinted towards the Widow Blood the moment his shield returned, using shield charge, launching himself at the spider. The force of the impact was tremendous, sending the Widow Blood skidding back and momentarily disrupting its blood orb assault. The 100% knockback effect of the shield charge had done its work. But the Guardian's barrage had drained his mana, meaning it could no longer make use of any skills. Asher felt the weight of the situation bearing down on him. The Guardian, having exhausted his mana, was vulnerable to the Widowblood's next wave of assault. Asher's own healing capabilities were limited, especially given the monster's damage over time attacks. We've got to break from its damn gaze, Asher gritted to himself, sweat dripping from his brow. A bit of cover, a moment's respite, and we can claw back some of that spent mana. A desperate idea flashed in his mind. The Birdmother's Carcass. That's our bloody shield. It could be our one shot at stealing a few breaths. Guardian, follow me. They lunged with grim determination toward the massive, lifeless husk of the Broodmother. The monstrous being, once the harbinger of death and now a fallen titan, paradoxically offered them a fleeting refuge. From behind the Broodmother, Asher could hear the chilling hisses of the widow blood, its frustration evident as its prey had once again evaded its grasp. The rhythmic sound of its appendages tapping against the stone floor reverberated through the cave. Each time it tries to flank us, we'll circle around the Broodmother, Asher whispered, formulating a rudimentary plan. We need to play a game of cat and mouse, keep it guessing, and by ourselves some time. Once you have enough mana, we can lure it into a more vulnerable position and use combo skills against it. But until then, we must stay out of its reach. And so began their strategic dance of evasion. Each time the widow blood tried to circle the birdmother's carcass to confront them, Asher and the guardian moved in the opposite direction, always keeping the massive body between them and the spider. It was a test of patience and nerve, with the predatory widow blood constantly seeking an angle of attack. With every passing minute, the Guardian's mana levels rose steadily. The tension in the air was palpable, each side waiting for an opening, an opportunity. The widow blood, frustrated by the continuous game of hide and seek, finally decided it had had enough. With a furious hiss, its abdomen twitched and thick strands of crimson webbing shot out, latching onto the birdmother's massive carcass. In an impressive display of strength, the widow blood began retracting its web, slowly hoisting the birdmother's body off the floor. The massive form of the broodmother started to rise, the widow blood intending to pin it to the ceiling and remove the obstacle once and for all. Asher and the guardian watched in horrified awe, momentarily paralyzed by the sheer might of the creature. As the birdmother's body was lifted higher, they became fully exposed, vulnerable to the widow blood's impending onslaught. But during their game of evasion, time had been on their side. The Guardian's mana had recovered, and he was ready to unleash his full potential. Asher, sensing the change in the Guardian's demeanor, took a deep breath, his fingers tingling with anticipation. With the brood mother suspended, the widow blood locked its blood red gaze onto its prey, preparing to launch a lethal barrage of blood orbs. But the guardian was faster. Shield charge. Asher roared, using his regained mana to barrel toward the widow blood with immense force. The impact sent the widow blood sprawling, its plan of attack disrupted. The guardian didn't stop there. He quickly activated his provoke skill, ensuring the widow blood's focus remained solely on him. This gave Asher the opportunity to circle around, seeking a position of advantage while continuously healing any damage the guardian took. The guardian, seizing the momentary upper hand, launched his shield throw skill. The shield, glowing with a fierce energy, struck the widow blood squarely, causing it to recoil further. The 100% knockback effect combined with the Guardian's other skills had put the Widow Blood on the defensive. The tables had turned. What had started as a desperate fight for survival had shifted into a coordinated offensive. 
With the Guardian's skills at full strength and Asher's support, they began pressing their advantage, forcing the Widowblood into a corner. Every time a skill's cooldown ended, he wasted no time reactivating it, relentlessly pressing their advantage. The Widowblood, despite its champion status, was now on the defensive. Its once terrifying blood orbs, which had seemed almost unstoppable earlier, now struggled to find their mark. The Guardian's shield was everywhere, deflecting and parrying, turning the spider's own strength against it. Shield charge. With those words, the Guardian lunged forward, the impact sending shockwaves across the chamber. The Widow Blood, still reeling from the impact, barely had time to recover before another shield throw came its way, further reducing its vitality. But even in its weakened state, the Widow Blood was not to be underestimated. It was, after all, a champion monster. Desperate to regain the upper hand, the Widow Blood unleashed a frenzied flurry of slashes, web throws, and blood orb barges. However, the continual onslaught by the Guardian and the continuous healing from Asher was wearing the Widow Blood down. Its once sleek exoskeleton now bore the scars of their fierce exchange. The glowing red of its eyes began to dim, and its movements became noticeably slower, the toll of the battle evident. Knowing the widow blood was nearing its limit, seizing the moment, the guardian followed up with a decisive shield charge the impact of which dealt the final blow, reducing the widow blood's health to zero. The once fearsome creature, the bloodborne, lay defeated. The chamber echoed with the silence of their hard fought victory. W. We did it. Huh? Before him rested the fallen form of the widow blood, a testament to his fierce battle. Hovering above it was the crystallized essence of the Bloodborne, shimmering in anticipation, awaiting its rightful claimant. Chapter 16 Readying for the Return Upon vanquishing the Widow Blood, his mission was fulfilled. Consecutive notifications heralded his success, unveiling the much anticipated rewards. You have killed the Window Blood, the Bloodborne. You have earned 300 EXP. EXP 527-300 Congratulations for reaching LV.4. You have acquired five attribute points. You have completed this trial of awakening fifth trial. You have gone past the required objective. Calculating reward. You have earned 500 points for clearing the fifth trial. You have earned an additional 200 points for killing in champion mob. He just started getting notifications and had already gone up a full level. Plus, he was halfway to another level. He'd earned 700 points all at once. This meant he could buy two or three magic items. What really caught his attention was the mission reward. When he was sent to the area, he didn't have time to check out the reward for finishing the mission. So, he was hoping for a big boost to his power. For clearing the fifth floor of the trial, you will be rewarded with a random equipment. You have gone past the required objective. Reward will be upgraded, matching your achievement. For clearing the fifth floor of the trial, you've unlocked a title that reflects your achievement. A title? This was Asher's first encounter with titles. On reflection, he remembered seeing a title section within his character window, but he hadn't paid it much attention. He wasn't sure about the benefits of a title, but given that it was a reward for surpassing an objective, he reckoned it was valuable. Congratulations. You have earned the Arachnid Slayer, Magic, title. Attribute Increase It didn't just boost my attributes, it gave me the ones I needed the most Asher read the title and was amazed by what it offered. It gave him 8 total attribute points, 4 in intelligence and 4 in vitality. This was almost like getting 2 level ups just from a title. At his current level, this reward was way better than any magic items he had received so far. Plus, this boost was permanent. So, the more titles he got, the stronger he would become for good. It wasn't like equipment, where he had to keep changing things out to get better. Having finished the fifth trial, you will be transported to the lobby. As the surroundings blurred around him, Asher felt a momentary weightlessness. When his vision cleared, he was standing in the center of the familiar lobby room. He took a moment to steady himself, his chest rising and falling with deep breaths. The trials had been grueling, testing not only his physical prowess, but his mental tenacity. 
yet the rush of accomplishment was evident in his stance. Before diving into preparations, Asher decided to check the community page. Wondering if there were any news about the way to return back to Earth. Since I haven't received any notification about returning to Earth, I should see what the community is saying. Asher quickly scanned the live chat. Predictably, many were voicing their annoyance over the unclear process of returning to Earth. While they were aware that a return was possible after conquering the fifth floor, the actual procedure remained a mystery. Having exhausted their question vouchers, they couldn't seek clarity. Asher considered using his own remaining voucher to get answers. However, just as he was about to, a new message popped up, providing the long-awaited details. Cucumber kinda served guys. I found out how to return to Earth. If you open the store page right now, you'll see that a new item had been added, shown in the very first page, called Return Stone. Zigzag Zephyr, are you serious? Jellybean, it can't be that simple, can it? Asher quickly navigated to the store page, and sure enough, right at the top, a shimmering white stone was displayed. The return stone it was called, and its description read, Seven days? So if we don't return to the tower within that week, does that mean we can't go back at all, limiting our progress? This information was crucial. Asher was in the dark about the current state of Earth. He wondered, did he still have access to the system there? Were monsters now roaming Earth, and if so, did they drop loot? Could he obtain quests? Everything he knew was tied to the tower, but he was unsure if the same rules applied on Earth. The tower, despite its risks, had offered him significant advantages. However, he needed to learn more about Earth's situation before drawing any conclusions. Would you like to use Return Stone? Yes slash no. Before that, I need to use this. Asher held up the shimmering yellow gemstone, the crystallized heart of the Widow Blood Spider, a rarity among rarities. Trading this at the shop would guarantee him a rare skill from the Widowblood's pool of abilities. He promptly traded the gemstone, and to his surprise, obtained a skill he hadn't anticipated. He'd always been curious about how the Widowblood conjured its skills, especially when its description indicated it possessed zero mana. The new skill shed light on that very mystery. Asher stared at the skill's description in concern. The Blood Mage passive skill was undeniably powerful, offering a workaround in situations where his mana pool was depleted. It opened up a vast array of tactical options, allowing him to maintain a relentless assault even when traditionally he'd be rendered powerless. Yet, the double-edged nature of the skill was evident. The prospect of tapping into his health as a resource was enticing. The conversion of Mana Regan mods to boost Health Regan further meant he could maintain his combat capabilities longer without relying on external mana sources. This could be a game changer in prolonged battles. However, the potential drawbacks were clear. Removing mana points entirely would mean he'd rely solely on his health, particularly noting the increased cost for the healing ability. This adjustment likely served as a measure to prevent individuals from exploiting healing skills to continuously replenish health and endlessly unleash other skills. Asher recognized its potential immediately. In battles of attrition or encounters where mana regeneration was hampered, Blood Mage could be his trump card. It provided flexibility, ensuring he was never truly without options. Moreover, if paired with abilities or items that restored or buffered health quickly, he could potentially create devastating combos, leveraging the skill's unique mechanic. However, a unique strategy began to form in Asher's mind. This skill seemed ideal for his guardian. Together, they could forge a powerful combination. The guardian would relentlessly use his skills, drawing from his health, while Asher would counteract the depletion with his healing ability. Currently, Asher's limited mana reserves made this strategy less feasible, and the healing he could provide was modest. But as he leveled up and the skill improved, the potential for a dynamic synergy became clear. Additionally, this skill simplified his approach to attribute points. It strongly incentivized him to concentrate solely on enhancing his vitality, sidelining other attributes. Deciding on his course of action, Asher imparted the passive skill to his guardian, adding a fresh capability to his repertoire. 
your anime guardian has learned blood mage, rare. Now, I'll hold on to my points until I return. I suppose it's time to head home. Would you like to use return stone? Yes slash no. Yes. Chapter 17 Devastated World much like his previous unsettling transportation to the trial's ground, Asher's world suddenly dissolved into a disorienting blur. A dizzying sensation gripped him as reality shifted. When the tumultuous chaos in his mind began to settle, Asher's eyes widened in astonishment at the shocking transformation of his once familiar room. Instead of returning to the sanctuary of his own closed-off space, he found himself in a nightmarish sight, with a gaping hole in the wall exposing the relentless outside world. The room lay in ruins, strewn with debris and wreckage, as if it had been ravaged by some unseen force. Staring in disbelief, Asher ventured closer to the jagged breach in the wall, only to be met with a heart-pounding revelation. The devastation that unfolded beyond was not limited to his own home. The entire cityscape had been reduced to a wasteland of crumbling buildings and shattered streets. The magnitude of the catastrophe struck him like a thunderbolt. Something cataclysmic had transpired on Earth, and it was far from a triviality to dismiss. Let's proceed and survey the outside, Asher commanded, his guardian obediently shadowing his every move as they ventured beyond the confines of the refuge. The journey through the desolate streets proved difficult, with scattered debris from decimated buildings obstructing their path. Asher's keen eyes discerned a haunting sight, a trail of dried bloodstains, remnants of the wounded and perhaps even the deceased, though strangely, there were no lifeless bodies to be found, only the grim testimony of their existence. What could have transpired here? Asher wondered aloud, his voice tinged with a mixture of dread and curiosity. Continuing to tread cautiously, he soon found himself in a place that felt oddly familiar, the last location he had visited before being transported to the Tower of Awakening, the 24-7 gas station. Unlike the surrounding structures that lay in ruins, the gas station had endured the cataclysm to some extent. Though the gas pumps were destroyed, and the building itself bore scars of the devastation, it still stood resolute. Asher's mind wondered of potential survivors that might have taken refuge inside, prompting him to take a closer look. As Asher cautiously stepped into the gas station, the atmosphere inside was a stark contrast to the desolation that reigned outside. The dim, flickering fluorescent lights overhead cast an eerie glow across the scene. The shelves, now partially barren, held remnants of what had once been a well-stocked. Empty snack bags lay scattered on the floor, their contents long since pilfered by desperate hands. The coolers that had once hummed with the promise of refreshing drinks now stood silent, their glass doors cracked and shattered. A few shattered bottles and cans lay near them. Asher's footsteps echoed through the silence as he ventured deeper into the store, his eyes scanning for any sign of life. The air carried a faint odor of gasoline and burnt debris. As he continued to explore, his heart raced with uncertainty. Doesn't seem like there's anyone here. Crack. Huh? Asher's senses heightened as a sharp, distinctive sound of shattered glass underfoot pierced the eerie silence, jolting him into a state of alertness. Is anyone here? He called out, his voice tinged with a hope. The response was nothing but a heavy, oppressive silence that seemed to swallow his words. Undeterred, Asher made a quick decision. He commanded his guardian to investigate the source of the noise while he moved cautiously toward the location, ready to confront whatever or whoever might be hiding there. Hello? Asher's voice echoed once more, reverberating through the desolate gas station as he inched closer to uncover the enigmatic sound. Suddenly, an unexpected and piercing scream pierced the air, a sound that sent shook him. The scream was not that of a beast, but rather, it was a cry that seemed to emanate from a woman. Without hesitation, Asher rushed towards the source of the disturbance. As he reached his guardian, Asher he was greeted by a surprising sight. Hidden behind the desk, cowering in the shadows, was a young woman, likely a student. Her eyes, wide with fear, met Asher's as they locked onto each other, and in that tense moment, time seemed to stand still. This chance encounter amidst the wreckage and chaos of the world felt like something more than mere coincidence. 
Asher's memory sparked recognition. She was the same cashier who had silently accepted his payment during one of his prior visits to the gas station. It was as if fate had granted him an opportunity to repay the favor she had once bestowed upon him. With measured steps, Asher approached the frightened young woman and knelt down, placing himself at her eye level. His voice was gentle, laced with genuine concern as he asked, Are you okay? With trembling hesitation, she slowly nodded, though the remnants of fear still clung to her face like a shadow. Do you know what happened here? Asher inquired, his voice laced with urgency. The young woman, still gripped by confusion and fear, stammered in response, in no. I. I don't know. How long have you been hiding here? Asher pressed for answers, his concern deepening. Only one day, she replied, her voice quivering with uncertainty. One day? Did this whole situation unfold in just one day? Asher couldn't conceal his astonishment. I, I don't know. I've only returned a day ago, she muttered, her eyes darting around the desolation as if searching for answers that remained elusive. Returned? Have you also been transported to the Tower of Awakening? The young woman nodded in confirmation, her voice filled with dread as she revealed, MHM. When I failed the second trial, I was transported back here. When I arrived, the city was destroyed by M monsters. The weight of the revelation hung heavily in the air, and Asher's mind raced to connect the dots. It became increasingly apparent that this catastrophic situation had unfolded almost simultaneously with his entry into the Tower of Awakening. In the real world, he had spent just a little over two days inside the tower, which meant that this cataclysm had occurred two days ago. His gaze shifted back to the young woman, and a deep sense of concern washed over him. She had failed the second trial, and Asher couldn't help but grasp the grim reality that had befallen her. The second trial had likely led her to face these vile goblins, and he could only imagine the psychological trauma she must have endured. The sensation of being impaled by arrows, slashed by cruel blades, and the leering eyes of vile goblins as they orchestrated her virtual massacre, such an experience could leave deep emotional scars. Thankfully, Asher understood that failing trials before reaching the fifth floor of the tower wouldn't result in real-world death. It was more like an advanced VR simulation, with the participants returning to Earth without any physical harm. Still, he couldn't help but empathize with the torment she must have endured during her trial and the haunting memories that would linger long after. Have you tried venturing outside? Asher asked, concern etching his features. She shook her head, her voice trembling with fear. I can't. Monsters are all around. I'll die if I go out there. Asher considered her situation, his mind racing for a solution. Since you've completed the first trial, you must have received your class and skill. Can't you use your acquired skill to fend them off? Once again, she shook her head, her expression filled with helplessness. I can't. My class isn't used for combat. A support class? Asher inquired, trying to understand the nature of her abilities. She shook her head once more, her voice barely above a whisper. No, a production class. I took the Enchantress class. The mention of the Enchantress class left Asher intrigued and somewhat puzzled. It was the first time he had heard of such a class, and he couldn't immediately discern its utility. However, given her description of it as a production class, he surmised that it likely involved the enhancement or enchantment of items in some way. The mysteries of the Tower of Awakening and its trials seemed to run deeper than he had initially imagined, and he realized that he had much more to learn about this enigmatic place. What's your name? Asher inquired gently. I'm Sarah, she replied, her voice soft and apprehensive. Pleasure to meet you, Sarah. My name is Asher, he offered, attempting to bring a sense of comfort and trust to their conversation. MHM Sarah murmured, still overwhelmed by the circumstances. How about you come with me? There's most likely a settlement somewhere. Let's go find it together, yes. Don't worry, I'll make sure to protect you, Asher reassured her, his voice filled with determination as he thumped his chest in a display of unwavering confidence. Sarah looked up at Asher, 
her eyes reflecting a glimmer of hope amid the desolation. Slowly, a hesitant smile touched her lips as she nodded in agreement, recognizing that this unexpected alliance might be her best chance of survival in this perilous new world. Asher extended his hand as a gesture of camaraderie, and Sarah, with a newfound sense of trust, took his hand and rose from her seated position. She dusted off her clothes, the act symbolizing her readiness to face the unknown alongside Asher. As she tidied herself up, Asher's curiosity got the better of him. He wondered if his inspection skill, which had proven useful in examining creatures within the Tower of Awakening, would work on humans as well. Intrigued, he decided to test it. Focusing his thoughts, he attempted to use his inspection skill on Sarah, hoping to gain some insight into her abilities or condition. To his disappointment, a window did materialize, but only leaving him with more questions than answers. It seemed that the rules governing the Tower of Awakening and its inhabitants were complex and elusive, concealing many secrets that would require further exploration. All right, then. Let's head out, Asher said with determination. With a resolute nod, she responded with a simple M.M. As they left the gas station behind. Chapter 18 Realities Wait as Asher and his newfound companion stepped out of the gas station, she was filled with curiosity about the floating shield and body armor, the very same that had previously ensnared her. Excuse me, sir, what is that? Hmm? Oh, that's the skill I acquired from the first trial. Don't worry, it won't harm you. The animate guardian skill manifested as a spectral entity, invisible to all except its summoner. To others, it appeared as floating pieces of equipment. Currently, since the Guardian possessed only a chest plate and a shield, that was all others could see. But as the Guardian acquired more equipment over time, its appearance would evolve, making it seem more like a fully armored individual rather than a disembodied spirit. I'll have to unsummon it in public settings. For now, I'll keep it active until we're in a safer place. Asher mused. He was wary about revealing his abilities too soon, unsure of how people might react in the world's current tumultuous state. But sir, where exactly are we headed? That is an excellent question. Asher realized that, despite being in the know, he was uncertain about their next move. The world had clearly been overrun by monsters. Yet, he pondered, had the government reacted promptly? Had they established safe zones for survivors? Were there other challengers like him who had returned and were now banding together to confront these looming threats? Choosing to return wasn't mandatory, implying that there were probably others who opted to stay and continue with the trials. For now, let's make our way to the nearest police station. If I recall correctly, it's about a half-hour walk from here. That sounds like a good plan, mister. The police station should be a safe. They'll surely protect us. I certainly hope so. As they navigated the ruins of their city, a sense of unease gnawed at Asher. They had been walking for about ten minutes, yet there was no sign of any other humans or even monsters. Something was off, and he needed to figure it out quickly before it came back to haunt him. Mister! Look over there! What? Oh no, the way is blocked. They had reached the midway point of their journey and to get to the police station, they needed to cross a bridge. But it had been shattered, leaving behind a gaping chasm that plummeted to the highway below. How are we supposed to make it there now? Hmm. If my memory serves me right, there's a subway station nearby. The tunnel should lead us to the other side. It might take us a bit longer to get there, but at this moment, it's our only viable route. With no other options available, Asher and Sarah redirected their path towards the subway station. Like before, they were met with eerie silence, encountering neither monsters nor humans. This unsettling quiet gnawed at Asher, he felt in his bones that something wasn't right. And soon, he discovered why. Thud thud. Suddenly, an overwhelming sensation gripped both Asher and Sarah. Their hearts raced as if trying to burst free from their chests, mimicking the rapid drumming of panic. Gasping for air, they crumpled to the ground, their lungs struggling to keep pace with their racing hearts. Sweat drenched them, and the color drained from their faces, leaving them pale and ghostly. 
M. Mr. W. Why is this happening? Their eyes darted around uncontrollably, pupils dilated with terror. An oppressive sense of dread weighed them down, sapping their strength. Every fiber of their being screamed danger, urging them to find shelter, warning them that the end was near. A suffocating aura engulfs you. You've been afflicted with the status ailment, extreme fear. A suffocating aura engulfs you. You've been afflicted with the status ailment, oppression. A suffocating aura engulfs you. You've been afflicted with the status ailment, degrading mind. You are suffering from obsessive mental trauma, resulting in a loss of 5% of your maximum health every second. The abrupt and inexplicable event left Asher reeling. He felt trapped, suffocated, and on the brink of demise, all without knowing the cause or the entity responsible for this harrowing state. But as a shadow crept over him, hinting at the source, he mustered all his strength to tilt his head upward. The sight that met his eyes was straight out of legends and tales, something many fantasized about. Hovering above them was the epitome of mythical power and majesty, a dragon. Known in stories as the King of Beasts, the Sovereign of Mana, and the ultimate challenge for many gamers. Its mere presence was enough to induce the crippling state Asher and Sarah found themselves in. Yet, the dragon seemed oblivious to them, merely passing by without a second glance. As it continued on its path, the debilitating effects it had unwittingly imposed on them began to fade. The entire ordeal had lasted less than ten seconds, but the mere proximity to such a creature had nearly killed them. Cough, cough. Unable to withstand the brunt of the psychological trauma, Sarah began to cough up blood. Given her probable initial health points, around the same as Asher when he began his journey, this reaction wasn't unexpected. Since she hadn't progressed in the Tower of Awakening, she was likely still at level 1, without any skills or abilities to mitigate the damage she'd endured. Without a moment's hesitation, Asher rushed to her side and activated his soulful restoration skill, mending her wounds and rejuvenating her vitality. Thank you. Sarah whispered, her voice quivering from the residual fear. She wiped away tears, each one a testament to the terror she had just experienced. Asher, with his arms securely around Sarah, guided her into an empty nearby building, providing them some semblance of shelter as they tried to recover from the overwhelming encounter. And mister, is this the end of the world? How can we ever stand against such a creature? I'm... I'm terrified, Sarah's voice trembled, her eyes searching Asher's for any hint of reassurance. Asher found himself at a loss for words. It was undeniable that the Earth faced a danger like never before. To call it the apocalypse might not even be an exaggeration. The appearance of such a formidable creature at such an early stage was perplexing. He had, in some ways, been treating his experiences in the Tower of Awakening like a game. The thrill of acquiring new powers, skills, and items, combined with the game-like system window, had made it easy to forget the grim reality. But now, the gravity of their situation was unavoidable. That creature's mere presence was a testament to the scale of the threat they faced. The absence of other monsters in the vicinity now made sense to Asher. They probably steered clear to avoid incurring the wrath of the dominant force in the region, the dragon. Its mere presence had likely established an unspoken territory, one that other creatures instinctively respected and feared. Could such a beast even be defeated? Even at maximum level, Asher doubted his ability to confront it. Was it a raid boss? How powerful would one need to be to challenge it? Was this the monster responsible for the city's destruction? Were there more like it? Or even worse, were there beings far more powerful than this dragon? A flood of questions and concerns surged through Asher's mind, but for now, he needed to stay strong, both for Sarah and for the uncertain journey ahead. Asher took a deep breath, steadying himself. He looked into Sarah's frightened eyes and said with a determined voice, I don't have all the answers, Sarah. But right now, our best option is to keep moving. We'll find clarity along the way. Mm -hmm. Chapter 19 New Bonds Forged How are you holding up, Sarah? Asher asked. Can you go on? She nodded, her face taut with underlying worry. Mm -hmm. I think so. 
Asher hesitated for a moment, taking in her expression. All right. Let's go. Navigating through the ruins of the city, Asher and Sarah found their path more challenging than anticipated. Though devoid of monsters, the streets were littered with rubble and debris, forcing them to find alternate routes. What should have been a brief journey stretched into the evening. The urgency of the encroaching night spurred them on, and they reached the subway station just as the last light of the day began to fade. The subway, once boasting immaculate tiles, now bore the scars of destruction. Asher and Sarah treaded carefully, the sporadic flicker of fluorescent lights casting an unsettling glow over their path. Dust from crumbling tiles blanketed the platform, growing thicker as they ventured deeper into the subway. Every so often, the scuttle of a rat would startle Sarah, its quick movements barely visible in the dim light. Walls, marred by the damage, still displayed remnants of advertisements, their colors distorted and interrupted by deep cracks. A profound silence enveloped the subway, its weight almost tangible. As they entered, a stairway invited them to descend, leading to the train platform and onward to the tunnels that connected to the next station, closest to the police station. Reaching the base of the stairs, they were met with a vast open space designed for trains to momentarily halt and offload or take on passengers. With careful precision, Asher dropped down onto the train tracks from the platform, assisting Sarah as she followed suit. As they treaded the dark tunnel, punctuated by intermittent lighting, an unexpected glow caught their attention. Turning a corner to the right, they saw the orange glow of a fire. It wasn't emanating from the ceiling lights, but from what seemed to be a makeshift bonfire. Realizing this, Asher motioned for Sarah to stay silent. Suspecting others might be nearby and uncertain of their intentions, they approached the tunnel's bend cautiously. Peeking around the corner, Asher was met with an unexpected scene. The space was occupied by numerous people, settled in makeshift tents and gathered around bonfires made from station debris. What struck Asher most was the makeup of the group. Without exception, they were either elderly, young children, or individuals with some sort of disabilities. Hiya! Suddenly, just as Asher was taking in the camp's details, a sharp sound from behind startled him. Whirling around, he was met with a chilling sight. Sarah, held at gunpoint, her captor's arm locked around her neck. The young man, with short ginger hair and appearing to be in his late twenties like Asher, wore an unexpected uniform, that of a police officer. Don't move, or things won't end well, the young man warned, his eyes unwaveringly fixed on Asher. Let's calm down. We're not here to cause any trouble, Asher responded evenly. Back up, the man ordered, pushing Sarah forward and forcing Asher into the camp's open view. Huh? Grandma? Look over there, a child exclaimed upon spotting Asher emerging into the clearing. Stay behind me, the elderly woman instructed, urging the children behind her, eyes warily fixed on the unfamiliar figure. But as a second person came into view, her tension melted away. It's Liam. He's back, she exclaimed with relief. Liam is back? The camp stirred at the proclamation, waves of relief and joy evident in their reactions at the sight of the familiar face. But who are they? Are they part of their group? Someone in the crowd questioned, eyes narrowing at Asher and Sarah. Asher caught snippets of their whispers, puzzled by the mention of their group. It became evident that things were more complex than he'd initially thought. Monsters might not be the only threats in this world, a realization underscored by Liam's aggressive approach. Did they send you? I thought we finally managed to shake them off, but you lot are stubborn, aren't you? Liam growled, pressing the gun harder against Sarah's temple. Hey! Take it easy. Asher raised his hands defensively. I don't know what group you're talking about. We're not with anyone. We're just trying to reach the police station, hoping for some refuge and answers. Liam studied Asher with skeptical eyes, clearly unnerved by their sudden arrival. Mister, I'm scared. Sarah's voice trembled, tears forming in her eyes as she looked pleadingly at Asher. The sight of the terrified teenagers seemed to shake something within Liam. He hesitated, then slowly released his hold on her. 
The guilt was evident on his face. He was a law enforcer, yet here he was, threatening an innocent young girl and her protector. Mr. Sarah ran towards Asher, wrapping her arms around him tightly, seeking solace in his embrace. Liam exhaled deeply, rubbing his temples. I'm sorry about all that. It's nothing personal. I just had to be sure you weren't with them. It's understandable to be cautious in these uncertain times, Asher said, gently comforting Sarah. But if you don't mind my asking, who exactly are you referring to? Liam sighed, running a hand through his ginger hair. We've been on the run from a group that's taken advantage of the chaos. They're not the monsters you might expect, but humans, ones that have banded together and have been, well, let's just say they're not looking out for the common good. Asher nodded slowly, processing the information. So, it's not just the monsters we need to be wary of. It's people too. Liam's eyes darkened, after the Tower of Awakening sudden occurrence, some people gained abilities, powers if you will. Instead of using them to help or to find a way out of this mess, they've been exploiting those gifts for their own gain, for control and dominance. Asher's face tightened, realizing the gravity of the situation. So, they've essentially become another form of monster, using their newfound powers for harm rather than good. Yes, fortunately, most of them didn't advance past the easier levels of the Tower of Awakening, so their powers are somewhat limited. But their leader is a different story. Like me, he's made it through the normal difficulty mode and can still access the trials. Instead of working to better the situation, he's been rallying criminals and other nefarious types, consolidating power and influence on Earth. Why haven't you confronted them? It hasn't been that long since all this began, and they probably don't outnumber you by much. Your group seems sizable, Asher pointed out. Liam sighed, while our numbers may seem significant, I'm the only one in this group who has awakened any power from the tower. As you can probably tell, our members are primarily the elderly, children, or those with physical or mental challenges. My theory is that the Tower of Awakening selectively chooses individuals based on physical capability and a specific age range. As a police officer, my primary duty right now is to safeguard these vulnerable individuals, finding them a secure place from both the numerous threats outside. Liam asserted, Asher found himself increasingly admiring Liam. The man seemed to be the embodiment of integrity, and Asher felt fortunate their paths had crossed. Why are you still here in the subway? Being a police officer, you'd know the route to the police station through the tunnel, Asher inquired. Liam hesitated briefly before replying, that was my initial plan. But we encountered an unexpected obstacle that halted our progress. Obstacle? Liam nodded gravely, a few meters ahead, there's a massive, vortex-like portal. If you're familiar with video games, its significance might not be lost on you. Asher's eyes widened in realization, A. Hey. Dungeon portal? Liam affirmed, exactly. Being the sole awakener of this group, I attempted to venture out and find others like myself who could assist in navigating and clearing that dungeon. But I hadn't come across any, until now. I presume you both are Awakeners as well? If you don't mind me being selfish, but are you willing to help me? Asher studied Liam intently. In such unpredictable times, the idea of joining forces with strangers was fraught with uncertainty. But everything about Liam, his demeanor, his evident commitment to protecting the vulnerable, suggested he was both loyal and trustworthy. Considering the challenges ahead, particularly the dungeon that lay in their path, Asher realized that there was strength in numbers. Teaming up seemed not just beneficial, but perhaps essential for their survival. Asher reached out, offering his hand both as a gesture of goodwill and a sign of newfound camaraderie. I'm Asher Gray, a necromancer. Grinning, Liam grasped Asher's hand firmly, reciprocating the introduction. Pleasure to meet you, Asher. I'm Liam Smith, a gunslinger. Chapter 20 Entering the Dungeon Would it be possible for us to share our current skill sets? Liam inquired. Knowing what abilities we have at our disposal would allow us to formulate a more effective strategy before delving into the dungeon. How about I start first? 
Sure Asher responded, seeing the logic in Liam's suggestion. Understanding each other's strengths and vulnerabilities would be paramount. Liam began explaining, as I mentioned, I chose the gunslinger class. My decision was influenced by what I had on hand at the time of the awakening. I was on duty and had my service handgun with me. Wanting to maximize my resources, I opted for a class that utilized firearms to navigate the trials. From that choice, I was fortunate to acquire a rare ranked skill called Explosive Shot. Liam continued, as the name suggests, Explosive Shot allows me to infuse my bullets with mana. When they hit a target, they detonate. As of now, I can use this ability twice before needing to replenish. Asher cannot see this information, this was provided for the reader's pleasure. Not only that, I also have the advantage of engaging enemies from a distance. Thanks to the tower's store page, I've made sure to purchase a good stock of bullets to keep me going for a while, Liam added. That's quite the versatility. You're essentially a ranged specialist with the capability for area of effect damage. That will be invaluable. Sarah, what about you? What skills do you possess? Asher inquired, turning to the young girl. Oh, I don't think I should go with you, Sarah hesitated. I should stay back with the others. My class is Enchantress. It's not really for fighting or helping directly, it's more for making things. I took the easy difficulty and got a magic ranked skill called Imbument. Basically, I can enchant common items, converting them to magic rank. However, it uses up all my mana and has a long cooldown. You can do that? Asher was stunned by Sarah's ability. Such a skill was incredibly powerful, especially in the early stages. Within just a couple of days, she could equip herself with magic-ranked items using this ability. Furthermore, the skill seemed to have a system that determined the best possible enhancement for the item being used. It was hard to believe such a powerful skill was only magic ranked. Asher couldn't help but wonder just how potent it could become if it advanced to rare or even unique rank. The potential was mind-blowing. I know, it's not that useful. Sarah replied, looking downcast. You're wrong, Sarah, Asher interjected. That skill is incredible. Don't underestimate its potential. Keep using it and leveling it up. It could turn out to be our ace in the hole. Really? So, what can you do? Sarah inquired, eyes wide with curiosity. Well, I took on the hard difficulty and chose the necromancer class, Asher began. Hard difficulty, both Sarah and Liam exclaimed in surprise. I can't even imagine how challenging that must be. I struggle enough with the normal difficulty, Liam admitted. To be honest, I'm amazed I've come this far myself, Asher confessed. As for my skill, it's named Animate Guardian. Essentially, it allows me to. Asher paused, a momentary doubt crossing his mind. Should he really reveal all the details of his power to them? After all, they had only just met. What if they made use of his skill information to cross him? Uncertainty clouded Asher's thoughts. In this perilous new world, betrayal could be an everyday occurrence. But they needed to trust each other to some extent. He chose to share some of his abilities, though not all. Summon a guardian clad in armor and bearing a shield. This guardian can throw its shield at foes, which then ricochets to hit others up to four times. It also can charge and bash into enemies, knocking them down. Plus, I have a healing skill. Think of me as the team's healer, and my guardian as our frontliner. Holding back certain details could be crucial in unpredictable circumstances. Asher chose to withhold the fact that his guardian had the capability to equip items and learn skills. It would be his ace up the sleeve, something to rely on when the chips were down. Wow, that's quite the skill set, Liam remarked, clearly impressed. Sarah looked at Asher with curiosity. That sounds really powerful, mister. Asher simply nodded, trying to mask the relief he felt for not divulging everything. He was still unsure of the world they now inhabited, and he knew that every bit of information, every advantage he held, could make the difference between life and death. 
Still, he hoped that by sharing at least part of his abilities, he could strengthen the trust between them. All right, with what we've shared, it's clearer how we should approach this, Liam began. Sarah should stay with the group. Her ability isn't suited for the dungeon, and we'd be constantly concerned for her well-being. I propose your guardian takes the lead, I'll provide ranged support right behind him, and you can stay at the back, offering healing support. Does that sound good, Asher? Asher nodded thoughtfully, considering Liam's strategy. That sounds logical. My guardian is built for taking hits, and with your ranged capabilities, we can strike a balance between offense and defense. And I can focus on keeping us both healed and supported from the back. Let's go with that plan. Liam smiled. All right then, we're set. Let's tackle that dungeon. As Asher and Liam ventured through the dimly lit tunnel, the echoing of their footsteps seemed to magnify, creating a rhythmic soundtrack to their journey. The walls of the tunnel had patches of mold and dripping water giving testimony to the neglect the subway had faced over the years. As they progressed, a soft, glowing light began to manifest in the distance. It gradually grew brighter, painting eerie shadows on the tunnel walls and drawing them forward with an inescapable allure. Soon, they found themselves standing before a massive, swirling portal. It towered above them, easily reaching the ceiling of the tunnel. The vortex itself was a stunning shade of white, and it pulsated with an otherworldly luminescence. The edges of the portal seemed to be constantly shifting and melting, with tendrils of light stretching out and then retracting back into its center. The center of the vortex held a hypnotic, swirling pattern that seemed to pull everything towards it, almost beckoning them to step in. The air around it was thick with a tangible energy, making the very atmosphere buzz with anticipation. Asher and Liam exchanged glances. The sheer scale and ethereal beauty of the portal was hard to digest. They had finally arrived at the entrance of the dungeon. Taking a deep breath, Asher stepped forward, looking back at Liam to ensure they were on the same page. Liam nodded, his expression firm. Without uttering a word, Asher's guardian moved to the front, raising its shield in a defensive stance. The trio formed a line, with the Guardian leading, followed by Liam with his gun at the ready, and Asher at the rear. They approached the portal slowly, the bright light engulfing them more and more as they got closer. The humming energy emanating from the vortex grew louder, almost deafening, as they stood at its precipice. The sensation was overwhelming, it felt like standing at the edge of a vast ocean with waves of energy crashing around them. Taking one last glance at each other, Asher and Liam braced themselves. The Guardian, with unwavering determination, stepped into the vortex, soon followed by Liam and then Asher. For a brief moment, there was a sensation of weightlessness, a swirling chaos of lights and colors, and a feeling as though they were being stretched and pulled in all directions at once. It was a disorienting experience. And then, as quickly as it had begun, the sensation ceased. The trio found themselves in a new environment, the disconcerting light and energy of the portal replaced by the stillness of their new surroundings. They had successfully entered the dungeon, ready to face whatever challenges lay ahead. You have entered abandoned prison cells. Chapter 21 The Prison's Inhabitants Asher and Liam stepped into a dim, oppressive environment. All around them, cell-like chambers held the remains of skeletons, a testament to the passage of time. The walls bore the marks of age, with deep cracks and dampness with cobwebs shrouding them. The familiar glow of the portal they had entered through shimmered behind them, offering a potential route of escape should they require it. A solid wall rose up directly behind the portal, making it clear that the only way forward was straight ahead. The air was cold and tense. The limited visibility and the suffocating atmosphere of the abandoned prison made every shadow look like a potential threat. Liam glanced around, his grip tightening on his weapon. I'm betting we'll encounter guards of some sort or perhaps the souls of past prisoners. Asher nodded, his senses on high alert. Best to assume that every corner and cell holds danger. Stay close and be ready for anything. The unease was palpable as the trio ventured deeper. They arrived at a crossroad, standing at the junction of three hallways, one ahead, and one each to the left and right. 
Given the potential dangers, sticking together was the only sensible choice. Which direction should we take? Let's go right. My parents always said, when in doubt, choose right because it's always right. Liam said with a cheeky grin. I can't argue with that logic. To the right it is. Asher replied, chuckling at Liam's words. As they ventured down the right corridor, they were met with a door at the end, fitted with a small window that teased a glimpse of what lay beyond. Look. There's a door that seems to lead outside, Liam observed. Stay sharp, there's a good chance we'll encounter our first enemy behind this door, Asher whispered, cautiously peeking through a crack as he eased the door open. Rather than finding an exit, they discovered they'd entered the prison's exercise yard. This open space was where inmates once sought physical activity, fresh air, and occasional camaraderie. Tall walls, crowned with barbed and razor-sharp wire to deter escape attempts, enclosed the area. Gravel covered most of the ground, with patches of grass poking through here and there. Scattered about were basketball hoops and a few weightlifting benches with their accompanying weights. Asher's gaze suddenly fixed on a particular spot. Wait a minute, he murmured, signaling Liam with a gesture towards the stumbling figures in the yard. Do you see that? What's caught your eye? Liam inquired, peering in the same direction. It's... The sight of the former humans was unsettling. Prison inmates, still wearing their recognizable jumpsuits, moved with a vacant stare and deteriorating skin. Along with them, the prison security guards, once symbols of authority, were now just as lifeless. Zombies! Asher exclaimed. Congratulations, inspection has leveled up. 1-2 A gleam appeared in Asher's eyes as he stared at the undead, like a child's wish coming true. As an avid fan of necromancy, these were the very beings that had brought so much allure to his craft, alongside skeletons, undead knights, and the like. There they stood, the undead he simultaneously loathed and loved. His distaste wasn't for their being but for the typical way necromancers used them. To Asher, this felt like the universe giving him a chance to demonstrate his belief in one powerful minion's superiority over a mere horde of the undead. While this situation might not be the ultimate test of his theory, it certainly was a step in the right direction. More than anything, he yearned to see these zombies crumble before his guardian. Liam, let my guardian take them on alone. Alone? There's a whole group of them. Liam exclaimed, taken aback by Asher's proposal. Trust me, he can handle it. All right, if you're sure. Asher nodded with determination. Trust me on this. It's the perfect opportunity to see what he's truly capable of. Liam took a moment, scanning the group of approaching zombies, then gave a hesitant nod. All right, but if things get dicey, I've got your back. Guardian, go to the middle of the yard and use provoke. Ordered Asher. Following Asher's command, the guardian charged into the yard. The clanking of its armor immediately drew the attention of the nearby zombie inmates and guards. They surged towards him, eager to tear the armor from its frame. A few remained oblivious to the Guardian's presence, but that changed swiftly when it unleashed its Provoke skill. Congratulations, Provoke has leveled up. 1-2 The Guardian stood in place, his shield held tightly. Unaware of the shield's property, Liam was puzzled on why the Guardian was just standing still, letting himself be hit by all those enemies. Asher, your Guardian's in trouble. Tell it to do something. Just wait a bit. Their health needs to drop a little more. How can it reduce their health if it's not even attacking THM? Liam watched in astonishment as, with each strike against the Guardian, the zombies lost a tiny chunk of their own health. The Guardian's shield, with its 5% damage reflection ability, had whittled the surrounding zombies down to less than 50 HP each. This was the perfect setup for the Guardian's next move. Now, Guardian. Use shield charge, then follow up with shield throw to take down any stragglers. Asher commanded. With a swift motion, the Guardian, adhering to Asher's command, readied itself. 
In a sudden burst of speed, it charged through the throng of zombies, slamming its sturdy shield into each of them in turn. The impact was devastating, and many of the undead creatures were immediately knocked down or thrown back by the force, falling on the ground dead. Next, without missing a beat, the Guardian expertly hurled its shield. It whirred through the air, ricocheting off the few zombies that had escaped its initial charge. Each hit further reduced the undead's already dwindling health to zero. Liam watched in astonishment, understanding dawning on him. That's quite the strategy you've got there, he commented, visibly impressed. You have killed zombified inmates and guards X-12. You have earned 120 EXP. EXP, 347-400. A swell of pride surged through Asher as he observed the scene unfold, feelings of triumph and validation overtaking him. Every fiber of his being tingled with exhilaration, imagining this very scene echoing in more challenging settings. Would it stand against adversaries like the Undead King or the Lich with its Legion of the Undead? or even against fellow necromancers who rely on overwhelming numbers? The anticipation was electric. The future holds so much promise, he thought eagerly. Liam approached Asher, his face carrying a mix of admiration and concern. Asher, that was impressive, to say the least. But we need to be strategic. I still need to earn experience points to level up. If your guardian takes out all the enemies, I won't get the chance to grow. Remember, in this new world, strength means everything. Let's work as a team, all right? Asher's excitement was momentarily tempered as he truly processed Liam's words. He blinked, taking a moment to consider the bigger picture. A look of realization dawned on his face. You're right, Liam. I got carried away. From now on, we'll collaborate better and make sure we're both progressing. I'm sorry about this. As long as we're on the same page now, all is good. Liam said, flashing a reassuring smile. Shall we move on? He suggested. Absolutely. Let's do this. Asher responded, still riding the adrenaline rush from earlier. Chapter 22 Unlocking a Stronger Inmate Having cleared the yard of its zombie inmates, Asher promptly restored his guardian to full health using his healing skill, aided by the guardian's passive life regeneration. Now, they faced a decision. They could either retrace their steps to the central room and select a different pathway, or they could proceed forward, given that another door awaited them at the far end of the yard. Considering we're already this deep in, let's just press on, suggested Asher. Liam gave a nod of approval. The heavy door at the end of the yard led to another dimly lit corridor. The passage, with its deliberate narrowness, seemed intentionally crafted to enforce a linear procession, perhaps an architectural ploy to ensure inmates made their way in a single line. Before long, they arrived at a nexus of choice, confronted not by branching hallways, but by imposing barriers. Directly ahead stood a caged gate, made from iron bars which seemed to have a locking device that hinted at a more intricate mechanism rather than mere locks and keys. To the right, a robust steel door presented itself, its facade scarred with numerous sculpted fist shapes. A quick examination disclosed the necessity of a key for its unveiling. Their only accessible path seemed to be the left door. It was slightly ajar, with faint light trickling out from the gaps, casting shadows on the ground. Unlike the other doors, this one appeared old and fragile, its wood splintered in places. Liam, curious, approached it slowly, peering through the small opening, trying to discern what lay beyond. Finding nothing immediately threatening, he pushed it gently. The door creaked loudly, revealing a room filled with worn-out benches, dusty shelves filled with tattered books, and a large ornate table in the center. The room appeared to be some sort of study or library. This looks like a place where guards or perhaps a warden might have relaxed or done their paperwork, mused Asher, taking in the surroundings. As they began to explore the room, their attention was drawn to the table. Atop it lay scattered papers, most of them too faded to read, and an old lantern, its flame long extinguished. Among the clutter, a singular item caught Asher's eye, a delicate silver key. This might be what we need for that door, Liam whispered. 
the glow of the keys seemed almost inviting. As they approached the table, a blood-curdling scream pierced the silence of the room. From behind one of the taller bookshelves, a zombified inmate lunged into view, its decaying face twisted in rage and hunger. Its scream also a call to its brethren. Asher and Liam barely had time to react when more shadows began to move among the shelves, revealing over a dozen more of the undead. They rushed forward, a mass of rotting flesh and torn clothing, drawn to the living intruders in their midst. Guardian, provoke. Asher commanded sharply. In response, the Guardian pulled the attention of the zombies, as if beckoning them into its embrace. Like moths to a flame, the zombies quickly shifted their focus from Asher and Liam to the armored summon. Seeing his chance, Asher turned to Liam, shouting, Now! Use your explosive shot! Liam, with his gun at the ready and its chamber glowing with a volatile energy, took aim at the now clustering undead around the Guardian. With a deep breath, he pulled the trigger. The moment the bullet struck, a resounding explosion echoed through the library, a bright flash illuminating every corner. The force of the blast tore apart the horde, sending undead limbs flying and reducing the immediate threat. Your Guardian is now affected by the burning ailment status. It will suffer a 1% maximum health loss per second for 10 seconds. You have participated in the elimination of zombified inmates and guards X-12. Experience point earned have been divided by the amount of participants. You have earned 60 EXP. EXP 407-400. Congratulations for reaching LV.5. You have acquired 5 attribute points. Asher observed the aftermath, thoroughly impressed. He was aware of Liam's capabilities, but witnessing the sheer power of that shot was something else entirely. Not only had it obliterated the zombies, but the damage was substantial. The significant loss of over 80 health points from his guardian suggested the zombies had suffered even more, given they lacked the guardian's protective measures like elemental resistance and shield mitigation. What caught Asher's attention, though, was the lingering burn, a clear sign of fire damage. The Guardian was now dealing with a sustained burning effect. It was fortunate that this was caused by an ally. Asher could promptly tend to his Guardian's injuries in the safety of the library before they proceeded. That was a bit too close, Liam remarked, wiping sweat from his brow. Your Guardian's taunt truly saved our skins there, he added. Asher nodded in agreement. We need to be more cautious. There's no telling how many more of them are lurking around. It seems our skills complement each other perfectly. If we run into another swarm of these undead prisoners, let's use the same tactic. My guardian draws them in, you blast them apart, and I'll patch him up before we move on. Asher added. After the aftermath, they could finally move toward the table. Asher was careful, looking around to make sure no other threats were hiding. He picked up the silver key and gripped it tightly. Let's head back, he said. Together with the Guardian, the two of them made their way out of the library. The air was heavy with the scent of burnt flesh and the residue of the gunshot. Once they were back in the corridor, they approached the steel door. The lock looked like it was just waiting for their key. Taking a moment, Asher put the key in and turned it. There was the sound of gears turning and locks shifting, and soon enough, the door slowly opened to show what was on the other side. Beyond the door was the noticeable contrast between this section and previous areas of the prison. The walls were made of a thicker, cold gray concrete, devoid of any signs of wear. Every inch seemed purpose-built to be intimidating and impenetrable. The corridor was lit by harsh fluorescent lights, which cast a sterile, bluish glow over everything. The floor was polished to a mirror shine, probably making it easier to spot any disturbances or contraband. On either side of the corridor were cell doors made of thick steel with small, reinforced windows at eye level. These windows were just large enough to provide a glimpse of the interior, but not enough to offer any chance of escape. Each door had multiple locks and electronic security measures, indicating the high-risk nature of the prisoners once contained within. Looks like a maximum security section, doesn't it? These cells are far more daunting than the others, Liam observed. Given his background as a police officer, he had some familiarity with these settings. 
His assessment was spot on. They were indeed in the section reserved for the most hardened and dangerous criminals, the maximum security block. As they progressed to the far end of the room, a lever mounted on the wall caught their attention, illuminated distinctly by an overhead light. See that? Is that a lever? Asher inquired. Sure looks like one, Liam observed. Must be the mechanism to unlock the cage gate. Guess we'll need to activate it to move past those iron bars. Bam. Huh. The echoing stillness of the maximum security section was suddenly shattered by a deafening crash. Asher and Liam froze from the unexpected sound, their attention abruptly pulled away from the lever. From behind them, one of the fortified cell doors was hurtled into the air, crashing down with a reverberating thud that sent shockwaves throughout the corridor. From the gaping hole of the shattered cell, a monstrous figure emerged, casting an imposing shadow under the dim lighting. It was an inmate, but not like the ones they'd encountered before. This creature was grotesquely swollen in size, its muscles bulging unnaturally, its height easily twice that of a regular man. The tattered remains of a prison jumpsuit strained to contain its hulking form, revealing patches of necrotic flesh beneath. Veins pulsed visibly under its decaying skin, and its eyes, devoid of any human spark, were filled with an insatiable hunger. The silence was palpable as both parties assessed each other. Then, with a guttural roar, the behemoth charged towards them, each step causing the ground to tremble. Chapter 23 Shield and Shot Asher and Liam were cornered. The tight confines of the corridor left them with little room to maneuver, and the onrushing zombified brute blocked their only path forward. Walls hemmed them in on every side, and retreat was not an option. Their dire predicament left Asher with one bold solution. He would pit his guardian's shield charge against the zombie's ferocious momentum. Guardian, use shield charge, he commanded. Heeding Asher's command, the Guardian surged forward, its target clear. The monstrous zombie, muscles bulging, also barreled onward, its right shoulder prominent and ready to clash with the Guardian's spike-guarded shield. When the two collided, the force sent both of them reeling backward. While Asher expected the brute to be repelled due to the Guardian's 100% knockback effect, he hadn't anticipated his Guardian to be thrown back as well. The zombie must have used a similar skill, Asher mused, noticing the similarities in movement and charge between the two. Unlike the Guardian, however, the zombie had relied on its massive shoulder as its medium of choice. Seizing the opportunity, Liam unleashed a barrage of bullets, each one finding its mark on the massive zombie. The monster's health diminished, albeit at a gradual pace. Having a ranger like Liam helps a lot, thought Asher. Those shots took away some of its health. If I was alone, I wouldn't have done any damage in this short time. It's getting back up. Liam exclaimed. The zombified brute, now on its feet again, took a deep, rasping breath, its chest expanding unnaturally. With a guttural roar, it suddenly spewed a stream of foul-smelling liquid directly at Asher, Liam, and the Guardian. Both of them tried to dodge, but the sheer volume and speed of the liquid made it nearly impossible to evade completely. Droplets splattered onto them, immediately sizzling upon contact and releasing a noxious gas. The exposed areas of their skin began to burn, and they could feel a painful sensation creeping through their veins, signaling that they had been poisoned. You and your animate guardian have been affected by the poison ailment status. You will suffer a 1% maximum health loss per second for 10 seconds. Asher. Liam choked out, clutching his arm where a large splatter had hit him. I'm losing health fast. Soulful restoration. Asher immediately chanted, bathing Liam in a soothing light that mended his injuries and restored him to full health. The spell, designed to heal 10% of the recipient's maximum health, perfectly counteracted the damage from the poison. Instead of using another cast on himself, Asher opted to conserve his remaining mana for any unforeseen challenges ahead. Meanwhile, he relied on his guardian's innate healing ability to recover gradually. Liam, we need to bolt for the exit. I'll have the guardian use shield charge to topple him, then provoke to hold his attention. Once we're at the entrance, let loose with your explosive shot. 
it should pack a punch and likely set that rotting flesh of his ablaze, Asher rapidly laid out his impromptu plan. Without a second thought, the duo sprinted for the exit. Every step echoing through the vast corridor, mixing with the growls and roars of the zombified brute. The guardian, steadfast and devoted, clashed with the zombie. With a powerful shield charge, it caused the ground to shake upon impact. The sheer force of the Guardian's attack knocked the brute off its feet momentarily. Using this brief window, Asher and Liam leaped over the fallen behemoth. This act further inflamed the already enraged brute, prompting it to rise swiftly, hot on their heels. To protect its master, the Guardian employed Provoke, drawing the monster's full rage onto itself. Liam and Asher used this diversion to their advantage, making their way closer to the exit. The echoing sounds of the monster's roars grew louder as they neared the entrance. Asher glanced back to gauge the distance between them and the brute, while Liam pricked his explosive shot. As they finally reached the doorway, the air grew tense. The brute, having shaken off the guardian's attempts to stall him, barreled forward, narrowing the gap between them at a terrifying pace. Now, Liam! Asher shouted. Liam took aim, his fingers steady, and fired. The bullet erupted from the barrel with an ear-splitting roar, racing toward the massive target. Upon impact, the explosive shot detonated, sending a blinding burst of flames enveloping the beast. The inferno clung to its decomposed skin, setting it ablaze. A deafening scream echoed from the brute as it flailed, the searing pain consuming it. Guardian! Use shield throw! Asher ordered. Without hesitation, the Guardian flung its shield with all its might, aiming to deal additional damage to the monster. The two adventurers paused for a moment, catching their breaths and watching as the monstrous figure crumpled to the ground, its final cries of agony fading into silence. The immediate threat neutralized. You have participated in the elimination of Zombified Brute. Experience point earned have been divided by the amount of participants. You have earned 153 EXP. EXP, 160-500. Liam, still catching his breath, pointed towards the smoldering remains of the zombified brute. Hey, Asher, look at that. Asher squinted and approached the spot, discovering a gleaming object amidst the ash. He carefully picked up the shimmering item, its purple hue reflecting the ambient light. The crystallized heart, despite its gem-like appearance, bore an unsettling resemblance to the face of the zombified brute. It was cool to the touch and pulsed with an almost imperceptible energy. A crystallized heart. Asher declared. We're lucky to have found this, Liam mused, but how do we split it? It's not like we can just break it in two. Asher pondered for a moment. How about we hold on to it until we've cleared the dungeon? Once we've gathered everything, we can decide how to divide our findings. Does that sound fair? Liam nodded in agreement to Asher's suggestion. With their newfound items safely stowed away, the pair approached the lever, its presence highlighted by the ceiling lights. Asher reached out, gripped the lever firmly, and pulled it down with a determined force. The sound of grinding gears echoed throughout the corridor as the caged gate began to slowly rise, unveiling the next part of their perilous journey. Following the activation of the lever, Asher and Liam retraced their steps back through the maximum security section. The once caged gate that had barred their way forward now stood open. The iron bars, formerly an impassable barrier, had lifted to grant them passage. Beyond the gate, a dimly lit path stretched out, promising both unknown dangers and the potential for escape. Liam hesitated for a moment, taking in the now accessible path. That's it then. We've opened the gate. But be on your guard, who knows what awaits us further in. Beyond the gate, an ornate door presented itself. Its detailed carvings and gold trimmings were in stark contrast to the cold and dreary design of the prison. The door almost seemed out of place, like an artifact from a different time. The plaque above it read, Warden's Quarters. Asher glanced at Liam. This has to be the main event, the boss room, he whispered. With a deep breath, Liam pushed the door open. The sight that met them made their blood run cold. 
Before them stood an enormous zombie, dwarfing even the zombified brute they had encountered earlier. The zombified warden, evident by his uniform, towered over them. His jet black pants and jacket, crisply tailored, gave him an air of authority even in his undead state. The warden's hat sat askew on his head, casting a shadow over his hollow eyes. But what was truly terrifying was the overwhelming aura of power that radiated from him, an oppressive force that seemed to fill the entire room. His musculature was unlike anything they had ever seen, bulging in ways that defied anatomy, making it evident that this creature was not just any zombified entity. It was the culmination of whatever dark force had taken over the prison. The warden's gaze slowly fell on the intruders, his eyes locking onto theirs. A low, guttural growl emanated from deep within him, echoing around the ornate chamber. Involuntarily, Asher retreated a step, struck by the sheer, undeniable might of the creature before him. Liam readied his gun, taking careful aim. We have to be strategic here, he said, voice low, this won't be like the other fights. We need to use our skills in tandem and be precise. The duo prepared themselves, knowing that the battle ahead would be their toughest challenge yet. Chapter 24 Against Immovable Dread The warden's quarters were not like any other part of the prison they'd explored. Though signs of decay were evident, the room was a somber reflection of the power and prestige the warden once held. The room was a strange mix of luxury and wear. Tall windows with old, heavy curtains let in just a bit of light, giving the room a soft glow. Pictures of serious-looking people hung on the walls, probably the old leaders of this place. It felt like their eyes were watching whomever set foot inside the room. In the middle was a fancy wooden desk with papers and pens scattered around. Behind it was a big chair made of dark wood with a bright red cushion. The room's large size and high ceiling made the zombified warden look even bigger. The atmosphere in the warden's quarters was thick with tension. The low sounds from the zombified warden filled the room, along with the scary noises he made. A low rumble broke the tense silence as the ground beneath them quivered. The warden took a step forward, each footfall like a mini earthquake, shaking the chamber's foundations. Liam and Asher exchanged anxious glances. The warden's strength was evident, not just in his size, but in the very aura he emitted a palpable force of menace and dread. Before anyone could make another move, the zombified warden, with an incredible show of strength, gripped the edge of the desk and hurled it towards Asher and Liam. Bam! The guardian, with a speed that belied its size, leapt in front of the duo. Using both its body and its spike guard shield, it absorbed the full brunt of the flying desk. Splinters and shards flew in all directions as the desk shattered on impact. The room filled with dust, making it hard to see. But the warden didn't wait. Using the debris as cover, he charged with a roar, the ground trembling with each step he took. Liam tried to get a shot off, but the debris impaired his vision. I can't get a clear shot. We need to stop him from coming this way, he exclaimed. Asher's instincts kicked in, and without hesitation, he knew the immediate action to take. Guardian. Use provoke, he shouted with authority. Asher anticipated the familiar pull of the Guardian's taunting effect, drawing the monstrous warden's attention away from them. This diversion would buy them crucial seconds to attack and regroup. However, instead of the expected reaction, Asher was met with a jarring revelation he hadn't foreseen. Provoke ineffective against zombified warden due to passive skill, unwavering stance. The holographic warning flashed across Asher's vision briefly, but it felt like an eternity. A sinking feeling of dread gripped his heart as he realized his main crowd control ability was useless against this behemoth. The warden's piercing, soulless eyes locked onto Asher and Liam, completely ignoring the guardian that had tried to divert its attention. Liam, quickly catching onto the gravity of the situation, yelled, Asher, move. Without waiting for a reply, he took aim and fired off a series of rapid shots at the warden's legs, attempting to slow its progress. But the zombified warden seemed almost impervious to the bullets. The warden kept advancing until it finally closed in on them. We have to halt its advance. Liam, fire an explosive round. We need to disrupt its momentum. Asher exclaimed. 
In the tense moments that followed Asher's words, Liam swiftly aimed and fired an explosive shot directly at the charging warden. The bullet detonated upon impact, releasing a concussive blast and a cloud of thick, obscuring dust. For a split second, Asher hoped that the explosion would halt the monstrous warden in his tracks. But the brief moment of hope was shattered as quickly as it had come. From within the dense haze, the silhouette of the warden appeared, charging with even more vigor. Then, with a strength and agility that contradicted its massive size, the warden leaped high into the air, almost touching the ceiling on its way, soaring straight at them. Before either of them could react, the warden landed with a deafening slam, sending out a shockwave that felt like an earthquake. The force of the shockwave threw both Asher and Liam off their feet, sending them hurtling backward. They slammed into the walls, the wind knocked out of them, pain radiating through their bodies. The warden's display of sheer power was nothing short of terrifying. They had never faced an opponent like this, one that seemingly shrugged off their best moves and retaliated with even greater force. Asher, gasping for breath and wincing from the pain, managed to get to his feet. He saw that Liam was slower to rise, clearly more affected by the shockwave. The Guardian, though momentarily staggered, was now positioning itself between the duo and the warden, its shield held high, ready to defend its master. Asher knew that they were at a significant disadvantage. Without the ability to taunt the warden, they had to come up with a new plan quickly. Liam, he whispered, trying to get the attention of his dazed ally, we need a new strategy. Liam, shaking off the disorientation, nodded. If he's immune to taunts, then maybe we should focus on other status ailments or debuffs. Do you have anything that could slow him down or weaken him? I don't have any abilities that can inflict status ailments or debuffs. Provoke was my only form of crowd control, Asher admitted, his voice tinged with worry. But, my guardian does possess a knockback skill. It's a gamble, but it might just give us those vital seconds we need. With a plan in place, Asher directed his guardian to use his shield charge to knock back the zombified warden. The guardian, with its shield at the ready, charged towards the zombified warden with fierce determination. As it closed in, the guardian bashed its shield hard, aiming for the warden's body. Asher and Liam watched with bated breath. The clash between the guardian's shield and the massive zombified warden echoed throughout the room, a collision of sheer power. However, their hopes were swiftly crushed. The warden stood resolute, as immovable as a mountain. Despite taking the full impact of the shield charge, he hadn't budged an inch. It was now clear that his unwavering stance wasn't just protection against taunts. It rendered him immune to any form of displacement, including knockbacks. Asher's face paled, realizing the enormity of their situation. This, this is insane. How do we even begin to combat something like that? Asher gritted his teeth, trying to think quickly. The room felt smaller by the second as the colossal warden began to take another step towards them. I don't know what else to do. It overwhelmed everything we could throw at it. Liam hesitated, glancing at Asher with uncertainty in his eyes. Asher, there's something I've been keeping as a last resort. It's risky, and I wasn't sure if I'd ever use it, but now, maybe it's our only chance. Asher turned to face him, his expression questioning but also desperate. What are you talking about? Anything that can help, we need to use it now. From his pouch, Liam pulled out a single cartridge. It looked different from the rest, darker and heavier. The bullet was filled with a black liquid that seemed to move on its own, catching the dim light in a mesmerizing dance. It looked like it was imbued with thick black oil, and it gave off a faint, petrolic odor. Asher's eyes widened in with both alarm and awe at what he was seeing. Is that what I think it is? Liam nodded. It's an incendiary round. This isn't your average bullet. I snagged it from the tower's store page, and it set me back a staggering 500 points for just one round. The black gold oil is a highly volatile compound. If this hits the warden with my explosive shot, it will ignite and create an intense fire. But the problem is, the explosion radius is unpredictable. If we're too close, we could get caught in the blast. We need to confine it in the room and make our exist before the explosion happens, else we'll be caught in the danger. 
Asher swallowed hard, weighing their options. They were cornered, and the zombified warden seemed unstoppable. This might be their only chance to fight back, but it came with high stakes. Let's do it! Asher exclaimed, determined to make it out this predicament. Chapter 25 The Black Gold Gambit Liam carefully slid the black gold cartridge into his weapon, the weighty finality of the action setting the stage for what was to come. Meeting Asher's gaze with a fierce resolve, he declared, I'll take the shot. But we need to clear out of this room fast. Once it's fired and hits its mark, this whole place will be an inferno. The warden will be consumed, but we must be sure of our escape. Your guardian can serve as our decoy. It might be a hard call, but better it than us. You can always summon it back, right? The underlying logic of Liam's proposal was sound, yet there was a crucial detail he wasn't informed of. While Liam believed the Guardian's skills and items were intrinsic, the reality was far different. Asher had painstakingly equipped and trained his Guardian, nurturing its capabilities over time. Should the Guardian fall, the skills it had honed and the items it held would be lost forever. Asher hadn't shared this particular detail with Liam, and now faced the daunting task of balancing the immediate threat with the potential long-term loss. Asher's heart raced, the notion of sacrificing his guardian gnawed at him, it wasn't just a summoned entity. It represented hours of his effort, strategies, and emotional investment. Wait, Liam. Asher said, holding out a hand as he tried to think rapidly, the seconds ticking away ominously. The lumbering footsteps of the zombified warden echoed menacingly, growing louder and closer with every passing moment. Its deep, ragged breathing filled the room, amplifying the urgency of their predicament. There has to be another way, Asher muttered, eyes darting around the room, searching for any edge or strategy they might have overlooked. The portraits on the walls, the remnants of the shattered desk, could any of these be used to their advantage? We don't have time. Liam snapped, his voice laced with a mix of panic and determination. Every second we waste puts us in more danger. We need to act now. Asher's eyes darted around the room, searching for an answer. And then it struck him. The corners. We can use the room structure to our advantage. Liam raised an eyebrow, puzzled. Explain. Look, Asher began, pointing at one of the room's corners. If we position the guardian with its back to the corner and bait the warden to attack it, we can effectively use the warden's massive body as a shield against the explosion from the black gold cartridge. The guardian would be somewhat shielded by the warden and the walls. It's risky, but it might be our best shot. Liam frowned, contemplating the plan. If the explosion doesn't go as expected, it's going to be risky for us too. We position ourselves opposite the corner, Asher suggested, determination in his eyes. We'll be at the maximum distance from the explosion, and the warden will take the brunt of it. Nodding slowly, Liam said, all right, let's give it a shot. But we need to act fast. I should increase my vitality, increasing my guardian's health in the process. Better be safe than sorry. Asher mused to himself as he allocated the ten attribute points he had on vitality. You have allocated ten points into vitality. HP 290-390 With a swift and deliberate command, Asher signaled his guardian towards the designated corner. Raising its spike guard shield with confidence, the guardian assumed its position. In a calculated move, it unleashed its shield throw skill, diverting the zombified warden's attention from Liam and Asher. While this didn't pack the potency of the provoke skill, it still achieved its purpose, compelling the warden to target the entity that had inflicted harm upon it even if he had immunity to taunts. It was still a brainless zombie making it quite easy to bait it. Get ready, Asher whispered, his heart pounding. The room's atmosphere was thick with tension. Every step the warden took felt like an eternity. The stakes were high, and the slightest misjudgment could lead to catastrophic consequences. The duo braced themselves for the decisive moment that would determine their fate. Seizing the brief window of opportunity, both Liam and Asher swiftly darted towards the room's entrance. Both men were gasping for breath, their hearts pounding in their chests as the adrenaline coursed through their veins. 
We need to be far enough when that cartridge goes off, Liam said, glancing over his shoulder to ensure the guardian was holding the warden at bay. Liam continued, clutching his gun tightly. I've never tested it, but from the description, the blast radius should be significant. As for the Guardian, it was executing Asher's plan flawlessly. With its back to the corner, it had positioned the Warden between itself and the wall behind him. Its shield was raised, and it was doing its best to keep the hulking monster's attention solely on itself. As Asher and Liam swiftly moved toward the door, Asher's voice, etched with urgency, pierced the tense air. Liam, take the shot. He feared that if the warden continued his assault, his guardian might be weakened to a point where the impending explosion would be lethal, a consequence Asher desperately hoped to avoid. Liam steadied his aim, focusing on the largest part of the zombified warden's back. The dim light of the room glinted off the monstrous creature's rotting flesh, providing a macabre target. Liam's finger tensed on the trigger. Boom! A deafening shot echoed through the abandoned prison, the sound magnified by the quiet that had fallen over the prison. The moment Liam released his shot, Asher swiftly shut the door, shielding them from the impending explosion and the ensuing inferno within the room. And then, an ear-shattering explosion rocked the prison. The force was so intense that the very ground beneath them vibrated, and dust dislodged from the ceiling above, raining down on them. The blinding flash of the explosion momentarily illuminated the entire corridor, casting eerie shadows. Asher's heart plummeted when he saw his guardian's life dangerously nearing the critical zero mark. Without hesitation, he grasped the door's scalding knob, the intense heat from the inferno within searing his palm. Through the fiery haze, he witnessed the grim tableau inside, his guardian, grievously injured, amidst a raging conflagration. Driven by an overwhelming urge to save his guardian, Asher dashed forward, hoping to heal it before it was too late. Asher darted into the blazing room, almost choking on the thick smoke. He quickly reached the guardian's side. His hands, still reddened and painful from the door's heat, began to glow with a soft, green light. He placed them on the guardian's, and the healing energy flowed into it. The guardian's injuries began to mend, its health regenerating with each passing second. Congratulations. Goblin's Rejuvenator has leveled up. LV 1-2. Regan 2%-2.5%. Status Elements Duration Reduction 10%-12%. The searing flames roared around them, but for a moment, everything seemed still and quiet to Asher as he focused solely on saving his summon. However, this fleeting serenity was shattered by a guttural, pained roar. Asher turned his gaze to the source and saw the once mighty zombified warden. The black gold cartridge Liam had fired had done its job exceptionally well. The warden was engulfed in ferocious flames, his once pale flesh now blackening and peeling away. Every movement it made seemed to be a struggle as the fire consumed it. But it was still alive. Its life force was depleting rapidly, yet the determination in its eyes was terrifying. Through the fiery haze, the warden tried to take a step forward but stumbled, the flames eating away at its strength. Realizing that the warden, despite being in a weakened state, was still a significant threat, Asher quickly turned his attention back to the guardian. I know you're on the edge, but we need one last push. Use shield charge and finish him off, he commanded with urgency. With a final surge of energy, the Guardian, despite its weakened state, heeded Asher's call as it braced itself for one last charge. The Warden, still burning, its flesh searing and melting off, roared in defiance, an eerie howl that echoed through the prison's chambers. Liam, keep firing relentlessly. We have to finish this now, I can't imagine he'll hold out much longer. Liam nodded in understanding, his face taut with determination. The rhythmic echoes of gunshots reverberated through the chamber as he unleashed a barrage of bullets towards the flaming warden. Each shot sparked against the fiery silhouette, the light and dark intertwined in a deadly dance. Meanwhile, the Guardian, despite its weakened state, summoned the last of its strength for one final assault. With a roar, it charged forward, its shield glinting in the firelight. 
As it closed the distance, the guardian's shield struck the warden with a force that seemed to shake the very foundation of the room. Without wasting any time, it also hurled out his shield towards the warden, adding more damage. The combined onslaught was too much for the burning warden. Between the unyielding strikes from Liam and the devastating shield charge of the guardian, the warden's flaming form staggered, then collapsed to the ground in a smoldering heap. A hush descended upon the room, broken only by the faint crackling of embers and the heavy breathing of Asher and Liam. Congratulations. Shield charge has leveled up. LV-1-2. Movement speed increased, 10%-11%. Base damage, 50 to 55 dash 55 to 60. Congratulations. Shield throw has leveled up. LV, 1 dash 2. Base damage, 10 to 15 dash 15 to 20. Congratulations. Bearheart fortitude has leveled up. LV, 1 dash 2. Maximum life, 50 dash 60. Physical damage reduction, 2% dash 3%. You have participated in the elimination of Zombified Warden. Experience point earned have been divided by the amount of participants. You have earned 350 EXP. EXP 510 slash 500. Congratulations for reaching LV.6. You have acquired 5 attribute points. The immediate threat had been neutralized, but the echoes of battle and the lingering tension remained palpable. Liam, lowering his gun, looked over at Asher. That was intense, he remarked, his voice tinged with a mix of relief and disbelief. Asher, still catching his breath, managed a small smile. We made it, thanks to our combined efforts. And thanks for that black gold cartridge. It was a game changer. Liam nodded, looking down at the spent cartridge case on the ground. Let's just hope we don't run into anything tougher than that in the future. I only had the one. Having overcome the daunting challenge of the zombified warden, the two adventurers paused, taking a moment to regain their composure. As they caught their breath, an unexpected vortex began to form in a corner of the warden's chamber, eerily reminiscent of the portal they had used to enter this dungeon. It seems the dungeon recognizes our victory. Perhaps it's an exit portal? Liam observed. Just a few moments. I'm too drained to move yet. Hold on, what's that? Asher interrupted, his gaze fixed on the fallen warden. Liam followed Asher's line of sight, his eyes widening. Do you see that? Floating right above him? Asher's voice filled with excitement. Could it be a loot drop? As realization dawned, they both hurriedly approached the spot. Laid before them was an item that left them both astonished, not just by its appearance, but also by its description. Chapter 26 Mysterious Individual Asher and Liam eyed the badge, their interest peaked and a glint of desire apparent in their eyes. This wasn't just any accessory, it was an amulet, a crucial piece to complete one's character setup. Its defensive capabilities were impressive. Not only could it decelerate an enemy's movement and attack speed, but it would also inflict this debuff on any foe deemed an enemy within the wearer's line of sight. This line of sight feature was its most game-changing attribute. Unlike other items that had fixed radius or limited enemy counts, this amulet's influence was boundless. If someone were to stand atop a vantage point and gaze upon an entire army, every single soldier would experience diminished stats. The potential was staggering. With wide eyes, Liam slowly reached out to pick up the badge, its surface shimmering mysteriously. This, this is quite good, he whispered, looking at Asher. Asher nodded, trying to keep his composure but clearly excited. Liam looked at the badge, turning it over in his hand. But who gets to wear it? It's a singular item, and both of us could benefit from it. Asher pursed his lips, contemplating. Then said resolutely, you should have it. Really? Are you certain? Absolutely. Without that black gold cartridge, which you invested so many points into, we wouldn't have made it out alive. It's only right that you get this. You played a pivotal role in taking down that boss. Liam looked at the badge, then back at Asher, clearly moved by his gesture. Thanks, Asher. 
but, if I'm being honest, I couldn't have done it without you and your guardian. We're a team, after all. Asher gave a tired smile, indeed, we are. But sometimes, the spoils go to the one who made the bravest move. Today, that was you. Liam gripped the badge, feeling its weight and power. All right, but on one condition. Condition? What is it? Asher raised an eyebrow, curious about his condition. The crystallized heart from the zombified brute. It's yours. That way, thing will truly be fair. Asher's eyes lit up with surprise. The crystallized heart was a rare treasure, known to harbor power that could potentially dwarf the benefits of the badge. Though there was always the gamble of its extracted skill not living up to expectations, the sheer potential it held was undeniable. While Asher couldn't immediately tap into its power due to the constraints of the tower's trading system, the offer was undeniably enticing. Liam's generous gesture displayed a level of camaraderie and respect between them. Deal, Asher replied, extending his hand for a handshake. The gesture signified more than just a transaction of goods, it marked their partnership and mutual trust. As Liam equipped the badge to himself, Asher carefully slid the luminous crystallized heart into his pocket. As he did so, he pondered whether the tower's store might offer a spatial or dimensional inventory skill, allowing him to store items securely without having to carry them everywhere. I should look into this when I get back, he mused. Once they had secured their respective treasures, they turned their attention to the vortex forming in the corner. It beckoned, promising a return to the world outside this dungeon. Before stepping through, Liam paused and said, You know, I think we make a pretty good team. Even when faced with seemingly bad odds, we find a way. Asher smirked and nodded in agreement. Things are bound to get more hectic. Let's make sure to always get each other's back, he said, extending a clenched fist towards Liam. Recognizing the gesture, Liam grinned and bumped his fist against Asher's. In that simple touch, a deep bond of friendship was solidified. Liam looked around, pinning the badge securely into his shirt. We should move. As they approached the exit portal, the dungeon walls shimmered and the atmosphere shifted, replacing the oppressive stench with a more neutral aroma. The oppressive darkness began to wane, overtaken by the brilliant glow emanating from the portal. With determined steps, they passed through, leaving the dungeon behind. Emerging from the portal, Asher and Liam found themselves back in the familiar confines of the subway station. The once roaring dungeon's ambience was replaced with the silence of the tunnel. Asher took a moment to adjust to the sudden change in environment. The subway tiles felt strangely welcoming compared to the floors of the dungeon they had just left. Liam, meanwhile, appeared elated as he observed the now unobstructed path ahead. The once-present portal had vanished from their action of clearing it, granting them free passage ahead. The portal's gone. We can finally head to the police station, he declared, gazing intently down the tunnel, his face alight with hope. Let's return and update the others. They'll be thrilled. As they made their way back, Asher noted the graffiti-laden and worn-out walls. Ever wonder about our future in this changed world? These trains, once bustling with people, now only echo of the past. Liam paused, letting the weight of Asher's words sink in. It had been just a few days since their reality shifted dramatically. Every morning, I'd commute on this very subway. It's strange how something so mundane is now something I miss. Asher nodded, understanding the sentiment, we used to take so many simple conveniences for granted. What once was a daily routine, like this commute, now feels like a luxury. And the challenges are only beginning. After about twenty minutes of navigating through the tunnels, the ambient sounds of people talking and the faint glow of makeshift lighting became visible in the distance. They had reached the subway station settlement area. However, the scene that greeted them was not the expected buzz of life, but rather chaos and confusion. Tents were overturned, provisions scattered, and the telltale signs of a struggle were apparent. The remaining members of the group Liam had been protecting were clustered together, some nursing minor injuries and others with tear-streaked faces. An elderly woman approached them, her face etched with worry. Oh, thank heavens you're back. We've been attacked. 
Liam's eyes darted around the makeshift camp, searching for familiar faces. What happened? The elderly woman's eyes filled with tears as she replied, they stormed our camp. They took a few other children and the young lady that had accompanied the man beside you. They demanded our supplies and threatened to hurt the children if we didn't comply. We tried to resist, but they were too many, too strong. They took away Sarah, exclaimed Asher. Asher clenched his fists, anger rising within him. Did they say where they were taking them? An elderly man, bruised and bleeding from a gash on his forehead, stepped forward. They mentioned something about a construction site. They said they had used for the young ones and that he would be pleased. Liam's face grew taut with determination. We need to get them back. Now. Asher nodded in agreement. Every minute counts. We can't let them harm Sarah or the kids. The elderly woman placed a hand on Liam's arm. Please, save them. The children, we need to protect them until their parents comes back. We will bring them back, Liam promised, his voice unwavering. But do you know exactly where this construction site is? Asher asked. I do. When I was looking for people to work with, I passed by a construction site just a few minutes from here. I didn't think much of it at the time, but now it seems like it's their meeting place, Liam replied. You keep mentioning they. Can you tell me who they are? Asher inquired. Do you remember that group of Awakeners who couldn't handle the easy challenge? Well, it's them. They've joined forces with a tough player from the hard mode, from what I've heard. They're a bunch of folks who faced failures and are now trying to gain power and influence quickly before others stronger than them catch up. Liam explained. Those bastards. Let's stop them before it's too late. Asher exclaimed. Asher and Liam exited the subway station. The dimly lit underground passages gave way to the city streets above. Their friends were in trouble, held captive by the group of Awakeners and their powerful leader. Asher and Liam had no time to waste. Asher and Liam navigated through the empty streets, keeping a low profile. Thankfully, they did not need to avoiding any monsters as they advanced since there wasn't any to worry about most likely because of the dragon Asher had previously encountered. This should be the place, Liam pointed towards a towering construction crane in the distance. That's the site, he whispered, narrowing his eyes. Look, over there. Asher's voice caught with disbelief as they peered into the construction site. Strewn across the ground were countless bodies, battered and lifeless. The grisly tableau was almost too much to bear, both Asher and Liam gagged, recoiling from the horror before them. This, this is monstrous. Liam whispered, aghast. An even more chilling discovery awaited them, each of the lifeless forms was eerily deprived of bones. Only limp skin and exposed organs lay in gruesome heaps, as if someone or something had maliciously stripped the skeletal structure from each corpse. Bam! The sudden noise from within the site jolted them back to the present. A scuffle? A confrontation? Sarah. Fear for her safety propelling him forward, Asher charged towards the source of the commotion, desperate to reach her before whatever malevolent force responsible for the horror could harm her. As they navigated toward the source of the commotion, they were met with the chilling sight of even more fallen bodies. Yet, amidst the grim scene, one figure stood out, arresting their attention. The man at the center exuded in chilling and eerie charisma. He had sleek silver hair, combed neatly to one side, that contrasted sharply with the deep black of his intricate attire. His eyes seemed to be void of any human emotion, while the lower part of his visage was hidden behind a menacing mask, reminiscent of intertwined skeletal structures. The ensemble was accentuated with gothic details, from the ornate patterns adorning his dark cloak to the delicate silver embellishments that added to his otherworldly aura. This individual was clearly no ordinary foe. In the man's grip was the head of another, its lifeless eyes staring blankly into the void. With a swift and almost practiced motion, the silver-haired figure effortlessly extracted the skeletal exoskeleton from the individual he held, leaving behind a grotesque shell. Asher, that was the leader of the group. The one that just died. 
Liam whispered, his voice filled with dread as he recognized the lifeless face of the man who had once led the kidnappers. Who on earth is this other man? Asher steadied the individual, sensing an inexplicable bond between them, almost as if their destinies were intertwined. Beside this enigmatic man stood two skeletal companions. The taller one, adorned in stark black and white attire, appeared as a faithful vassal to the man. The other, petite in size, resembled a child of no more than three or four years. Yet, in spite of its diminutive frame, the skeleton exuded a chilling menace, mirroring the ominous aura of the man it stood by. Together, they seemed to play roles of protectors or embodiments of the man's strength. Chapter 27 The Unexpected Collision After witnessing the macabre scene, Asher and Liam cautiously stayed out of the stranger's line of sight, frantically searching for any trace of their missing comrades. Neither the boneless bodies heaped on the ground nor the surrounding vicinity offered any clues of their whereabouts. Unexpectedly, the enigmatic figure pivoted and began advancing towards what appeared to be a doorway. Curiosity peaked, Asher and Liam held their breath, their eyes unwaveringly focused on the sealed entrance. Creak. The door creaked open, revealing a dimly lit room where several frightened children and a teenage girl huddled, their eyes wide with fear. Asher and Liam's emotions swirled, a mix of relief at finding the kidnapped children's and overwhelming dread about what might transpire next. The enigmatic man's gaze, cold and unyielding, surveyed the petrified children. Slowly, menacingly, he reached out to seize one of the younger ones. But just as his fingers were about to close around the child, Sarah, the teenage girl, sprang forward, positioning herself as a barrier between the man and the child. Her eyes blazed with defiance as she challenged him. What do you want with him? Stay away. Sarah's voice quivered with a blend of bravery and apprehension. The man's response was a chilling silence, his eyes unblinkingly and void of emotion fixed on Sarah. In a fluid, ruthless motion, he grasped Sarah's hair, yanking her towards him. Her agonized scream pierced the room. Relentlessly, he dragged her away, making his way to the ominous heart of the construction site. Where are you taking me? El let go of me. Sarah struggled, desperately attempting to free herself from his grip, but her efforts were in vain. The man's strength was overwhelming. The echoing sobs of the children heightened the chilling atmosphere. A surge of both horror and anger flashed in Asher and Liam's eyes. Time was of the essence, and they knew they had to intervene before it was too late. Liam's instincts took over. Without a second thought, he pulled out his gun and aimed directly at the man's head, hoping to end the threat swiftly. Bang! The silence of the room was shattered by the deafening echo of a gunshot. But just as the bullet was about to find its mark, the taller skeleton servant, which had been ominously lurking beside the man, sprang into action. With great speed, it unfurled a handkerchief, intercepting the bullet in midair. The impact caused a brief flash, and the bullet crumpled, harmlessly dropping to the ground. W. Watt? Liam's eyes widened in disbelief as his bullet disintegrated upon contact with what seemed like a mere handkerchief. In that instant, he realized the gravity of the situation. The man and his skeletal companion were entities not to be underestimated. The entire room seemed to hold its breath, stunned by the unforeseen intervention. The man paused momentarily, his cold gaze shifting to Liam, acknowledging the attempt on his life. Sarah seized this momentary distraction to try and free herself, but the man's grip was unrelenting. Asher, seeing Liam's attempt thwarted, realized that they were dealing with a force beyond their comprehension. The skeletal servant, having just deflected a bullet with nothing more than a piece of cloth, stood still, its hollow gaze fixed to the ground standing beside the man as if it was waiting for his order. Guardian, shield throw. Unable to just stand by and let their friend fall prey to this mysterious adversary, Asher ordered his guardian to attack. Asher's guardian responded instantly to the command. With swift precision, the guardian hurled its spiked shield towards the sinister man. The room's tension escalated, every eye watching the shield's trajectory. Yet, as before, the taller skeleton moved with astonishing speed, positioning its handkerchief to intercept the incoming projectile. 
As the shield collided with the handkerchief, there was a brief moment where it seemed the shield would be effortlessly deflected like Liam's bullet. But this was not just any shield, it was imbued with a skill. Suddenly, the shield ricocheted at an unexpected angle, redirecting its course towards the smaller skeleton adorned with a pink ribbon. The scene unfolded in what felt like slow motion. The mysterious man, sensing the danger his smaller companion was about to face, immediately released Sarah, lunging towards the smaller skeleton. In a desperate bid, he used his own body as a shield, wrapping his arms protectively around the smaller entity, trying to absorb the brunt of the impact. The metallic clang resonated throughout the space as the shield struck the man's back with great force, making him stagger but successfully protecting the smaller skeleton. Sarah, free from the man's grasp, scrambled to her feet, rushing towards the children's. Asher and Liam, seizing the moment of chaos, also moved closer to the children, ready to defend them at all costs. The atmosphere grew even more tense with the man momentarily motionless. The mysterious man turned his gaze towards the smaller skeleton. Despite its skeletal form, its eyes conveyed an inexplicably endearing innocence, almost as if it was assuring the man of its well-being. In response, the faintest hint of a smirk briefly touched the man's lips, a fleeting moment of emotion that seemed entirely out of character. But just as quickly as it had appeared, the smirk vanished, replaced once again by his customary, emotionless facade. Without wasting another second, he gently cradled the smaller skeleton in his arms, holding it close to his chest. The bond between them was palpable, suggesting a depth of connection that went beyond mere servitude. With the smaller skeleton safely in his embrace, the man began to retreat, all the while maintaining his watchful gaze on Asher and Liam, ensuring no further attempts to harm his skeletal companion. Suddenly, out of thin air, a door materialized behind the man, its structure eerily composed entirely of interwoven bones. The tall and dutiful skeletal servant stepped forward to open the door for its master. As the door creaked open, Asher caught a glimpse of what lay beyond, an army of skeletons, standing in formation, their hollow eyes glowing in the dim light. Without a backward glance, the man, carrying the smaller skeleton, walked through the door, followed by the servant. As the last of them crossed the threshold, the door dissolved into the ground, leaving no trace of its existence. Silence enveloped the construction site. Asher and Liam stood still, their minds racing to process the surreal events that had just transpired. They had braced themselves for an intense showdown, but instead, the man and his skeletal entourage had chosen to retreat. The sudden departure, without confrontation or words, left them more perplexed than ever. Why, why did he leave? Liam voiced out, his eyes darting around, half expecting the mysterious trio to reappear. Asher shook his head, equally baffled. I don't know, but it seemed that little skeleton was of great importance to him. Whatever connection they have, he seemed unwilling to risk it further. Asher was not just curious, but deeply intrigued by this enigmatic figure. It was clear that he was a necromancer, possessing the power to summon skeletons, and beyond the door, it appeared there was an entire horde awaiting his command. Guys! A desperate shout rang out from behind. Whirling around, Asher and Liam were met with the sight of Sarah sprinting toward them. Without hesitation, she enveloped both of them in a heartfelt embrace, her eyes gleaming with gratitude for their aid. The children from the other room mirrored Sarah's sentiment, racing towards the pair and clutching them tightly, tears of fear and relief streaming down their face. Asher and Liam exchanged a glance, both their faces understanding the weight of the ordeal the children had just faced. The gravity of the situation and the emotional aftermath was palpable in their expression and actions. With a silent nod to each other, they allowed themselves to simply be present for them. The construction site, once eerie with malevolent intent, was now filled with the soft sobs of relief and the warmth of human connection. Every sniffle, every tear, was a testament to the emotional challenges that had gripped those poor children. Gradually, the tears began to recede. The initial shock and panic were replaced with sighs of relief and tentative smiles. The group started to disentangle from their tight huddle. Sarah, rubbing a young boy's back, reassured him, it's over now. You're safe. 
Liam looked around, taking in the faces of those they had saved. We should head back to the subway. I'm sure the group must be worried sick. Asher nodded in agreement. Yes, better get back and rest for the day. I'm sure everyone's tired from all that had happened today. The group began their journey back to the subway station, leaving behind the construction site and its haunting memories. But the mystery of the man and his skeletal companions lingered in Asher's mind. Chapter 28 Sarah's Ability As the group, comprised of Asher, Liam, Sarah, and the children, navigated their way back to the subway station, Asher felt an urge to address the lingering questions. Sarah, he began, choosing his words carefully, I know you've been through a lot. But can you shed some light on what happened back there? How did the group that took you end up being so ruthlessly deboned by that killer? Sarah hesitated for a moment, her eyes distant as she recalled the terrifying events. I really don't know. After they grabbed us, they locked us up in a room. We had no idea what they wanted with us, but something must have gone wrong for them. All we heard were these super creepy screams and loud noises outside. It sounded like that weird guy was fighting with the people who took us. I see. Asher had hoped Sarah might shed some light on the situation, but many questions remained. Was this man merely a sadistic killer, or did he have a particular goal in mind? What purpose did he have for stripping his victims of their bones? One thing was undeniably clear, this man was no savior. His readiness to harm innocents like Sarah and the children, without a flicker of remorse, painted him as malevolent. Seems like he is walking the dark path of necromancy. Asher mused. To the general public unfamiliar with its intricacies, necromancy is often portrayed as a dark, malevolent magic, the antithesis of a virtuous, heroic class. However, those well-versed in fantasy understand that, like any other class or role, a necromancer can embody both righteousness and wickedness. The distinction lies in the individual wielding the art. Consider popular TV shows or comic books where the celebrated heroes, hailed as humanity's saviors, conceal a sinister side. They may neglect to save lives due to unconcern, then deceive the public with tales of being too late or battling powerful foes. As storytelling evolves, we see more narratives where the traditional hero is unveiled as the true antagonist, while the anti-hero emerges as the genuine savior. Asher pondered, how many other necromancers might be out there? With the world's recent shifts, many individuals had acquired distinct classes. While a significant portion of the remaining global population might have similar classes, Asher recognized that the class itself was merely a conduit to an individual's unique potential. The true value lay in the skills a class granted. From what he understood, even though two people might share a class, their initial skills could be entirely bespoke. The enigmatic man was a case in point. While he likely belonged to the necromancer class, his specialization seemed focused on skeleton summoning, a common necromantic ability alongside other undead entities like zombies, ghouls, liches, and more. However, exceptions like Asher with his guardian summon which was categorized as a specter minion existed, and it was too soon to say whether the man they'd encountered wasn't an outlier too. Only time would reveal the truth. As they navigated the streets and reached the subway, anxious grandparents raced towards the children. Waves of joy and relief enveloped them, grateful that their young ones had returned and scathed. Many showered Asher and Liam with heartfelt thanks, while others went above and beyond, displaying overwhelming gratitude and affection. Asher and Liam, having been at the center of the day's turmoil, felt the weight of their exhaustion pressing down. They secured a quiet corner near the tracks, away from the hustle and bustle of the makeshift community that had formed in the subway. Sarah approached them with blankets, her expression softer now that the immediate danger has passed. You two should rest, she said, laying the blankets down next to them. I'm sure you guys are exhausted. Not only did you clear the dungeon on your own, you prioritized our safety the moment you got out. We all owe you a debt of gratitude. Liam offered a weary smile, just glad everyone's safe. The community in the subway banded together, forming small groups to take turns keeping watch through the night. The elders and some other individuals volunteered for the first shift, allowing the children and their saviors to sleep together. 
As Asher drifted off to sleep, his mind wandered back to the events of the day. The imposing aura of the dragon, which nearly took his life with its mere presence, the allies he'd found and collaborated with, the treacherous dungeon exploration, and the enigmatic man with his skeletons. Each moment from the day had brought him close to the brink of death. But those thoughts faded into the background as the fatigue overcame him, pulling him into a deep sleep. Morning arrived, bringing with it a soft glow that penetrated the subway's entrances. The sounds of the waking community filled the air, murmurs of conversation, the shuffling of feet, and children's giggles. Asher and Liam stirred, their bodies stiff from the hard ground, but their spirits rejuvenated by a night of undisturbed rest. Morning, Liam grunted, stretching out his limbs. Didn't think I'd ever be grateful for a night on a subway platform. Asher chuckled. Desperate times. He yawned and stretched, his bones cracking in protest. So, what's our game plan? Liam looked contemplative for a moment. We should head to the police station on the other side of the subway. Wasn't that your main goal to begin with? If anyone has information or a better grasp of the current situation, it'd be them. Asher nodded. Sounds like a plan. Maybe we can find more clues about the current events. And if there's anyone organizing shelter and aid, the police station would be a good starting point. As they packed their belongings and prepared to move, Sarah approached them, a look of concern on her face. You're leaving? Where to? We're thinking of heading to the police station, Liam replied. See if we can gather more intel. Without the group? Sarah inquired. It's best that way. They're safer here. After we've scouted the outside and made sure it's safe, we'll come back for them. Liam responded. Sarah hesitated for a moment. I am coming with you. Asher and Liam shared a meaningful look, weighing Sarah's unexpected caution. It might be safer for you to stay here with the others, Asher suggested gently. We don't know about the dangers we'll face on the other side. Sarah's determination shone through her eyes. I need to be there with you both. I can't just sit around waiting, especially after everything that's happened. I want to help. Liam looked hesitant, but it was clear that Sarah's resolve wasn't going to waver. After a brief, silent exchange with Asher, he sighed. All right, but promise us you'll stay close and be cautious. Asher nodded in agreement, and if things get too dangerous, you'll need to find a safe place to hide immediately. Sarah gave a firm nod, and then that. Finalizing their group's lineup, they embarked on their journey to the other side of the subway, past the obstruction of the formerly positioned portal. Stepping out of the subway station, the trio found the world outside just as eerily quiet as the other side. The sunlight filtering through the dilapidated buildings created an ambience of desolation, making the silence all the more profound. As they moved forward, Sarah's eyes caught the sign of a thrift shop ahead. Its facade appeared mostly untouched, a rarity in these times. Hey, why don't we check out that shop, she pointed. Our clothes are practically falling apart. Plus, Asher, you're still in those pajamas which, by the way, look like they've seen better days. Asher glanced down at his attire, a sheepish grin spreading across his face. Well, I thought I was starting a new fashion trend in post-apocalyptic wear. Who knew pajamas wouldn't catch on? Liam chuckled, I think it's a great idea. A change of clothes might also help us blend in better, just in case there are any prying eyes. The three made their way into the thrift shop, hopeful for a fresh start in more ways than one. Inside the thrift shop, the aisles were lined with an eclectic mix of clothing from various styles, reminding them of the world before everything changed. They spread out, sifting through the offerings. Asher soon found himself in the sportswear section, feeling the fabrics and checking the sizes. The comfortable stretch of the fabric and lightweight nature of the garments seemed perfect for their journey. He picked out a pair of breathable tracksuit pants and a matching jacket. As he examined his chosen outfit, he noted to himself that these clothes were of common rank, offering no stat improvements or special abilities, just regular attire. But in these times, comfort and mobility were as important than magic-infused gear. 
Meanwhile, Sarah was exploring the accessories section when a peculiar motorcycle helmet caught her eye. The sleek black design was augmented with embedded neon lights that created animated facial expressions. Turning it on, she watched with delight as the visor displayed a sequence of quirky neon expressions ranging from a smiling face to a winking eye. Running over to Asher, she exclaimed, Look at this. Can you imagine if your guardian could wear this? It's so futuristic, like something straight out of a cyberpunk movie. Imagine him showing expression rather than a headless lump of armor. Such a shame he can't. Asher hesitated for a moment, a glint of excitement in his eyes. He then exhaled slowly, deciding it was the right time to share another part of his abilities. Actually, he began, my guardian can equip items. I just haven't mentioned it. Sarah and Liam turned to look at him, their expressions shifting from surprise to understanding. So, you're saying? Sarah trailed off, her gaze darting back to the neon helmet. Yeah, Asher said with a smirk, I think that helmet would look cool on him. Liam chuckled, man, you've got a bag full of surprises. But you know, with everything that's been going on, it makes sense that you'd keep some cards close to you. I did the same with the black gold cartridge, didn't I? Sarah nodded in agreement, especially in times like these. Trust isn't easily given. But we're in this together now. Secrets or no secrets, we've got each other's backs. Asher felt a warmth spread within him. The bond between the trio was growing stronger. All right then, he said, trying to take the helmet from Sarah in which she quickly moved away. Huh? Hey, if your guardian can use items, I should help too, right? Said Sarah as her hand started to glow with a blue light. You mean? Yes. Let's make this helmet better. If we're giving it to him, let's make it useful. To Asher's astonishment, Sarah employed her skill to elevate the helmet's rank from common to magical, infusing it with a magical property. There you go. Thank you. After reading the item's updated description, Asher realized her ability was more versatile than he had previously believed. Chapter 29 The Guardian's New Face A note from First Bite I have been receiving a few comments on several matters, and I am going to quickly address them today. One, the MC is a necromancer, but his minion and abilities don't seem like that at all. Why is that? I get that there's some confusion about this topic. I just want to clear things up. The Animate Guardian skill is a necromancer skill because it summons a specter, which is a type of undead. About the skills being learned right now, we're just at the start of the story. The necromancer skills will start making their appearance when Asher goes back to the tower that also includes the animate guardian skill sets. 2. Why have classes if any skill can be learned from books, and will there be a limit to prevent learning all passive skills from books or boss drops to avoid becoming overpowered? There are exclusive class skill books that some players can learn, while others are available to everyone if they find or buy them. You might be wondering, if that's the case, why isn't Soulful Restoration an exclusive cleric skill? The reason is simple. This skill is the only healing ability available at the shop that any challengers can get in exchange for a large amount of points which most wouldn't even consider purchasing. To compare, cleric or paladin healing abilities are much more powerful than Soulful Restoration and less expansive to purchase and use. You'll see this difference as the story progresses. Skills can be exclusive in more ways than what's just written in their descriptions. Take Liam's explosive shot, for example. It doesn't directly say that he needs a gun, but it's clear that you'd need one to use this skill. The same goes for the Guardian's shield abilities. How can he use his shield charge or shield throw without having a shield? These skills might not spell out which classes can use them, but they definitely show that certain conditions or equipment are needed to make them work. Is there a limit to the number of passive and active skills a player can learn? No, there isn't. The point of the story is for characters to become so incredibly strong that no one can challenge them. However, this won't be an easy or quick process. Do other players have the same advantages as the main character, MC? Yes, they do. This is a system where anyone can become powerful, not just the MC. 
Actually, the MC might be at a disadvantage compared to other players because he have to figure out how to best customize his skills and items for himself and his guardian. For example, in the first 30 chapters, Asher only learns one active skill, a healing ability. Plus, he can't use any offensive skills while his guardian is active. This shows just how challenging the system can be. 3. Is it reasonable for the main character to spend over 1,000 points to enhance his guardian's regeneration from 120% to 130% per minute, despite a significant mana cost and a minimal increase in healing rate, given the guardian's already powerful passive healing ability? I get that things might not seem great right now, but it's important to look at this from different angles. The guardian's passive healing skill only works for him, but the soulful restoration skill works on Asher, the guardian, making his healing even stronger, even if it's just a little bit for now, and it also works on other people like Sarah, Liam, and others as we go on in the story. Plus, this skill is really going to come into its own once Asher gets his subclass after we get past the 10th floor. So, let's just give it a bit more time. For the main character seems to embody the traits of a summoner more than those of a necromancer, lacking the typical skills one would associate with. Why this character development choice? When we talk about the necromancer class, remember these are just my thoughts, and I get that a lot of people might see it differently. A necromancer doesn't just have to be about summoning the undead. I see it as having a wide range of skills. Take Corpse Explosion, for example. It's a necromancer skill that blows up corpses without bringing any undead into the mix. The same goes for bone armor which provides some sort of defense using bones as medium. Then there are all the curses that mess with your enemies, like slowing them down, fearing them, or messing with their minds. I think all these dark art slash skills are part of being a necromancer, even if you're not all about raising the dead. I believe I've covered the main comments and concerns I've been receiving and wanted to clear up. If anything is still unclear or if you need further explanation on any point, please don't hesitate to leave a comment. I'll gather all your questions and address them in a single author's note. Aside from that, enjoy the chapter. Asher examined the helmet intently. From Sarah's explanation, her skill bestowed stats based on various aspects, like the item's type, design, and other factors. Unlike randomly generated enhancements, her ability tailored the best fit for the item in question. Asher pondered if the skill also considered the intended wearer of the helmet. Did it recognize that the Guardian would be the one making use of the helmet? Did it realize that it lacked intelligence or self-awareness? and hence granted it an increase in emotional intelligence? Was the intent to grant it a deeper connection to its surroundings? The more I learn about her skill, the more question I have and the more fascinating it becomes. Asher thought to himself, the emotional intelligence stat seemed a perfect match for the helmet. Although the guardian couldn't speak, Asher wondered if it could communicate using the LED facial expressions the helmet offered. Eager to find out, he fitted the Guardian with the helmet. To his astonishment, the LED lights illuminated, revealing a unique face. The eyes appeared as X's, and the mouth had an eerie design, resembling fangs jetting out in all directions dash, 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 dash. Sarah beamed, that's one way to light up a room. Liam joked, guess he's all set for Halloween. Curious to see if his guardian status window reflected the new facial design from the helmet, Asher quickly opened the guardian's character window to check for any changes. As anticipated, his guardian's appearance adjusted to complement the newly donned helmet. Asher pondered, whenever it puts on a new helmet, the design probably updates in the character status window. Hold on, I'm not in my pajamas anymore. I should check my own status. With that thought, he swiftly accessed his character window. Upon opening his character window, Asher noticed the detailed graphics of his new sportswear outfit, replacing the image of the old, tattered pajamas he was previously wearing. The interface showed a side profile figure of himself. As he had expected, his own character window had also been updated to fit his changed cloth. He smiled, slightly amused at the level of detail the game-like system provided. Sarah, noticing Asher's focus on the window, asked, Anything interesting? 
Just admiring the new look, Asher replied with a smirk. Asher glanced back at his guardian, curious about the extent of its newfound emotional intelligence. Hey buddy, can you speak? In response, the guardian's visor shifted patterns. What was once an annoyed face, expression transformed into a simple, you know. Asher's eyes widened with a mix of amusement and surprise. Really? So you can understand us now? The visor responded with a bright, yes. Sarah laughed, pointing at the helmet. That's so cool. Can you express happiness? The guardian's visor shifted to a pattern resembling a smiley face, smiley face, much to the trio's delight. Liam, always one to prod further, asked, Can you tell us if you're angry? A grumpy facial pattern emerged, angry face, making the group chuckle. Asher, trying to test the limits of this new interaction, inquired, Do you remember the dragon from before? Instead of a yes or no, the guardian's visor showed a neutral, straight-line mouth, straight face, indicating uncertainty or perhaps indifference. Asher pondered, it seems he doesn't recall anything before wearing the helmet. Sarah then suggested, try asking it something it can only answer with a yes or no, to see its range. All right, Asher nodded, can you attack on command? Yes, the visor gleamed. Interesting, Asher mused, looking at his guardian with newfound appreciation. While our communication might be limited, it's definitely a start. Liam agreed. For sure. It's going to be handy having someone, or something, that can respond, even if it's just with yes, no, or an emoticon. I'm enjoying this new feature, it adds a fun twist. Anyway, ready to head to the police station? Exiting the thrift shop, the streets were eerily quiet like usual. Their footsteps echoed in the stillness. Seems like we're still inside of the dragon's territory, Asher mused. The route to the police station, which was once a straightforward path, had become a maze of debris and ruined architecture. Collapsed buildings, overturned vehicles, and the remnants of what once was a bustling city now acted as barriers, forcing them to find alternate routes. Liam and Asher, using their knowledge of the area, navigated the best they could based on the available paths provided to them. But the changes to the landscape made it challenging. Every familiar landmark is either gone or drastically altered. We'll need to be creative in navigating through this, he remarked, frustration evident in his voice. Time seemed to stretch on, and what should have been a twenty-minute journey morphed into hours. However, the determination never wavered. They were grateful for the absence of monsters during their journey. However, all good things eventually come to an end. About an hour after leaving the station, it appeared they had encountered their first adversary outside the dragon's influence. A oh, woo! Well, what is that? Sarah exclaimed. Everyone, stick together. We're not alone out here. Asher warned. There. Liam pointed urgently. The group came to an abrupt halt, their eyes locking onto the creature before them. It resembled a wolf, but this was no ordinary earthly creature. Its back, unlike those of a typical wolf, emerged vertically, resembling sharp blades ready to slice through anything in their path. The air grew tense as the three of them took in the sight, mentally preparing for what might come next. The wolf's eyes flared with fury. With a growl that resonated in within the area, it lunged forward, the blades on its back gleaming with deadly intent. Liam, always prepared, pulled out his handgun from his holster. Asher, meanwhile, gestured to his guardian, who instantly placed himself in front of the trio, his shield at the ready. The wolf, not deterred by their defenses, lunged. Mid-leap, it curled its body, becoming a spinning wheel of blades. It soared through the air, aiming to crash into them with deadly force. Liam fired off several shots. The bullets found their mark, but the creature's large blades deflected most of them. Only one shot seemed to cause it some level of damage, eliciting a pained yelp as it struck near the beast's shoulder. Asher and his guardian stood firm, the guardian's shield absorbing the brunt of the wolf's attack. The shield flickered under the immense pressure but held its form. Asher then signaled the guardian to counterattack. 
The guardian charged forward, using the spikes of its shield as a battering ram, aiming for the wolf's midsection. Sarah, her eyes darting around, looked for a way to assist. She spotted a large rock and, using all her strength, threw it towards the wolf. While it didn't do much damage, it served as a distraction, allowing Liam to reposition and aim for a more vulnerable spot. The wolf, now on the defensive, swung its body, the blades aiming to slice anything in its path. Asher narrowly dodged a swipe, while his guardian deflected another with its shield. Liam, using the brief moment of distraction, aimed and fired directly at one of the wolf's eyes. With a wrenching howl, the creature staggered back, blinded on one side. Asher, seizing the opportunity, directed his guardian to pin the creature down, momentarily incapacitating the wolf. Liam swaggered up cautiously, gun aimed at the beast's head. Hasta la vista, baby, he quipped with a smirk. The wolf, sensing danger from Liam's movements, tensed and bared its massive fangs, growling deeply. Sarah couldn't help but chuckle at Liam's attempt at humor despite the dire situation. Really, Liam? Pop culture references now? Liam just winked, keeping his focus on the creature. I mean, if not now, then when? The helmet on the guardian's head showcased a display of crossed-out eyes, annoyed face, an obvious signal that it was time to end things. Liam swiftly aimed and unleashed a barrage of bullets at the wolf's head, bringing it down instantly. You have participated in the elimination of Bladeback Howler. Experience point earned have been divided by the amount of participants, 3. You have earned 10 EXP. EXP, 20 slash 600. With the wolf now lifeless on the ground, the trio took a moment to catch their breath. That was unexpected, Sarah panted, her eyes darting around the environment, expecting another threat to emerge. The guardian's visor shifted to a pattern resembling a smiley face, smiley face. Asher chuckled, seems like someone enjoyed the action. Asher approached the fallen creature, studying its unique blade-like features with a mix of fascination and horror. It looks like we're not safe from monsters anymore. We have to be on high alert. There's no telling how many are lurking out there. Liam nodded and added, let's keep moving. The sooner we get to the police station, the sooner we can figure out our next move. As the trio resumed their journey, the remains of the city around them served as a grim reminder of the challenges that lay ahead. Chapter 30 Captain Albert A Note from First Bite Enjoy! After defeating the Bladeback Howler, the trio continued their journey towards the police station. Along the way, they spotted several more of these menacing wolves and deftly maneuvered around them, avoiding confrontation. An hour of cautious travel later, they found themselves nearing their destination. Once we turn right, we should see the police station. Don't rush, ensure the coast is clear, advised Liam, who was most familiar with the area, given that he worked at the police station. As they approached the corner that would reveal the police station, they were taken aback by the sight before them. No. Damn it. How can this be? The police station stood mostly unscathed, but that wasn't what alarmed them. Surrounding the building were numerous blade-back howlers, some surveying the vicinity, while others appeared to be resting. Why were all these creatures gathered here? Well, that was because of the most unsettling sight there, a large blue portal at the center of the building, marking the entrance to a dungeon. What's happening? Even the police station's overrun by those creatures. What do we do now? Asher voiced, uncertain of their next move. I don't know Dash. Crack. A sudden noise from behind made Liam whirl around, handgun aimed and ready for any threat. Easy there. You wouldn't shoot your own captain, would you, Officer Smith? An older, bald man in a police uniform, the same as Liam's, stepped forward with a smirk. Sea Captain. Liam's face lit up with recognition, and he hurriedly closed the gap between them. Captain? Asher and Sarah exchanged puzzled glances. The man who stepped forward wore the unmistakable insignia of the police stations. However, what struck Asher the most was the man's advanced age, well beyond the usual retirement years. Each step he took seemed laborious, his limbs frail and shaky. 
The captain's presence in such a dire situation, given his evident physical vulnerability, left Asher deeply puzzled. I'm relieved to see you're okay, Captain. Thud. Quiet down, you fool. Do you want those creatures to find us? The elderly captain reprimanded, giving Liam a light smack on the head with his frail hands. Liam chuckled sheepishly, my apologies, Captain. I was just so happy to see you. What happened to the station? And the others? The captain replied gravely, this isn't the place to discuss this. Follow me. The trio fell and stepped behind the old captain, matching their pace to his deliberate, slow march. After a few minutes, the captain led them to a building that appeared to have weathered the chaos better than its neighbors. Its walls were intact, and the windows were barred, hinting at its possible use as a refuge. The captain approached the entrance and paused momentarily. Then, with surprising agility for his age, he rapped on the door in a peculiar rhythm, three short knocks, a brief pause, two long ones, another pause, and then a single sharp knock. It seemed like a coded message, a secret handshake translated into sound. The group waited with bated breath, wondering who, or what, might answer. The door creaked open to reveal an elderly woman, her face lined with age and eyes sharp with a mixture of concern and relief. The trio exchanged glances, curiosity evident in their expressions. Before they could ponder on her identity, they watched in surprise as the old captain leaned in, giving the woman a gentle kiss on the cheek. Albert! How could you leave me alone for so long? she chided, her voice carrying a blend of worry and affection. The captain gave a rueful smile, I'm sorry, honey. Things just ended up this way. Seeing their interaction, it dawned on the trio that the woman was none other than the captain's wife. The stern, commanding leader had a softer side, one that was devoted to the woman before them. The realization added another layer to the situation and deepened their respect for the elderly man. Oh, you've brought survivors with you. Please, come inside. Can I offer you something to eat or drink? The elderly woman offered warmly, her voice gentle. Let's move inside. We'll talk there, the captain directed. Right away, sir. Liam responded promptly. Thank you for letting us in. Asher said gratefully. We appreciate your hospitality. Sarah added. The old woman turned to Sarah, her eyes taking in the younger woman's appearance. Dear, your hair's in quite a state. It must have been tough out there. Would you like to freshen up with a shower? Sarah's eyes brightened at the suggestion. A shower? Mm -hmm. The warm, inviting interior of the house was a stark contrast to the desolation outside. Soft lamplight illuminated the cozy living area, revealing plush chairs and worn-out couches that told stories of countless family gatherings. Framed photographs adorned the walls, capturing happier times that seemed a world away. The captain's wife moved with surprising agility for her age, leading Sarah to a bathroom equipped with basic needs. You'll find towels in the cupboard. Take your time, dear, she said kindly, leaving Sarah with a grateful smile on her face. In the main room, the captain motioned for Liam and Asher to sit. Asher remarked, it's surprising that your building was affected so slightly when all the others weren't. The old man responded, I share your surprise. Perhaps God showed us some mercy. A sense of urgency clouded his eyes. We don't have much time, he began. The creatures outside are growing in number, and it's only a matter of time before things get worse. Liam leaned forward, eager to grasp the depth of the captain's statement. What do you mean we don't have much time? he asked. The captain paused, choosing his words carefully. My knowledge of the global situation is limited, but this much is clear. The longer that portal remains open, the more creatures will emerge, escalating the threat we face. Officer Carl briefed me on the situation. Officer Carl's here? Oh, what a relief he's safe. Officer Carl? Asher questioned. Yes, he's my mentor. Liam responded with admiration. It's no exaggeration to say he's the one I respect and learn from the most. Asher nodded in understanding. 
The captain interjected, about Officer Carl, he ventured into the portal to halt the creature's emergence. That was five hours ago, accompanied by three other officers. Asher's eyes widened in alarm. Five hours? That's an eternity in there. What if he's in danger? The captain sighed, I share your worry, but it was their call. I couldn't dissuade them. Their objective seemed to be clearing the portal to regain access to the emergency communication line within the station. Liam caught on, so he's trying to establish contact with the higher-ups, possibly even the military. The captain nodded, exactly. And from what Clark shared, before this unexpected catastrophe they had been relocated to this Tower of Awakening. It said that those with certain potential can enter and awaken special powers. Have you experienced this too? Liam responded affirmatively to the captain's inquiry. Indeed, both of us have acquired abilities to combat those monsters. The captain paused, taking a deep breath and gathering his thoughts. I recognize the weight of what I'm about to ask, but will you heed one final request from me as your captain? Liam straightened up, determination evident in his stance. Captain, always. What do you need? The captain's voice quivered with urgency, please, secure the portal and save our officers, if time hasn't run out for them. Liam glanced over at Asher, seeking his thoughts on the captain's request. Asher seemed deep in contemplation for a moment. This seems like our only option. The emergency communication device in the station is our final hope. Asher reflected. He then gave a firm nod of agreement. Seeing the determined nod from both Liam and the affirmation from Asher's, the captain's eyes shimmered with gratitude. Thank you, both of you, he murmured, his voice thick with emotion. Sarah, having returned from her shower, took in the scene. Her damp hair framed her face, and she looked refreshed but concerned. What did I miss? Chapter 31 Lunastone Canyon Asher quickly updating Sarah on the captain's request and their decision to tackle the challenge at the police station. As he recounted the details, her expression turned from curiosity to worried. So we're, I mean, you're heading into the heart of danger, then, she questioned. Asher responded, yes, but it's crucial. If we can get that device working, we might be able to reach out for reinforcements or at least gain a better understanding of the situations. Sarah sighed, running her fingers through her damp hair. I get it. But promise me you'll be careful, okay? We've come this far together. Liam interjected, we'll have each other's backs, like always. Asher and Liam, leaving Sarah in the company of the elderly couple, stealthily made their way back to the corner overlooking the police station. The menacing pack of wolves remained, their eerie presence casting a shadow over the area. Asher took a moment, silently counting. Twenty, he whispered to Liam. Liam frowned, eyes darting around as he assessed the situation. They're all clustered together. That could work to our advantage, he observed. Asher nodded, formulating a plan. Here's what I'm thinking. We use my guardian as bait. It's designed to handle a lot of damage, and it'll draw their attention. We've successfully employed this strategy before. I doubt these wolves possess abilities similar to the zombified wardens, where they could simply resist the taunt. Liam caught on immediately, and while they're distracted, I'll use my explosive shot. With them grouped together, the damage should be significant. Asher continued, exactly. The blast should take out a good number of them. Any that remain, my guardian will handle. Liam loaded his weapon, a grim determination on his face. A foolproof strategy with minimal risk, this is our best shot. Asher placed a reassuring hand on Liam's shoulder. Together, we can do this. Ready? Liam nodded, always. With their strategy in place, the duo got to work. As Asher's guardian advanced, an unexpected feature caught Asher's attention. The moment the Guardian activated the Provoke skill, its icon illuminated on the LED visor, signaling its deployment. Oh, that's a handy visual cue, Asher thought appreciatively. I'm impressed. As the wolves converged on the Guardian, Liam took aim, waiting for the perfect moment. 
when the wolves were tightly packed around the guardian, he unleashed his explosive shot, sending a powerful blast towards the creatures. The explosion lit up the area, and when the smoke cleared, only a few dazed wolves remained, the remaining ones were swiftly dealt with by Asher's guardian using its shield throw skill. Just as before, the skill's icon lit up on the LED visor, providing a clear indication of its activation. You have participated in the elimination of Bladeback Howler. Experience point earned have been divided by the amount of participants, too. You have earned 300 EXP, 20 EXP, 320 slash 600. The duo exchanged a relieved glance, knowing they had cleared a significant obstacle, but also aware that the challenges inside the portal awaited them. As they entered the precinct, they were met with an expected sight. Near the gated entrance where police vehicles typically stationed stood a massive blue portal, its rotation exuding a sinister aura. Oddly, even though Asher and Liam recognized that both portals had the same recommended level of entry, they instinctively felt that the dangers lurking within this blue portal far surpassed those of the white one they had previously encountered. Why is this portal blue, not white like the other one? Liam mused aloud. Asher contemplated for a moment, then replied, If we consider things systematically, just as skills and items have various ranks, portals might be categorized similarly. The white portal is probably a base level, while this blue one is likely a step up in difficulty. We should brace ourselves for heightened challenges within. Liam looked at the blue portal, anxiety evident in his eyes. If it's a step up in difficulty, we should be even more prepared. Asher nodded in agreement. Gathering their resolve, the duo stepped into the portal. A rush of sensations enveloped them, disorienting their senses. When they finally regained their bearings, they found themselves standing under a vast night sky, the moon's radiant glow illuminating their surroundings. You have entered Lunastone Canyon. The landscape was both awe-inspiring and desolate. They were in the midst of a sprawling canyon, surrounded by an endless expanse of rocks and stones. The formations varied, with some resembling peculiar altars. Strikingly, there was no sign of vegetation, no trees, no shrubs, just the cold, hard stone underfoot and the majestic night sky overhead. The air, though clear, carried a hint of metallic scent, perhaps due to the rich mineral deposits in the canyon walls. Every so often, a gentle breeze would carry soft, melodic waves, as if the canyon itself was communicating. Above, the night sky was a canvas of stars, more brilliant and numerous than any they had seen before. The moon, large and luminous, dominated the center, casting a gentle glow on everything below. This moonlight gave the ground a subtle shimmer. On the moon's surface, you could see dark patches, which were its craters. A few wispy clouds drifted by, occasionally passing over the moon and dimming its light momentarily. Overall, the scene was serene and captivating. Something you would not expect from a place filled with bloodthirsty beasts. Beautiful, Liam remarked. A cool breeze rustled his ginger hair, and the radiant moonlight enveloped him, instilling a deep sense of tranquility. Asher, standing beside Liam, took a deep breath, absorbing the crisp air and the peaceful ambience. It's moments like these that make you forget the dangers we're surrounded by, even if just for a moment. Liam nodded, true. But we can't let our guard down. This place, as mesmerizing as it is, is still unfamiliar territory. The duo continued their track, guided by the moon's glow. The path ahead was carved between towering rock formations, leading them to unknown places. As they walked, the echoes of their footsteps were the only sound, amplifying the solitude of the place. Suddenly, a faint growl broke the silence. It grew louder and numerous, turning into a rhythmic chant that seemed to emanate from the depths of the canyon. Asher and Liam exchanged glances, both sensing that they were drawing closer to something significant. The path opened up to a large clearing, at the center of which stood a monolithic stone structure. The monolith that stood before them was imposing, rising from the ground like a sentinel of ancient times. Its surface was smooth, yet on closer inspection, for distinct designs became visible. Each design depicted the head of a wolf, but every representation was unique. The first wolf, 
positioned at the base of the monolith, had a fierce and aggressive demeanor. Its eyes were wide, and its snarling teeth gave it an aura of raw power. Above it, the second wolf had a more serene expression, with eyes half-closed, as if in meditation or deep thought. It conveyed wisdom and introspection. The third wolf, to the side, was depicted in mid-howl, its snout raised to an unseen moan, suggesting communication or a call to the wild. Opposite the third, the final wolf was distinctively robust. Its form was broad and muscular, exuding a sense of strength and endurance. The posture suggested it could bear immense weight, reminiscent of carrying the moon on its back. To Asher and Liam's surprise, they saw shadowy figures moving in sync around the monolith. Among them were five bladed back howlers, and a wolf that looked like it stepped right out of the first design on the stone. This wolf was strong and sleek. It had a muscular body that showed it was both fast and powerful. Its fur was bright, with colors of red, orange, and a touch of gold. It looked like it had been set on fire. The wolf's eyes were bright and determined, like glowing coals. It had a sharp nose, and its ears stood up straight. On its back, there was a blade-like ridge that looked as if it was made from hot lava, highlighting its fiery nature. Chapter 32 The Fall of the Fortified Asher and Liam gazed at the commanding presence of the wolf as it circled the monolith altar. Its fiery demeanor captivated them, leaving them in silent admiration. Observing the fiery wolves beside the less impressive ones, Asher joked, Do you think a firestone would turn the blade back howler into one of those? Liam, intently observing the adversaries ahead, pondered the wolves' unusual behavior around the monolith altar. Typically, wolves circled like this when corralling prey. His question soon found its answer. From behind the altar, a four-legged figure lunged at one of the wolves, attempting to intimidate them. This creature, smaller than the wolves but equally robust, had sleek brown fur and a familiar stance. It was unmistakably a German shepherd dog. Ace! Liam shouted. Without hesitation, he bolted from their hiding spot to aid the canine. H. A. Asher, taken aback by Liam's sudden move, quickly followed him. Is that dog familiar to you? he asked breathlessly. As they charged towards the wolves, Liam, with his gun poised, responded, That's our police dog. Perceiving the wolves' imminent attack on the canine, Liam swiftly fired a shot at the ground between the German shepherd and the blade-back howler, halting its advance. This abrupt intervention drew the attention of all six wolves, including the flame howler. When Liam disturbed their feast, the six wolves immediately lunged at him. However, the familiarity and synergy between the team members shone through. Without hesitation, Liam continued his dash towards the dog, trusting his teammate implicitly. Just as the wolves were about to reach him, Asher's guardian activated his provoke skill, drawing the wolves' attention and diverting them away from Liam's path. As Liam darted past the pack of wolves, he swiftly looked over his shoulder, aiming his gun in the same fluid motion. With a resounding blast, he fired. The bullet detonated upon impact with the flame howler, simultaneously eliminating the surrounding five blade-back howlers. You have participated in the elimination of blade-back howler. Experience point earned have been divided by the amount of participants, too. You have earned 75 EXP, 5 EXP, 395 slash 600. In the midst of the chaos, Liam reached the German shepherd named Ace. Recognizing Liam, Ace barked joyfully but soon let out a mournful howl, turning his gaze to the left. Puzzled by the dog's shift in demeanor, Liam followed Ace's gaze towards the monolith altar. As he moved closer, a figure gradually became visible from behind the altar. To his shock, a severely injured man, marred with burns and slash wounds, lay there, teetering on the brink of consciousness. Carl! Liam exclaimed. Liam immediately knelt beside him, frantically assessing the severity of Carl's injuries and praying he wasn't too late. Carl! Cough, cough. Between labored coughs, Carl weakly responded, L. Liam. Relief washed over Liam. Thank God you're still alive. Asher. He shouted desperately, Carl's here. He's in bad shape. 
Please heal him before it's too late. Asher, hearing Liam's plea, quickly dashed over, his fingers already glowing with a soft light, the sign of the healing skill being prepared. As he approached, Ace, the German shepherd, whimpered and moved closer to Carl, licking the man's face as if trying to provide some comfort. Placing his glowing hand over Carl's wounds, Asher channeled his energy. The soft light grew brighter, enveloping Carl in a warm embrace. The visible burns and gashes on Carl's body began to slowly fade, knitting themselves together. The transformation wasn't instant or drastic, but the progression was evident. Carl's breathing gradually steadied, and the ashen color of his face regained some of its original hue. After a few moments, Carl tried to sit up, groaning slightly from the lingering pain. Easy there, Liam said, helping prop him up. You gave us quite a scare. Woof. Ace barked softly, wagging his tail, clearly relieved to see his companion recovering. Carl, though visibly weak, fixed a solemn gaze on Liam. It's not over, he whispered, his voice carrying an urgency of the situation. Liam and Asher turned their attention to where the flame howler had taken the brunt of Liam's explosive shot. To their astonishment, amidst the settling dust, fiery remnants from the explosion seemed to spiral and get absorbed by the wolf. Instead of seeing a defeated or injured beast, the flame howler stood undeterred. The very flames that were meant to harm it now appeared to rejuvenate it, mending any potential damage. The two watched in disbelief as the creature seemed to harness the explosive energy, using it as a means of healing itself from the physical damage of the explosion. The flame howler, instead of being weakened, seemed more formidable than ever. Its fiery fur now pulsated with an even brighter glow, and its eyes gleamed with renewed vigor. The air around it seemed to shimmer with heat, creating a mirage effect. Liam clenched his gun, feeling the weight of their miscalculation. Seems like fire attacks are out of the question. The flame howler let out a growl that echoed through the canyon, making the stones around them tremble. It began to advance, its steps deliberate and menacing. Ace, sensing the impending danger, barked aggressively, positioning himself between the injured Carl and the approaching threat. As the distance between them and the flame howler closed, the air grew hotter, making it hard to breathe. The creature's eyes locked onto Liam, and a low growl rumbled from its throat. Suddenly, the flame howler crouched low, its muscles coiling with pent-up energy. Without warning, it erupted into a more intense blaze and launched itself forward in a rapid charge. Liam barely had time to react. The flame howler's fiery form was a mere blur, leaving a streak of fire in its wake. Asher quickly yelled, Guardian, intercept. Just as the flame howler was about to collide with Liam, Asher's guardian lunged forward using its shield charge skill, trying to block the attack. The collision was monumental. The ground trembled as the two forces met, creating a shockwave that sent dust and flames flying. Liam, using the momentary distraction, rolled to the side, narrowly avoiding being caught in the direct line of attack. Asher's guardian, though sturdy, was pushed back by the sheer force of the fiery dash. Its shield and armor showed signs of scorch marks. Your guardian is now affected by the burning ailment status. It will suffer a 1% maximum health loss per second for 10 seconds. The flame howler, slightly disoriented from the impact, took a moment to regain its stance. Its fiery eyes darted between Liam, Asher, and the Guardian, calculating its next move. Liam, recognizing the brief moment of vulnerability, didn't hesitate. He aimed his weapon at the momentarily disoriented flame howler and unleashed a barrage of bullets, firing relentlessly until his magazine ran dry. Each bullet whizzed through the air, finding its mark on the beast. But the flame howler, sensing the incoming threat, retaliated with impeccable timing. With a deep inhalation, it unleashed a horrifying roar. A powerful wave of scorching flames burst forth from its maw, meeting the onslaught of bullets head-on. The intense heat instantly incinerated the projectiles, turning them to ash before they could make contact. Liam and Asher eyes widened in disbelief as they watched the barrage of bullets rendered ineffective. The flame howler, with flames still swirling around it from the roar, fixed its gaze on them, its intent clear. 
The brief moment of advantage had been swiftly overturned, and the three of them were once again at a standoff. The flame howler wasted no time. With a low growl, it arched its back, allowing the blade-like structure on its spine to glow brighter than ever. In a mesmerizing display, flames from the blade spread over its entire body, enveloping it. The once fierce creature now looked even more formidable, its entire form radiating with intense heat and energy. Its paws, once just deadly claws, were now sheathed in tangible, blade-like flames, making them look like lethal weapons. Asher, realizing the increased threat, shouted, Careful! It's using some sort of buffing skill. The flame howler, now in its enhanced state, seemed to move with even more purpose. Each step it took left a small blaze behind, and the very air around it shimmered from the heat. It let out a roar, challenging and daring them to make a move. Seeing their hesitation, the flame howler charged at them with newfound ferocity. Asher's guardian swiftly stepped forward, raising its shield in defense. However, as the wolf lunged and slashed with its fiery claws, Asher watched in shock as the molten heat effortlessly pierced through the guardian's once reliable shield, much like a hot knife through butter. Suddenly, the very equipment that had been their steadfast ally, aiding them through countless challenges, was being obliterated before their very eyes. They stood powerless, unable to alter the grim fate unfolding. Your guardian's offhand equipment, Spike Guard Shield, has been destroyed. Chapter 33 Ace Chapter 33 Ace The notification blared in Asher's vision, confirming what he had just witnessed. The destruction of the Spike Guard Shield left a sinking feeling in his stomach. The Spike Guard Shield wasn't just equipment, it was a symbol of their countless battles, their struggles, and their victories. It was a testament to their journey thus far. The close calls, the moments when the shield had been the thin line between life and death, and the relief he felt every time it held firm against an enemy's blow. The realization that this trusted ally was now gone left a bitter sting. It wouldn't be a lie to consider the Guardian and himself being naked in a sense. The shield was its main source of damage and defense. Without it, how would he deal with enemies? In many ways, both he and his guardian felt exposed, like they were without armor. The shield wasn't just for defense, it was their primary weapon too. Now, without it, how would they fend off adversaries? Key skills like shield charge and shield throw were off the table, as they depended on having the shield. And without it, even basic retaliations seemed like a distant hope. The destruction of the shield wasn't just a material loss, but it had shattered his confidence and the rhythm they had established in battle. Asher's gaze darted around, searching for a solution, any alternative to their dire situation. But every strategy he could think of hinged on the Guardian's shield, the now lost centerpiece. Liam, sensing Asher's panic, tried to rally himself for both their sakes. Asher, he began, we've faced tight spots before. Remember the abandoned prison? Asher nodded slowly, recalling their narrow escapes, but his voice betrayed his uncertainty. Those times were different, Liam. The shield, it was more than just equipment. It was our strategy, our edge. Liam sighed, I know, but we can't just give up. We've always found a way. We've got to think, adapt. With an air of satisfaction over its recent destruction, the flame howler, its molten claws dripping with traces of the demolished shield, persisted in its relentless attack on the Guardian. The Guardian, already disadvantaged without its primary defense, without its shield, the Guardian's options were limited. It maneuvered to dodge the incoming swipes of the flame howler. Woof! Ace's sudden bark cut through the tension of the scene. Both Asher and Liam turned instinctively, their eyes following the determined German shepherd. To their astonishment, Ace was leaving Carl's side, charging towards a far corner of the area. Ace! Stay with Carl! Why is he moving? Liam's voice rang with anxiety, fearing Carl might get hurt amidst their clash with the flame howler. In the soft glow of the moonlight, a distinct shield lay ahead. It had a unique translucent sheen. Demonstrating remarkable agility for a dog, Ace grabbed the shield in his jaws and swiftly carried it over, placing it beside Carl. With evident strain, Carl managed to speak between pained breaths, 
Use this. I grabbed this anti-riot shield from the police station before we ended up here. It got yanked from me while I was fighting the wolves. It could be our saving grace. The shield's transparent surface gleamed, brilliantly catching and refracting the moon's rays. Seeing the potential of this newfound protection, hope and gratitude swelled in Asher's eyes as he approached Carl and bent down to claim it. Asher quickly tossed the shield towards his guardian, whom with precision caught it mid-air, fitting it seamlessly into its arm. Avoid its swipes, don't block with the shield. Asher commanded, knowing that direct contact with the flame howler's searing claws might spell disaster and redo the unfortunate situation he experienced prior to receiving the new downgrade. The Guardian, processing the order, readied itself, shifting its weight in preparation to dodge the fiery onslaught that was sure to come. As the flame howler lunged and swiped with its molten claws, the Guardian displayed exceptional dodging capabilities to each attack. The fiery aura around the wolf began to wane with each missed strike, indicating that its enhanced state was temporary and would soon expire. Meanwhile, Liam, capitalizing on the distraction, kept firing round after round at the flame howler. The bullet struck its hide, causing the creature to growl in frustration. Sensing the threat, the wolf's attention shifted from the guardian to Liam. Noticing the change in the flame howler's focus, Asher shouted, Guardian, now! Reacting instantly, the guardian activated its provoke skill, pulling the flame howler's aggression back towards itself. The Guardian braced, ready to continue its evasive maneuvers, buying time for Asher and Liam to strategize their next move. Suddenly, a distinct howl resonated from behind them. It was Ace, the shepherd dog. As his howl reverberated through the canyon, Liam and Asher were caught off guard when a system window appeared in front of them. The message displayed red. Pack mentality has been applied to you and your guardian, increasing the attack and defense of allies the tamed creature fights alongside with by 10%. Blinking in surprise, Asher and Liam turned to see Ace, not cowering or retreating, but actively approaching the fray, ready to aid them in battle. Behind him, Carl, despite his weakened state, managed a small smile, nodding towards them. I took the tamer class, he rasped, pride evident in his voice. Ace isn't just a regular dog anymore. He's my tamed companion. The reassurance in Carl's words bolstered their spirits. Liam couldn't help but smile at the expected advantage provided to them. Suddenly, the demeanor of Aces shifted instantly the moment he arrived in the front. The typical docile shepherd dog now bore an aggressive stance, his teeth bared viciously and its eyes locked on the flame howler. Every once of his being seemed intent on defending his allies. I've triggered Ace's territorial aggression skill. Carl announced, using the altar for support as he laboriously rose to his feet. Territorial aggression? Liam inquired, eyebrows raised in intrigue. Carl clarified, it's a skill that amplifies Ace's aggressiveness when defending a specified territory. Any intruder stepping into his territory will take more damage. Noticing the change, Asher shouted, now's our chance. The flame howler's buff has worn off. Asher's guardian rushed forward, its movement swift and precise. Liam, not missing a beat, started rapidly firing at the flame howler, each shot more accurate than the last. Ace, empowered by his territorial skill, lunged at the beast, biting and tearing with an intensity none had seen from him before. The combined onslaught of Ace's fierce attacks, Liam's relentless gunfire, and the Guardian's charge created a symphony of chaos for the Flame Howler. The beast, overwhelmed and disoriented by the sudden assault, staggered back, its flames dimming as it tried to fend off the relentless trio. The tide of the battle had shifted, and the Flame Howler was now on the defensive. That moment was all the team needed. Liam, capitalizing on the Flame Howler's distraction, unleashed a rapid barrage of bullets, each shot echoing through the canyon. Asher, not missing a beat, commanded his guardian to strike with all its might, both of them having their every blow enhanced by the pack mentality buff. The guardian, with impressive agility from the added movement speed of the shield charge skill, allowed him to deliver a devastating strike. The once mighty beast was now at the mercy of their coordinated assault. 
Ace, fueled by his territorial aggression, lunged at the flame howler, sinking his teeth into any exposed flesh he could find. Each bite seemed to sizzle with an intense heat, but Ace still gnawed at him, making the flame howler howl in pain. The combined assault was overwhelming. With every passing second, the flame howler's movements became slower, its roars less fierce, its fiery aura dimming. Asher, seizing the moment, yelled, now's our chance. Full force. With one final combined effort, the team unleashed a devastating blow, leaving the flame howler defeated and motionless on the ground. You have participated in the elimination of Bladeback Flame Howler. Experience point earned have been divided by the amount of participants, for you have earned 155 EXP. EXP, 550 slash 600. Everyone paused, catching their breath. Liam, leaning heavily against the altar, managed a weary smile. Well done, team, he rasped, his voice filled with exhaustion. The stillness that followed the intense battle was suddenly broken by a brilliant radiance emanating from the fallen flame howler. Its body started to dissolve into particles of red light, lifting off the ground and swirling like a fiery tornado. The particles merged forming a stream of radiant energy that shot directly toward the monolith altar. What's happening? Asher asked, captivated by the mesmerizing display of light. All eyes were fixed on this spectacle, the luminous trail left behind by the flame howler's essence cutting through the night sky like a beacon. As the stream of light reached the monolith, it was absorbed into the stone, targeting one specific design. The wolf that bore the closest resemblance to the flame howler began to glow a deep, vivid red. The intricate patterns of the design seemed to come alive, pulsating with energy. A low hum filled the air, resonating from the monolith. The other three wolf designs, though still dark, seemed to shimmer ever so slightly, as if anticipating their turn. Asher looked at the scene with a certain understanding, he whispered, it's as if the flame howler's essence is fueling the monolith. Liam nodded. It seems we've activated a part of this structure. Each wolf design might represent a guardian we have to overcome. If that's true, then the others might be gone, Carl murmured, his face clouded with sorrow. Gone? What are you implying? said with a worried tone. Carl took a deep breath, his eyes distant as he recalled the events. When we entered this dungeon, there were four of us in total. Since there were three distinct paths leading forward, we decided to split up. The plan was for me to stay back, near the monolith altar, so I could rush to aid any path that needed assistance. He paused, swallowing hard. But soon after we separated, that flame howler emerged from the monolith altar. As it appeared, I heard the terrified screams of my comrades from the other paths. I wanted to rush to their aid, but I was swarmed by those wolves. I couldn't leave or even see what was happening to them. And the rest, well I guess you could make sense of it yourselves, if it weren't for you guys' timely assistance I would have been dead by now. And now, seeing the light traveling to the monolith and illuminating one of the wolf designs. I fear the worst. Asher and Liam exchanged a somber look, the weight of Carl's words settling heavily between them. We can't delay any longer, Liam declared. Let's choose a path and move forward. We'll find our answers there. Asher and Carl were in agreement, but before they could proceed, Ace, Carl's trusted companion, let out a bark that caught their attention. He gently placed a red gemstone on the ground, which bore an uncanny resemblance to the flame howler's face. The stone glowed softly, emanating a warmth that seemed to resonate with the same energy as the beast they had just defeated. Carl, despite his injuries, managed to crouch down to inspect the gemstone. This. It looks like a crystallized heart. Chapter 34 Second Guardian The group studied the gemstone, their faces lighting up with excitement. However, they decided to temporarily set aside their curiosity and focus on the task at hand. Let's safely tuck it away for the moment. We'll distribute the loot evenly among the three of us once we've successfully navigated through the dungeon, Asher suggested, placing the crystallized heart of the flame howler into his pocket, right next to the one they had obtained from the zombified brute back in the abandoned prison dungeon. For now, our priority is to locate the others. 
Time is limited, and we can only hope we're not too late. Which path should we take first? Liam asked, his eyes darting between the three distinct paths before them. Let's start with the left one, Carl suggested, his voice tinged with exhaustion. Carl, it's clear that you're exhausted and wounded, Liam voiced his concern. I think it's in your best interest to remain here where it's safe, at least for the time being. We don't want to risk worsening your condition. Liam, I appreciate your concern, but I'm in a condition to continue now. Carl insisted, his voice steady despite the evident exhaustion etched on his face. Your friend's healing abilities have worked wonders on my injuries. I'm almost back to my full strength. He glanced down at Ace, who sat attentively at his side, eyes filled with determination. Besides, Ace and I are a team. His capabilities are significantly enhanced when I'm nearby. Leaving him to assist you alone wouldn't be as effective. I need to be there to ensure he can provide the maximum support. Woof. Ace straightened up, a resolute expression on his face, as he made it clear he was ready and willing to face whatever challenges lay ahead. Liam and Asher exchanged glances before nodding in agreement. All right, if you're sure you can handle it, we won't stop you. But promise us you'll speak up if things get too tough, okay? Liam stated, concern evident in his tone. Carl nodded, a grateful smile playing on his lips. Without wasting another moment, the group moved towards the left path, their weapons at the ready and their senses heightened. The air grew colder as they progressed, and the walls of the canyon seemed to close in around them, creating a sense of confinement. Ace led the way, his nose to the ground, occasionally stopping to sniff the air. This instincts as a tamed creature proving invaluable in navigating the dungeon. As they walked, they noticed an unusual number of water puddles beginning to appear on their path. Initially dismissive, they soon realized that the puddles were growing in size, becoming more difficult to navigate around. The atmosphere grew tense as the water puddles turned into small pools, and the group carefully picked their way through, trying to keep their footing on the slippery ground. Finally, after navigating through the maze of water, they reached the end of the path. There, lying in a large puddle of water mixed with blood, was one individual. His face was submerged in the water, and his body was covered in numerous scars and wounds, evidence of a brutal struggle. Carl's face fell as he recognized his fallen friend, and he rushed forward, his exhaustion forgotten in the face of loss. No, he whispered, his voice filled with grief. As Carl knelt beside his fallen comrade, Asher's voice cut through the heavy silence, laden with urgency and caution. Carl, this wasn't an accident. Something or someone caused this. We can't afford to let our guard down. Just as he warned, the atmosphere around them shifted, and the water puddles on the ground began to ripple and churn. The group instinctively tightened their grip on their weapons, senses heightened, as they scanned their surroundings for any sign of danger. Suddenly, the stillness was shattered as something, sleek and swift, leapt out of a nearby puddle, water droplets flying in all directions. The creature in question landed gracefully on the ground, a majestic wolf, its eyes locked onto the group with a calm gaze. Its fur, a cascade of shimmering silver and blue, seems to emanate a faint glow. Intricate patterns, reminiscent of flowing water, adorned and intertwining its body. The wolf's eyes, deep and calm, pierced the void with an icy intensity. Etched atop its back, a great sword with a hilt stands tall, its blade glinting with a blue gleam. The wolf's tail, flowing and elegant, mirrors the color of a tranquil ocean. The group immediately fell into defensive stances, their hearts pounding in their chests as they faced this new, unpredictable threat. Ace, with a low growl, positioned himself protectively in front of Carl, his body tense and ready to act at any moment. Stay alert, Liam cautioned, his eyes never leaving the wolf. This creature can use the puddles to move around. Don't let your guard down for a second. The wolf, undeterred by their readiness, let out a low growl, its eyes glinting with a calm ferocity to it. Without wasting a moment, it lunged forward, aiming for Carl. Liam, quick on his feet, shot his weapon at the wolf, but in an instant, it vanished, reappearing behind him through another puddle. The water teleportation ability of the wolf caught them off guard, making it difficult to predict its next move. Watch out! 
Asher shouted, trying to keep track of the wolf's swift movements. The wolf manipulated the water around it, forming sharp, sword-like projections. With a swift movement, it hurled the water swords towards Liam. Reacting just in time, Asher's guardian rushed towards him and raised his shield, deflecting the projectiles, but the force of the impact pushed him back. Carl, fueled by a mix of grief and anger after seeing his fallen comrade, steadied himself and focused. We need to drain the water or avoid the puddles. That's its source of power, he yelled, deducing the wolf's strength source. As the group strategized and moved towards the drier area of the cavern, the water wolf, perceiving their intentions, swiftly retaliated to maintain its advantage. With a fluid motion and utilizing its hydrokinesis, the wolf manipulated the surrounding water, creating barriers and redirecting the flow to ensure the ground remained saturated. Damn it, it's not letting us leave its domain. Liam exclaimed, frustration evident in his voice as he punched at the water barrier, only for it to reform moments later. The wolf, now more agitated, launched a relentless assault. It teleported rapidly between puddles, emerging from one and diving into another, creating a disorienting and unpredictable pattern of attacks. Liam, gritting his teeth in determination, tried to anticipate the wolf's movements, but the constant teleportation and water manipulation made it nearly impossible. We need to find a way to counteract its abilities, he shouted over the roar of the moving water. Ace, sensing the wolf's direction, barked loudly and lunged at the wolf, trying to pin it down and prevent it from using the puddles. But the wolf, agile and slippery, evaded Ace's attacks, leaving splashes of water in its wake. Asher, realizing what just happened, had an idea. Liam, Carl. Ace is our only hope, he yelled, gathering his energy. What do you mean? Asked Carl. Ace can track it. His sense of smell can guide us to where the wolf will appear next. Asher shouted, his eyes lighting up with a spark of hope. Carl nodded, understanding the plan. All right, Ace, it's all on you now, boy. He encouraged the dog, who was already sniffing the air, trying to catch the wolf's scent. The water wolf, realizing that its advantage was diminishing, became more aggressive. It darted between puddles faster, trying to disorient Ace and the team. But Ace, determined and focused, kept his nose to the ground, his ears perked up as he tracked the wolf's movements. Over there. Carl pointed, following Ace's line of sight as the wolf emerged from a puddle. The team quickly turned, ready to attack, but the wolf was faster, diving back into another puddle before they could land a hit. We're close. Keep at it, Ace. Asher encouraged, his heart pounding in his chest as the chase continued. Ace, with a determined growl, continued to track the wolf, his movements swift and precise. The wolf, realizing it was being tracked, tried to throw Ace off by diving into multiple puddles at once, creating ripples and splashes in an attempt to confuse him. But Ace was unyielding. He sniffed the air, his tail wagging as he locked onto the wolf's scent. This way, he barked, signaling the team to follow. As Ace clamped down on the water wolf, Liam quickly seized the opportunity and activated his explosive shot ability. With precise aim and a steady hand, he fired at the wolf, the shot hitting its mark and resulting in a powerful explosion. Water and steam erupted around them, momentarily obscuring their vision. For a brief moment, the team believed they had finally managed to land a hit. However, their celebration was abruptly cut short as, from out of nowhere, a puddle beside them stirred, and the water wolf emerged, lunging straight at Ace with ferocious speed. Before anyone could react, the wolf had struck, sending Ace tumbling across the floor. The team, shocked and confused, quickly regrouped, their eyes wide with realization. We've been tricked. Asher muttered, his gaze fixed on the wolf as it prepared for another attack. It wasn't just teleporting. It can create clones using the water as a medium. Carl clenched his fists, frustration boiling within him. We can't let it use the water. We need to find a way to dry this place out or we're sitting ducks. Chapter 35 The Battle Against the Water Howler The predicament they found themselves in was undeniably complex and perilous. 
the Water Howler exhibited a level of strategy that was markedly superior to that of its counterpart, the Flame Howler. Enclosed by the barrier of water, the group was effectively trapped, unable to escape the wolf's advantageous domain. The Water Howler possessed a myriad of abilities that made it an exceptionally challenging adversary. It could traverse water puddles with unparalleled ease, moving seamlessly and without any constraints. Moreover, it had the capability to create clones of itself using the surrounding water, adding a layer of complexity to the battle. Additionally, it could forge the very element around them into lethal weapons out of water. What made the Water Howler particularly daunting was its balanced combination of agility, strength, and intelligence. It was not just a brute force adversary, it was a thoughtful and calculated opponent, making it all the more difficult to overcome. The team needed to muster all their resources effectively if they hoped to outsmart and defeat this formidable foe. Recognizing the gravity of their situation, Liam, Asher, and Carl quickly convened to formulate a new plan of attack. They understood that conventional strategies were futile against an opponent as versatile and unpredictable as the Water Howler. They needed to think outside the box and come up with a creative solution. We can't keep reacting to its moves. We need to take the initiative and force it to react to us. Liam asserted, his eyes scanning the area for any potential advantage. Right. Let's use its strength against it. Carl agreed, nodding determinedly. If it can create clones, let's find a way to identify the real one and target it directly. Engulfed in contemplation, a moment of clarity struck Asher as he pieced together a critical insight. There must be a limit. It can't possibly use its powers so liberally without facing some form of consequence, he realized. Drawing from his extensive knowledge and experience in gaming, Asher was well aware that the utilization of such a diverse and powerful set of abilities would undoubtedly demand a substantial expenditure of mana. With this in mind, he voiced a strategic suggestion to his allies, we just need to hang in there and stay strong. We don't have to use up all our energy trying to hit it. Our main goal is to last long enough for the wolf to use up all its mana. It's been using its powers nonstop since it first saw us, and it can't keep that up forever. We just need to wait for it to run out of juice, and then we can go in and strike. Hmm, that quite the theory. That sounds quite plausible. It might be our best bet, said Liam. Carl nodded in agreement. Right, let's conserve our energy and focus on avoiding its attacks. Asher's guardian stood at the forefront, his shield raised high and ready to intercept the wolf's attacks. The creature, sensing the group's strategy, unleashed a barrage of blade-like projectiles, aiming to break through their defenses. The guardian swung his shield, blocking the projectiles with precision. However, the water blades were sharper and more powerful than he anticipated. They sliced through the shield, leaving deep gouges in its surface. Despite the damage, the shield held, providing the much-needed protection for the group. The beast was relentless, its movements swift and its attacks precise. They could feel the pressure mounting, but they held on, determined to outlast the creature's onslaught. As the minutes ticked by, the team maintained their resilience, skillfully dodging and defending against the wolf's onslaught. Gradually, they began to discern a pattern in its attacks, allowing them to anticipate and counter some of its moves. The momentum of the battle suddenly shifted, turning to the group's advantage. The Water Howler, previously bursting with energy and aggressiveness, now displayed signs of weariness. Its actions became sluggish, and it attacked less often. The team recognized that their plan was taking effect. The wolf was deliberately rationing its energy, reducing the frequency of its abilities to conserve mana. Asher, observing the wolf's behavior, could see the change in its tactics. It's getting weaker. It's trying to save its energy. We just need to keep up the pressure and not give it any chance to recover. With its energy reserves dwindling, the water howler knew it had to make a decisive move. In a final act of desperation, it summoned all the remaining water in the vicinity, channeling its last bits of mana into a formidable display of power. The air became heavy with moisture as the water coalesced, forming an array of weapon shapes, spears, swords, daggers, and more, all hovering menacingly in the air around the wolf. W what on earth is it planning? 
Liam gasped, his eyes widening at the staggering array of water-formed weapons. It must have caught on that time is not on its side. It's probably burning through every last bit of its remaining mana for a quick, decisive strike. Asher analyzed, quickly grasping the gravity of the situation. The air in the cavern grew tense as the water wolf gathered its remaining energy, causing the water-formed weapons to swirl around it, creating a menacing vortex. The group could feel the pressure and the power emanating from the wolf, and they knew they had to act fast. Brace yourselves! Carl shouted, this is going to be its final attack. Brace ourselves? There's no way we can dodge all those flying weapons, they're practically covering the entire space. Liam protested, his voice laced with panic. Liam, now's the time to use your explosive shot. The blast radius could knock out a bunch of those projectiles and give us some breathing room. Asher quickly instructed, maintaining a calm yet urgent tone. Liam, heeding Asher's advice, quickly steadied his weapon and focused his aim, releasing a powerful explosive shot. The blast echoed through the pathway, creating a shockwave that rippled across the space where the bullet hit one of the forged weapons. A few of the water-formed projectiles were obliterated in the explosion, but due to the small area of effect of the skill and the widespread distribution of the weapons, the impact was minimal. As the dust settled from the explosion's aftermath, the wolf, seizing the moment, propelled the myriad of water weapons towards the group with ferocious speed. The projectiles, now even harder to see through the lingering dust, whizzed through the air, their sharp edges glinting ominously. The group, realizing the gravity of the situation, braced themselves for the impending onslaught. Asher's guardian raised his now battered shield, ready to protect as best as he could, while the others prepared to dodge and deflect the weapons to the best of their abilities. As the barrage of water-formed weapons hurtled towards them at breakneck speed, the guardian, with a steadfast resolve, positioned himself squarely in front of the group. His shield, although somewhat damaged from previous clashes, was held high and firm, ready to bear the brunt of the attack. The rest of the group, recognizing the Guardian's intent, quickly rallied behind him, seeking refuge under the protective expanse of his shield. They pressed close together, aware that even the slightest gap or misstep could result in dire consequences. With bated breath and hearts pounding, they braced themselves as the onslaught of weapons made contact. The sound of impact was deafening as blades and spears hammered against the shield. The Guardian stood unwavering, his strength and determination evident in the way he absorbed each hit, allowing no harm to come to those he was protecting. Amidst the relentless barrage of weaponized water, some of the sharper and more forceful projectiles managed to penetrate the Guardian's shield, leaving visible marks and causing the Guardian to stagger slightly under the impact. Despite the pain and the strain, the Guardian held strong, determined to protect the group until the very end of the attack. As the final projectiles slammed into the shield, the Guardian, battered but not broken, maintained its form, providing the group with the much-needed cover. Seizing this critical moment, Asher, with a commanding tone, instructed the Guardian to launch a shield charge at the now-weakened Water Wolf. Simultaneously, he turned to the rest of the group, his eyes burning with determination, now's our chance. Attack with everything you've got, he shouted. As the Guardian made contact with the Water Wolf, its shield, already compromised from the previous onslaught, shattered upon impact. The fragments of the once sturdy shield scattered in all directions, creating a brief, glittering spectacle in the moonlit environment. Your Guardian's offhand equipment, anti-riot shield, has been destroyed. Despite the loss of its shield, the Guardian's charge had successfully destabilized the wolf, knocking it back, leaving it vulnerable to the group's coordinated attack. The wolf, now completely drained of mana and unable to defend itself, was at the mercy of the group. The group, recognizing the significance of this moment, wasted no time. They struck with precision and determination, their hits finding their mark on the weakened wolf. Each member of the group put forth their utmost effort, channeling their strength into their final attacks. With a series of well-placed strikes and coordinated blows, the group overwhelmed the wolf, their attacks breaking through its body. The wolf, now diminished and weakened, emitted a final, muted howl as it transformed into particles of a luminous blue hue. These particles gracefully navigated through the air, 
converging at the altar of the monolith. Upon reaching their destination, they illuminated one of the wolf engravings in a vibrant blue light, signifying their second victory. You have participated in the elimination of Bladeback Water Howler. Experience points earned have been divided by the number of participants, 4. You have earned 155 EXP. EXP, 705-600. Congratulations for reaching LV.7. You have acquired 5 attribute points. As the luminous blue light gradually faded away, it revealed a gemstone resting gracefully on the ground, nestled within a shallow puddle of water, the very spot where the water howler had stood moments before. The gemstone, glistening with an inner light, appeared to be intricately connected to the essence of the water howler, embodying the power and grace that the creature once possessed. It lay there, a tangible remnant of the battle, waiting to be claimed by the victorious group. Chapter 36 A Strategic Retreat Asher and Liam, still catching their breath from the intense battle, turned their attention to the crystallized heart lying amidst the remnants of the water howler. The crystallized heart, with its mysterious glow, sparked a sense of bewilderment in both of them. They were well aware of the rarity of such drops, but to have them occur consecutively was beyond their expectations. This doesn't seem normal. It's as if the crystallized hearts are meant to drop in this particular area. Asher remarked, his tone laced with suspicion and contemplation. He couldn't help but feel that there was more to these drops than met the eye. I'm not so sure about that, but I definitely won't complain if we get two more from the remaining wolves. Liam replied, trying to maintain a positive outlook despite the lingering doubts. Asher, however, found it hard to shake off his unease. The crystallized hearts, though valuable for their ability to grant new skills, seemed to hold a deeper significance in this area. He felt an intuitive nudge that there was something more profound about them, a hidden layer of meaning yet to be uncovered. Yet, without concrete evidence, he decided not to dwell on these thoughts for too long. The pressing issue at hand was the remaining elite wolves. The group had managed to defeat two, but the victory had come at a great cost. Their resources were depleted, and Asher's guardian's shields, his main defensive and offensive tools, were now rendered useless after the fierce combat against the flame and water howlers. The situation painted a grim picture for the challenges that lay ahead. The remaining elite wolves, presumably possessing their own unique elements and abilities, posed a significant threat. Asher knew that facing them with their current power level and lack of resources was equivalent to walking into the jaws of death. They had been fortunate to clear two elites in one run, but their luck was bound to run out. Asher's tone was firm, and his gaze serious as he addressed the group, emphasizing the gravity of their situation. I think we need to stop our progress here, he declared, his voice carrying a weight of responsibility. Carl, still clutching his fallen comrade tightly, retorted with palpable frustration, What? We can't just give up now. My two other friends are still unaccounted for. We have to find out if they're safe. Liam chimed in, aligning himself with Carl's sentiment. He's right, Asher. We can't abandon them without at least trying to find them. There's a possibility they're still out there. Asher sighed, understanding their concerns, but also aware of the dire straits they were in. I get it, I really do. But look at us. We're battered and barely standing after facing those two wolves. And me? Without a shield, my guardian is incapacitated. I can't protect or attack. We're going into unknown territory, against unknown enemies, with no information about what types of wolves they are or what capabilities they possess. In our current state, death is almost certain. And for what? The slim chance that the others are still alive? We need to face reality here. The likelihood of them being alive is extremely low. Asher's words hung heavily in the air as the reality of their situation settled on each member of the group. The decision to forge ahead or retreat was a heavy one, laden with potential guilt and what-ifs, but Asher's realistic approach highlighted the peril they would put themselves in by proceeding without proper preparation. Carl's face contorted with frustration as he angrily opposed the idea of retreating. We can't just turn our backs on them. We have a duty to at least try and save them. 
What if they're still out there, waiting for help? Asher, understanding Carl's distress but remaining resolute, put his foot down. Carl, I sympathize with your situation, I truly do. But I am not willing to risk my life and the lives of the rest of this group on a mere possibility. The people you're worried about are strangers to me, and the harsh truth is that they are most likely already dead. We barely survived our encounters with the flame and water wolves, and that was with my guardian at full capacity. Right now, we would be going in blind and defenseless against unknown enemies. I'm not willing to lead this group into almost certain death. Carl's shoulders slumped, the fight draining out of him as the reality of their situation sank in. Asher's words, though harsh, were rooted in truth. The group needed to prioritize their own survival. Seeing Carl's defeat, Asher softened his tone. I know it's hard to accept, but we need to be smart about this. We need to regroup, come back stronger and better prepared. That's the only way we can hope to tackle the challenges ahead. How on earth are we going to achieve that? Liam questioned, his voice laced with doubt as he pondered how they could possibly return stronger. I believe our most viable option is to venture back into the Tower of Awakening. Asher proposed cautiously. What? Both Carl and Liam exclaimed in unison, taken aback by Asher's suggestion. They understood that the Tower of Awakening had the potential to significantly enhance their capabilities, but it also carried the risk of fatal consequences. It was no stretch to say that their current survival hinged on their collaborative efforts as a team, drawing strength from each other to overcome the numerous challenges they had encountered. However, within the confines of the tower, they would be isolated, left to rely solely on themselves. But we've still got six days left. Isn't it too soon to be considering that option? Once we leave, we might not be able to return until we've reached the 10th floor, given that the return stone is only available for purchase every five floors. Carl argued, his concern evident. Every five floors? Seems like someone from his community chat provided this information. This was new information for Asher. He had assumed that the return stone would be available for purchase after completing the fifth floor, not realizing that it was only accessible every five floors. This revelation made his earlier suggestion to return to the Tower of Awakening even more perilous and fraught with risk. Look, I get it. This is risky and scary, but it's really our best shot, Asher explained, trying to make his point clear. If we have to get to the tenth floor of the Tower of Awakening to come back stronger, then we'll just have to do it. We'll level up, get better gear and skills, and we can even pick our subclasses. I'm sure by the time we get back here, we'll be way stronger and ready to take on this dungeon. We can't be scared now, we've got to think about getting stronger and beating this thing. Liam rubbed his head, the strain of the situation evident on his face. This is insane. But I get it, Asher. We're backed into a corner here, and we need to take any chance we can get. Carl, still reeling from the earlier discussion, took a deep breath and nodded slowly. I, I'll go with you. I don't want to feel helpless anymore. If this is what it takes to get stronger and make a difference, then I'm in. Asher, relieved to have their support, nodded in determination. All right. Let's head back prepare ourselves as best as we can, and face the Tower of Awakening. We'll come back stronger and ready to face whatever challenges await us. With their decision made, the group made their way out of the dungeon. As they emerged into the daylight, the weight of the dungeon's darkness seemed to lift from their shoulders. Upon reaching Captain Albert's home, they were greeted by the sight of the captain himself, waiting anxiously at the entrance. His eyes lit up with relief and joy as he spotted Carl among the group, but quickly clouded over with sorrow as he realized the others were not with them. Carl! Captain Albert exclaimed, rushing forward to clasp Carl in a tight embrace. Thank God you're safe. I was so worried. Pulling back, he searched Carl's face, his expression turning somber. And the others. Carl's face fell as he shook his head, the weight of the loss hitting him anew. They didn't make it, Captain. We were ambushed by those monsters. They fought bravely, but... Captain Albert closed his eyes, taking a moment to compose himself before nodding solemnly. 
I see. They were good men. They will be missed. Turning to Asher and Liam, he offered a nod of gratitude. Thank you for bringing Carl back safely. I can see that you've all been through hell. Come inside, rest. You're welcome to stay here as long as you need. As they stepped into Captain Albert's home, weary from battle, Asher took a deep breath and spoke up. Captain, we appreciate your hospitality, truly. But we need to decline your offer to stay. We've made a decision. We're heading back to the Tower of Awakening. Captain Albert's eyebrows furrowed in concern, and Sarah exchanged a worried glance with him. Are you sure? You've just come back from a dangerous mission. You need rest, the captain urged. We understand the risks, and we know we need to be in top shape. But time is of the essence. Liam added, his voice steady. The Tower of Awakening can provide us with the strength and resources we need to clear the dungeon. Carl, though silent, nodded in agreement, his expression still sorrowful. Captain Albert sighed. I can't say I'm happy about this decision, but I understand your resolve. Just be careful, all of you. From my understanding, the tower is no less dangerous than the dungeon. Sarah stepped forward, her face etched with worry. Are you really leaving? Promise me, promise all of us, that you'll come back safely. The group nodded, grateful for the captain and Sarah's concern. After a brief rest, as if the system knew of their intention, a holographic window appeared in front of them, asking them to confirm their return towards the Tower of Awakening. Would you like to return to this Tower of Awakening? Six days remaining, yes slash no. Yes. Chapter 37 Back to the Tower Upon confirming his return to the tower, Asher stepped back into the stark white room he had departed from. The pristine walls, the unblemished bed, and the immaculate toilet remained untouched, exactly as he had left them. There was an inexplicable affinity that tethered him to this place. It was as though it had become his sanctuary, a second home where he, oddly enough, felt an inherent sense of belonging. Finally back. Now, what should my next move be before embarking on the sixth trial? Asher was keenly aware of his deficiencies, but above all, he recognized an urgent need for a shield. His guardian hinged on the reliable use of such equipment, yet at this juncture, his spike shield and the temporary anti-riot shield had both met their demise in the dungeon, succumbing to the elemental wolves' onslaught. Confronted with the impending trials, a revelation dawned upon him, the importance of durability in a shield. It wasn't just about defense, a shield's resilience was critical. To constantly replace a shattered shield meant squandering not only his time and effort, but also the points he had so diligently collected, each valuable even in the slightest amount. Thus, he could not afford to be caught in an endless cycle of repair and replacement. With a clear objective in mind, Asher wasted no time. He promptly accessed the tower's store tab and initiated a meticulous search, filtering for a shield that boasted exceptional durability, a shield that wouldn't succumb to the rigorous tests ahead. His criteria were specific. He needed a shield that could weather any storm, one that wouldn't fracture or fail him when he needed it most. Asher carefully browsed through his option, but most of them did not meet his requirement. They did provide great stats and mods to them, but none had the level of resilience and cost he was looking for until his eyes laid into the very thing he was looking for. This is it. The shield had an organic and almost pulsating presence to it. It was not forged of iron or steel, nor crafted by the hands of a master smith. Instead, this was a living entity, a macabre armament formed from what appeared to be flesh. The shield surface was a tapestry of raw muscle, fibers tightly woven in a pattern that seemed to swell with a rhythm mimicking that of a heartbeat. Veins, dark and thick with what one could only assume was blood, converging into a sigil that throbbed with a crimson hue at the shield's center. The border was not of metal, but of what looked like hardened bone, jagged and irregular, giving the impression of a deliberate design. Here and there, what might have been tendons stretched and anchored the fleshy shield to this bony frame. Despite its unsettling composition, the shield radiated an undeniable allure. It promised protection, the sort of defense that could only come from something forged by the underworld. Perfect. 
This is exactly what I've been looking for, and the price is incredibly reasonable. It's only 300 points, and with the 700 points I currently have, that leaves me with a comfortable 400 points remaining for any additional expenses. Your anime guardian has equipped the Sanguine Shield. With the matter of the shield settled swiftly and without any complications, Asher turned his attention to the crystallized hearts he had acquired back on Earth. In his pocket lay three distinct stones, one from a zombified brute and the other two from the elemental howlers of flame and water, respectively. The first stone, a trophy from the brute, was a straightforward choice for him to utilize, having been won by his own efforts. However, the remaining two posed a moral dilemma. They weren't truly his to use at his sole discretion. He had given his word to Liam and Carl that he would abstain from using them until they had collectively cleared the dungeon and had a chance to distribute the loot equitably. Honoring his promise, Asher decided to return the twin howler hearts to his pocket, keeping them secure and untouched. As for the brute's heart, he proceeded to trade it with the shop system, feeling a sense of contentment that he had managed to adhere to his principles, upholding the trust between his companions and himself. Asher opened up to the shop system with the zombified brute's heart in his hand. He placed it in the slot and watched as it disappeared, turning into little bits of light. A grin spread across Asher's face. He had hoped for an ability that would bolster his existing build in the battles to come, and the shop system had granted him just that. Death's caress, he whispered, testing the name on his lips, feeling a sense of satisfaction washing over him. The skills icon depicted a zombie, its form ravaged by time and decay, lying in rest in the arms of Death Incarnate. Death, portrayed as a hooded figure shrouded in an eternal cloak of shadows, cradled the zombie with a sense of possession and eerie tenderness. The zombie's limbs were lax, its battles and hunger for flesh momentarily stilled, as if even in the state of undeath, it sought refuge in the embrace of the ultimate reaper. Death's skeletal hand, a stark contrast to the rotting flesh it held, was positioned protectively over the creature, suggesting not an end, but rather a pause, a moment of respite before the zombie would rise again. To Asher it looked like it was being given a second chance not to live, but to help Death out. The picture made it clear, Death's protection was not a gesture of mercy to prolong the zombie's place among the living. Instead, Death was using the zombie as a helper or an assistant to bring more souls to the underworld. This works great with my guardian. It'll help it stay quick on its feet and take less damage the more it fights. Normally, if you're in a fight for a long time, you'd start to slow down and take more hits, but with this skill, it's the opposite. Every time the Guardian loses a bit of health, it actually gets faster and tougher. And even though a summon doesn't get worn out like we do, it still gets all the benefits from this skill. I'll take it. Your Animate Guardian has learned the passive skill Death's Caress. With the essentials now sorted, Asher found himself with spare moments before the onset of the next trial. Determined to enter the upcoming challenge fully prepared, he decided to allocate the remaining 400 points at his disposal. The necessity of managing his belongings had become increasingly evident. Up until now, he had resorted to stuffing his finds into his pockets or, regrettably, abandoning them where they lay due to his lack of carrying capacity. What Asher needed most was a means to consolidate and transport his gear, an inventory space that could house all his loot. So, he turned to the shop search function and keyed an inventory. The system responded with a solitary option, yet it was precisely tailored to his needs. A sense of satisfaction washed over him as he confirmed the selection, spending his points wisely on this essential skill. After securing the inventory skill for a mere 100 points, Asher glanced at his balance, 300 points remained. It was a good chunk of resources, yet he felt a momentary twinge of indecision. Common items and skills were often underrated but could be remarkably useful, and his recent acquisition had been a testament to that. With the next trial looming, Asher understood that he needed to make the most of every point. His gaze swept over the myriad of glowing options displayed by the shop interface, each promising to enhance his abilities or provide new ones. What he required was something that could tip the scales in his favor, something that resonated with his strategy and complemented his newfound abilities. He considered his fighting style, his guardian's capabilities, and the unknown challenges of the trial ahead. 
Perhaps some form of utility skill that could offer more versatility? Maybe even an offensive asset that could synergize with his guardian's power? With 300 points still at his disposal, Asher's curiosity was piqued by the more specialized selections of the shop. He navigated through the virtual aisles with a practiced ease until he found himself hovering over the tab labeled Necromancer only. This section was specifically tailored to those who, like him, dabbled in the manipulation of life and death. His eyes flickered with anticipation as the list of necromantic treasures populated his screen. Here lay the tools for mastering the shadows, the secrets to commanding the undead. I guess it's time to look for something related to my class. Chapter 38 First Exclusive Class Skill I'm sorry for my absence over the past month. The final weeks of my school semester were incredibly hectic, making it quite challenging to dedicate time to writing. I hope you can understand. But now, I'm back, baby. I'll be returning to my regular posting schedule. Thank you for your patience and hope you enjoy the chapter. Asher was the epitome of efficiency, meticulously sifting through his requirements without a moment's delay. Unconcerned whether his choice fell into the category of skill or equipment, his only criteria was to find an item of substantial value that was related to the necromancer's class, with a cap of 300 points. The array of choices was overwhelmingly vast, with the list seemingly endless, the scroll bar shrinking incrementally, suggesting a near-infinite pool of options. Yet, Asher was not afforded the luxury of eternity to explore every possibility. Resolved to expedite his decision, he was determined to select the first item that piqued his interest and was immediately utilizable. Anything that required a learning curve or preparation was quickly dismissed. He simply could not justify such an indulgence when time was a luxury he did not possess, no matter how exceptional the item might be. Asher proceeded with a clear focus. He skimmed through the list, bypassing items that didn't meet his criteria of immediate use. After skimming through the options swiftly, one or two minutes in, an item caught his eye, sparking the gamer in him. It was the kind of skill that tickled his penchant for strategic planning. Laying eyes on it, it just clicked for him, this was exactly what he needed. It wasn't just appealing, it felt right, fitting into his current strategy like a missing puzzle piece. When one particular item stood out, he didn't second-guess himself, he confirmed it met his needs and was within his point budget, and then he made the purchase. There was no room for regret or wondering about the what-ifs of the unexplored list. Asher was practical and knew that the right tool for the moment was worth more than a potentially perfect one that couldn't be used right away. With the transaction complete, he was ready to make the most of his new acquisition. You have purchased the active skill Necrotic Touch, Magic, for 300 points. Asher, with his discerning gaze, delved deep into the details of this particular skill. He found himself entranced by the particular usage of it, and he knew, without a shadow of a doubt, that it was the perfect match for his guardian. This skill imbued the user's offensive capabilities with the force of necrotic damage, a cryptic affinity traditionally harnessed exclusively by practitioners of the dark arts, also known as necromancers. Much akin to an elementalist endowing their powers with the elemental forces of fire, water, earth, and the like, or a paladin infusing their weapon with divinity, each of these disciplines bore their distinct advantages and drawbacks. For Asher, a practitioner of the necromantic arts, the necrotic touch stood as the conduit bestowing this enchantment upon his guardian's arsenal of offensive abilities. Through this attunement, Asher could convert his physical damage into the energy of necrosis, thereby inflicting additional damage upon the living. Furthermore, an additional advantage inherent to this skill lay in the fact that Asher's guardian, unburdened by the necessity of wielding a weapon, was able to fully channel the potency of the necrotic touch. This enchantment, as expressly indicated, extended its influence over all forms of damage inflicted by the user. Granting Asher's Guardian the ability to imbue both its shield charge and shield throw ability with the entirety of the converted necrotic damage, thus maximizing their offensive potential. Your animated Guardian has learned the necrotic touch ability. This haul is pretty impressive. Just coming back to the tower has boosted my utility, fighting capabilities, and defense quite a bit. With these new abilities and an improved shield, I don't think I'll have any trouble clearing the dungeon when I head back. 
As for the time when I finally get out of here after beating the 10th floor and getting my second class, I'm curious how much stronger I'll be. The 6th floor is about to open. Please prepare yourself to face the 6th part of the trial. Already. Prior to his transportation to the 6th floor, Asher swiftly accessed his character interface, promptly investing his 10 attribute points into vitality. He ensured that all essential preparations were in order before embarking on the 6th floor trial, fully aware that it would present a significantly distinct challenge compared to the preceding 5. You have allocated 10 points into vitality. Vit 30-40 HP 400-500 with his vitality bolstered, Asher felt a renewed sense of confidence as he braced himself for what lay ahead. The anticipation of facing a trial that promised a departure from the familiar terrain of the previous floors fueled his excitement and anxiety. Asher's head began to spin, and his vision blurred, leaving him feeling dizzy and disoriented, a sensation he had become all too familiar with in this tower. Once again, the world around him seemed to warp and change. It was as though he had been abruptly transported to an entirely new territory, distinct from any he had encountered before. Slowly but surely, the haze lifted, and the enigmatic surroundings resolved into a new landscape. He found himself standing on a serene seashore, where golden sands stretched out as far as the eye could see. The gentle waves of seawater lapped at the shore, producing a soothing, rhythmic melody. Overhead, the sun bathed the scene in a warm, inviting glow, while a gentle breeze carried with it the faint scent of salt. Asher took a moment to soak in the beauty of this new environment. The beauty of the place was undeniable, and it left him pondering the purpose behind his sudden transportation to such an exotic place. However, he couldn't afford to be fooled by the allure of beauty alone. His previous experiences on the first three floors served as a stark reminder that appearances could be deceiving. He recalled the lush, sun-dappled forest of the initial levels, where vibrant greenery and colorful blossoms had masked the presence of ferocious creatures such as the goblins and the savage woodland bear, creatures that would not hesitate to pose a deadly threat. With this in mind, Asher remained vigilant, knowing that beneath the surface of this picturesque beach skay, dangers may well lurk, waiting for the right moment to reveal themselves. As Asher stood watchful on the tranquil shore, his patience was soon rewarded as the system prompt materialized before him. It held the key to completing the purpose of this new floor. Trial's objective, kill 50 fishmen. Time limit, none. Failure from completing the trial's death. Reward for completing the trial of random, common magic, skill. The word death displayed by the system prompt shattered any remaining semblance of carefree anticipation that Asher might have held onto. His cautious approach, which had been present since the beginning, now became even more pronounced and poignant. From the sixth floor onward, the stakes were higher than ever before. Failure didn't merely imply a return home and the closure of the tower's door, it now signified an irrevocable termination of his very existence, a point of no return from which there was no escape, no second chance at life. With the gravity of this new reality sinking in and the threat of permanent death hanging over him like a looming storm cloud, casting a shadow over his every move. But Asher knew that he had come too far to back down now. The challenges ahead might be perilous, but he had already faced and conquered obstacles in the previous floors. He couldn't afford to let fear paralyze him. Instead, he needed to channel it into a steely resolve to adapt, strategize, and overcome whatever trials lay in his path. This time, it's fishmen, huh? Asher mused, a wry smile playing on his lips as he considered the challenge ahead. The task of this trial seemed straightforward enough, eliminate fifty fishmen. However, he couldn't help but wonder about the nature of these creatures and what they entailed. Fishmen, Asher surmised, were likely a humanoid species inhabiting this floor. The name suggested an aquatic origin, and he couldn't help but anticipate that they might possess water-related abilities or other traits that would make the task more challenging. Armed with this limited knowledge of the fishmen, Asher steeled himself for the encounter. He couldn't afford to underestimate them, especially considering the heightened consequences of failure on this floor. As he began his exploration of the coastal environment, he kept a watchful eye out for any signs of the elusive fishmen. 
With every step, he reminded himself that each encounter could bring him one step closer to his goal of defeating 50 of them and completing this trial's objective. As Asher continued his cautious trek along the shoreline, a sudden, explosive burst of water erupted from the sea before him. Startled, he instinctively positioned himself behind his guardian. Moments later, a figure emerged from the tumultuous waters, soaring through the air and landing gracefully on the sandy shore right beside him. The newcomer, a being dripping with seawater and bearing an uncanny resemblance to the mysterious fishman he had to fight, stood before Asher. Its amphibious appearance was marked by glistening blue scales, webbed appendages, and a set of viscous large yellow eyes that seemed to hold no semblance of intelligence. Chapter 39 A Test of Power The fishman gazed at Asher with absent yet somehow convincing death glare. It was clear that this creature possessed the intellect of a fish combined with the physique of a man. Its appearance suggested a singular intent to violently confront Asher. What surprised Asher most was that this fishman was ranked as a level 10 normal mod. On Earth, the most formidable foe he had ever encountered was a level 10 boss, specifically the zombified warden. This indicated that the minimum level of the monsters in this trial would be level 10, signifying that those classified as elite or bosses would likely attain levels far surpassing the normal ranked ones. While Asher had managed to handle enemies of higher levels without much trouble, he recognized that as their levels rose, so would their difficulty, since typically, a higher level equated to greater power and a more extensive arsenal of abilities. Thus, Asher realized he couldn't afford to be complacent about the disparity in levels and needed to strategize effectively to overcome his slow leveling progress in the face of the trial's exponentially increasing level with each stage. Even though the fishman was level 10, Asher wasn't scared of it at all. First, it didn't have any weapons, and according to the system prompt, its best attacks were lunging and biting with its sharp teeth, which looked like those of a piranha. I guess you'll be the perfect dummy to test my guardian's new ability, Asher said, clearly excited. He was eager to see how much damage his guardian could do after using his newly acquired necrotic touch skill. The fishman, with unbridled aggression, swiftly attacked Asher. Yet, as if foreseeing this assault, the guardian positioned himself as a wall, his newly acquired shield raised in defense. As the fishman's claw struck and tore into the shield, Asher observed its flesh-like surface being ripped apart, yet also rapidly regenerating. Intrigued, he noticed how the shield's repair seemingly drew health from his guardian as it had described from its item description, but the guardian's natural regenerative capabilities appeared to outpace the loss. This led Asher to ponder, was the shield's repair demand minimal, or was his guardian's healing ability more potent than anticipated? Or, perhaps, was the damage sustained by the shield so trivial that it required only a small amount of the guardian's health for restoration? One thing was clear to Asher, his investment in the shield was well justified. The shield performed exactly as advertised, providing the durability he needed to ascend to higher levels without the risk of it being destroyed. This assurance was crucial, as a compromised shield would leave him dangerously exposed and vulnerable to attack. Having confirmed the effectiveness of the shield, Asher was eager to test Death's caress and ability that would reveal its true potential as his guardian's health dwindled. Curious about its capabilities, Asher instructed his guardian to allow the fishman to attack until its health was reduced to 30%. The guardian, now equipped with a semblance of emotional intelligence, expressed confusion at Asher's command. It conveyed its puzzlement through interrogation marks flashing across its LED visor. Despite this display of concern, the Guardian complied with its master's directive without hesitation. Asher, witnessing his Guardian's expressive response, felt a twinge of uncertainty. Initially, he had commanded the Guardian without hesitation, even if it meant compromising its safety. However, the addition of the LED visor, which afforded the Guardian a degree of emotional expression, complicated matters. It made Asher feel as though he was issuing orders to a sentient being or a comrade, rather than a soulless specter. This thought lingered momentarily before Asher pushed it to the back of his mind, reminding himself that he could always remove the visor, reverting the guardian to its previous, unfeeling state. The transformation in Asher's guardian was swift and remarkable once it reached the health threshold Asher had set. 
At 30% health, a significant shift in its capabilities was evident. The Guardian began to deftly and rapidly dodge the fishman's attacks, its speed astonishingly enhanced. The Death's caress ability provided a clear advantage. For every percent of health lost, the Guardian's movement speed increased by an equivalent percent. This meant that the 70% health deficit translated into a 70% increase in movement speed, a stark contrast to the 11% boost from its shield charge skill. The skill's impact was indeed game-changing, leaving Asher amazed that such a powerful ability was classified merely as magic-ranked. Moreover, Death's Caress also offered a 0.5% damage mitigation for each percent of health lost. This meant that at 30% health, the Guardian was not only faster but also significantly tougher to harm, with a 35% damage mitigation in effect currently. This exponential increase in defense made it increasingly challenging for the fishmen to deplete the Guardian's health further, a strategic advantage that Asher couldn't help but find astonishing. Upon Asher's command, the Guardian activated necrotic touch evidenced by a green aura manifesting around its hands and shield, casting an ominous glow. This was the first time Asher would witness the effect in action, and his expectations were high for an explosive damage output. As the LED visor indicated the activation of necrotic touch, the Guardian immediately employed its shield charge. The combined effects of the 70% increased movement speed from Death's Caress and the 11% boost from Shield Charge turned the Guardian into a blur, moving too swiftly for Asher to visually track. Then, in a sudden burst, there was an explosive sound. Bam! The fishman, who was just a moment ago within striking distance, was propelled across the shore, the impact of the assault proving fatal in a single hit. You have killed the fishman. You have earned 20 EXP. 25 slash 700. Asher's system prompt confirmed the kill. He was astounded. The unexpected velocity had taken the fishmen by surprise, and the transformation of physical damage into necrotic damage, coupled with a 20% increased damage to living creatures, had been devastatingly effective. The key to this overwhelming power lay in the conversion of physical damage to necrotic damage. Likely, the fishman had no defense against necrotic damage, making it much more vulnerable than it would have been against pure physical damage. This strategic combination of speed and damage type had resulted in an attack that was both surprising and overwhelmingly lethal, shaking Asher to his core with its effectiveness. Reeling from the impact of what he had just witnessed, Asher took a moment to process the incredible synergy between his guardian's abilities. The sheer efficiency of necrotic touch combined with the shield charge had exceeded his wildest expectations. The Guardian's rapid movements, now enhanced by Death's caress, had allowed it to strike with such speed and force that the fishman stood no chance. Asher's understanding of his Guardian's abilities deepened significantly from this experience. He recognized that while the extraordinary speed boost from Death's caress was contingent on the Guardian's low health and couldn't be relied upon consistently, the devastating damage output from Necrotic Touch combined with Shield Charge was a more regularly achievable tactic. This revelation about the strategic use of his Guardian skills was indeed a turning point for Asher. It highlighted the necessity of not just knowing each ability in isolation, but understanding how they could be synergistically combined to create more powerful effects. This battle served as a vivid lesson in the art of tactical synergy, showing Asher that the correct pairing of skills could produce outcomes significantly greater than expected. This encounter was more than just a victory in battle, it was a critical learning experience that expanded his tactical thinking. Amazing! Asher's exhilaration was palpable as he admired the lingering effects of the necrotic touch on his guardian. The skill, though briefly activated, had already proven its formidable impact. He regretted not having more enemies at hand to fully exploit its potential during its active duration. Nevertheless, this brief experiment had provided invaluable insights. Now more confident in his guardian's capabilities and the effective use of its skills, Asher was ready to pursue his primary objective with renewed vigor. With a clear strategy in mind, Asher directed his next steps, first course of action, finding more fishmen to farm. Chapter 40 Unexpected Encounter A note from First Bite Enjoy!
Asher's guardian swiftly regained his health, thanks to being healed by soulful restoration and his innate regenerative powers. Now fully rejuvenated, Asher continued his journey along the sandy shoreline, his curiosity piqued by his surroundings. To his right, where the endless waters of the shore stretched, he noticed an environment unlike the typical fishman habitat. Instead, a dense forest dotted with numerous palm trees enticed invitingly. A thought struck him, have I ever really explored the floors I've been transported to? In the past, when Asher was brought to a floor, his sole focus was on completing the given objective as swiftly as possible. Indeed, many of his trials were time-bound, but he realized that the sixth floor's trial, notably absent of any time constraints, offered a unique opportunity. His mind brimmed with curiosity. What lay beyond the objective's area, particularly in that intriguing forest? It brought back memories of the second trial, where he found himself in the territory of the savage woodland bear, sharing the land with creatures like goblins and hobgoblins. Had he ventured further, what other mysteries might he have uncovered? This realization ignited a newfound sense of wonder in Asher. Exploration, a concept so simple yet unexplored, now filled him with excitement. What discoveries awaited him if he chose to venture beyond the area he had been transported to? Should I? I won't lose anything if I do. I'll just explore for a few hours. I'll think of it as a brief detour for gaining a deeper understanding of this mysterious tower. With his curiosity taking over, Asher set off into the unknown, his steps taking him towards the dense, palm-laden forest. The air grew thick with the scent of earth and foliage, a stark contrast to the salty breeze of the shoreline. The sounds of the forest started enveloping him, the distant calls of unknown creatures, the rustle of leaves in the gentle breeze, and the soft crunch of underbrush beneath his feet. As Asher wandered through the forest, he meticulously broke branches along his path, creating a trail to guide him back to the shore. The forest's tranquility was both calming and disconcerting. The chirping of birds and the rustling of leaves were the only sounds that accompanied him. Despite the serenity, he couldn't shake off a sense of unease. The forest seemed devoid of anything noteworthy, uh, but he still felt as if he was being watched. He had ventured quite deep, and the realization dawned on him that he might risk getting lost in this vast wilderness. Moreover, he was conscious of the time constraints imposed by his commitment to return to Earth and rejoin his comrades. The balance between exploration and duty weighed on him. There doesn't seem to be anything here. Let's head back to the shore. Next time, when I don't have any commitment, I'll make sure to explore a floor thoroughly. Asher decided, preparing to retrace his steps. But just as he turned to leave, an abrupt movement from his guardian caught his attention. In a swift, protective gesture, the guardian positioned himself behind Asher, effectively intercepting an incoming attack with its shield. Asher's heart raced as he faced this unforeseen encounter. The figures before him were an unexpected sight, distinct in their appearance from any beings he had previously met. Their skin was a striking shade of blue, reminiscent of the fishmen, yet without scales the fishmen bore. Their hair, a vibrant green, cascaded around them like wild and untamed seaweed. Their attire was a mix of natural elements, animal hides paired with palm leaves and adorned with shells likely scavenged from the seashore. Each held a spear, expertly crafted from wood and stone, a testament to their skill and resourcefulness. It was one such spear that his guardian had just shielded him from. But it was their ears that captivated Asher the most. Elongated and elegantly pointed, they were unmistakable traits of elves. Yet these were no ordinary elves, their aquatic characteristics and proximity to the sea revealed their true identity, sea elves. This discovery filled Asher with a mix of awe and curiosity. Elves in general were beings of legend back on Earth. Their presence here, in this part of the tower's realm, suggested a depth to this world far beyond what Asher had anticipated. This encounter was not just a meeting of different beings, but a bridge to a world and a culture unexplored, a true calling to adventure. One thing's for sure, they aren't classified as monsters in the tower. Asher thought to himself, a realization dawning as he scrutinized them through his inspection skill. The interface feedback was similar to what he received from inspecting humans, suggesting a potential for peaceful interaction. 
However, the spears aimed in his direction cast a shadow of doubt over this possibility. Asterisk, asterisk, one of the elves exclaimed, their tone menacing. Asher, perplexed, couldn't decipher their language, the barrier of communication standing firm between them. Asterisk, asterisk. The elf's voice grew more aggressive, their frustration evident as Asher remained unresponsive, unable to comprehend their words. Sensing the escalating tension, Asher knew he had to convey his peaceful intentions, even without the aid of shared language. Calm down, buddy. I'm no threat to you. Asher spoke gently, his voice laced with calm. He raised his arms in a universal gesture of peace, showing his open palms to signal his lack of weapons and his unwillingness to engage in conflict. As Asher maintained his stance of non-aggression, he noticed the elves unwavering focus on his guardian. Perhaps it was the guardian's LED visor, casting an ominous glow, or the intimidating sight of its floating equipment that kept the elves on edge. Asher realized that while his intentions were peaceful, the appearance of his guardian might be misconstrued as a threat. In a tactical move, Asher commanded his guardian to step back while keeping its shield at the ready. This action was a delicate balance between showing a reduction in perceived threat and maintaining a defensive posture. He wasn't naive enough to completely let down his guard, aware that any sign of vulnerability could be misinterpreted as an opening for an attack. The tension remained palpable as the elves continued to express their apprehension. However, the dynamic suddenly shifted with the unexpected emergence of another elf from behind the group. This individual's approach caused visible surprise among the others, hinting at a significant presence or authority. A heated discussion ensued, but it was clear that this new figure commanded respect. With a single gesture, the other elves lowered their weapons, though their eyes still bore a hint of suspicion towards Asher. This elder elf stood apart, not just in age, but in demeanor and attire. Unlike the warrior-like appearance of the others, he exuded a shamanistic aura. He was cloaked in a hooded robe, meticulously crafted from fine cloth, lending him an air of wisdom and mystique. The most striking feature was the staff he carried, adorned with a luminous blue gem at its center, glowing with an ethereal light. The arrival of this elder suggested a turning point in the encounter. The elder's appearance and the deference shown by the others indicated that he held a significant role within their society, possibly as a leader or a wise figure. His presence and apparent authority brought a sense of order and potential for dialogue. Asher, sensing this shift, waited attentively, hoping that this figure might provide a bridge for communication and understanding between them. As the elderly elf moved closer, his gaze was piercing and analytical, sweeping over Asher as if to discern the very essence of his being. This intense scrutiny was both unsettling and intriguing for Asher, who remained still, unsure of the elder's intentions. When the elder's staff suddenly emitted a bright light, Asher's guardian instinctively moved to protect him, preparing for a possible attack. However, it quickly became evident that this light was not a weapon but something far more extraordinary. It enveloped Asher in a warm glow, and in that moment, a profound sense of understanding washed over him. The light from the elder's staff was a spell, a magical bridge that transcended the barriers of language and misunderstanding. As the light faded, Asher realized he could now understand the elder's words. Can you understand my words, young one? The sea elf elder asked, his voice resonating with a depth of wisdom and age. Chapter 41 Side Quest A Note from First Bite Enjoy! Asher's eyes widened in astonishment as he processed the elder's words, crystal clear in his mind. The surprise was evident on his face as he realized the remarkable nature of the spell cast by the staff. It was a moment of revelation, understanding dawning upon him that he could now communicate with the sea elf elder. Yes, I can understand you. Asher replied, his voice tinged with awe. The realization that they could now converse freely was exhilarating. This magical intervention had bridged a gap that had seemed insurmountable moments ago. The elder elf's eyes twinkled with a hint of satisfaction at Asher's response, a gentle nod acknowledging the success of his spell. It was a wise display of magic, one that spoke volumes about the capabilities and wisdom of the elderly elf. 
The sea elf elder's voice carried a mix of curiosity and caution as he addressed Asher. Good. Now, why did a human make its way so far from their territory? The elder's mention of human territory struck a chord with Asher, casting new light on the nature of the tower and its realms. It suggested that the tower didn't merely create artificial environments, but transported him to different parts of a vast, living world rich in fantasy elements. This revelation opened a floodgate of possibilities and questions. The world he was in now seemed to be a genuine, thriving place, complete with its own ecosystems, inhabitants, and mysteries. It wasn't a simulated reality, but a realm as tangible and complex as Earth. This understanding deepened Asher's curiosity about the tower's function and its connection to these diverse worlds. Asher pondered the implications of this. Were the locations of his previous trials also parts of this expansive world, each with their distinct characteristics and inhabitants? Or were they entirely separate worlds, interconnected through the tower? These questions weighed heavily on him, revealing the tower's operations to be far more intricate than he had initially perceived. Realizing his unique position in this part of the tower, Asher began to understand the guarded reactions of its inhabitants. Perhaps each species, like the sea elves, had their own designated territories, and his presence was an intrusion, an anomaly in their structured world. This could explain the initial hostility and suspicion from the sea elves. Aware of the delicacy of the situation, Asher chose his words with care, aiming to alleviate any concerns the elder might have about his presence. Acknowledging the existence of magic in this world, he decided to craft his story around it, hoping it would resonate with the Sea Elves understanding of their reality. I was traveling when I unwittingly became entangled in a magical trap. Asher began, his tone earnest and unassuming. It seems this trap had the power to teleport me to places unknown, and, as a result, I found myself here, in your territory. He paused for a moment gauging the reactions of the elder and the surrounding elves. I'm lost and unsure of how to return. I have no intention of causing any disturbance in your land. In fact, I seek only guidance on how to leave and continue my journey. Any help you could offer would be greatly appreciated. By framing his arrival as an accident and a consequence of magical forces beyond his control, Asher hoped to elicit empathy and assistance from the elder and his kin. The elder's gaze shifted from Asher to the guardian, the air thick with suspicion. And what, may I ask, is that? Thing, he inquired, gesturing towards Asher's guardian. Asher realized the importance of his response. The concept of necromancy, if it existed in this world, could be perceived very differently, and he didn't want to risk any misunderstandings. He decided on a more straightforward explanation that relied on elements that did not implicate dark arts. This thing, as you refer to it, is a part of my equipment, Asher explained, his tone calm and explanatory. In my travels, I've learned to manipulate my gear through magical means. I can disassemble and control it remotely. It's a technique I developed to create an illusion of having an ally in battle, to intimidate and confuse my enemies. He gestured towards the Guardian, emphasizing his point. It's simply an amalgamation of my belongings, animated by my magic. There's no spirit or independent entity controlling it. It's all me, manipulating it as a strategy in combat or for protection. Asher hoped this explanation would align with the Elder's understanding of magic and enchanted items, a concept likely familiar in a world where magic was a reality. He aimed to dispel any notion of dark or forbidden magic, framing the Guardian as a clever application of his skills and resources. The Elder's eyes remained fixed on Asher, a hint of skepticism lingering in his gaze, but he chose not to press further on the explanation about the Guardian. It seemed he was willing to accept Asher's words, at least for the moment. We can discuss the thing later, the Elder said, shifting the topic. Getting back to Allegra will be a challenge for you. Asher quickly inferred from this statement that Allegra referred to the human territory, adding another piece to the puzzle of this world's geography. The ocean separates us from Allegra, and at this time, it's not possible to traverse it safely, the Elder continued, his tone implying the presence of unseen dangers or obstacles. 
Then, turning his attention back to Asher, the elder's eyes narrowed slightly, appraising him. Are you skilled in combat? he asked. Surprise flickered across Asher's face at the elder's unexpected question about his combat skills. It was a shift in conversation he hadn't anticipated. Gathering his thoughts, he replied, I can hold my own in battle against the right opponents. May I ask why you inquire? The elder's expression turned solemn. If you seek to return to Allegra, you will need our help. And in turn, we require your assistance. Our homes have been usurped by the fishmen. Due to their overwhelming numbers and rapid reproduction, we, the sea elves, find ourselves at a disadvantage. Our long lifespans are accompanied by low birth rates, making it impossible to counter their growing population. We've been forced to flee our ancestral underwater homes. The elder, sensing Asher's hesitation, clarified his request. We do not ask you to reclaim our entire homeland. Our immediate concern is the abundance of fishmen near the shore. If their numbers can be lessened there, we can handle the rest in the depths of the sea ourselves. It's a strategic move to reclaim our territory gradually. He paused, allowing Asher to absorb the scope of the task. Understand that this is not a demand without recompense. We are prepared to offer a fair reward for your assistance. Ding. Side quest has been acquired. Side quest, the sea elves stand. Description, aid the sea elves in reducing the fishmen's presence along the shoreline to help them reclaim their territory. Objective, diminish the fishmen's numbers on the shore. 0 slash 100. Time limit, none. Requirement, must be done in the sixth floor. Reward, the elder's magic staff, improved reputation with the sea elves, additional points at the end of the trial. Failure, decreased reputation with the sea elves. Asher's surprise was evident as a sudden holographic image materialized before him, displaying the elder's request as a formal side quest. The projection, seemingly conjured by the tower system, detailed the task at hand, aid the sea elves in reducing the fishmen's presence along the shoreline to help them reclaim their territory. He stared at the hologram, momentarily taken aback by this unexpected manifestation of his current situation within the framework of the tower system. The quest, now explicitly outlined in digital form, seemed almost surreal. Side quests actually exists? Asher exclaimed, surprised by how little he knew about the tower. The elder then held up his staff, the luminous blue gem at its center casting a gentle glow. This staff, imbued with powerful magic, will be yours should you help us. Its powers are significant and could be of great use to you in your journeys. Asher's gaze lingered on the staff, appreciating its significance as a valuable piece of equipment. The allure was heightened by his current lack of similar items, making the staff not only a potent addition to his arsenal, but also a much-needed asset for his journey. Recognizing the potential benefits and the necessity of forming alliances in this unfamiliar realm, Asher nodded decisively, accepting the quest. I accept your quest to reduce the fishman's presence near the shore. You've accepted the side quest, the sea elves stand. His acceptance was met with a subtle change in the elder's demeanor, a hint of relief mixed with respect. This agreement was more than a simple exchange of services. It was a step towards building a relationship with the sea elves and gaining a powerful ally in this enigmatic world. Chapter 42 Proceeding with the Grind Asher shuffled along the beach, his shoes sinking slightly into the damp sand. His head was buzzing with plans and calculations about that side quest he just snagged the one about thinning out the fishmen population. The goal? A whopping 100 of them. Standing there, Asher started piecing together his game plan. He couldn't just barrel in there, that'd be asking for trouble. No, this needed some real tactical thinking. He muttered to himself, squinting out over the sea, All right, keep your head on straight. You've got a hundred of these slippery guys to handle. It ain't about rushing into battle willy-nilly, it's about being sharp, thinking ahead. He took a good look at the beach around him. Rocks and dips all over the place here, that's something I can work with. Maybe I can get the jump on them, use the land to my advantage. 
With the sea breeze ruffling his hair, a determined spark lit up in Asher's eyes. I've got this in the bag. Tackle him one by one, use the lay of the land, keep my wits about me. This quest isn't just a task, it's a chance to step up, to be more. He started strategizing out loud, his gaze scanning the uneven terrain. Gotta split them up, he thought, if I can get them alone, away from their pack, I'll cut down the risk of being swarmed. Divide and conquer, that's the ticket. Asher's eyes narrowed as he spotted the first group of fishmen emerging from the water. They were an odd bunch, slimy and scaly, with beady eyes that seemed to miss nothing. He crept closer, keeping to the shadows cast by the jagged rocks, his guardian following behind. His strategy was simple but effective, isolate, engage, and retreat before more could join. As the fishmen ventured further away, Asher gave a subtle signal to his guardian. In a swift, calculated move, the guardian lunged forward, engaging the fishmen with a surprise attack. The element of surprise was crucial, and Asher had played it perfectly. The fishmen, caught off guard, let out a startled noise, flailing against the guardian's assault. The moment the fishman reeled from the guardian's initial strike, he knew he had the upper hand. Without missing a beat, he whipped out his shield once again and launched it like a boomerang. The shield whirled through the air, striking the fishman squarely and adding that extra punch to his attack. As the shield returned to his hand, Asher didn't waste a second and order his guardian to finish what he had started. He was on the fishman again, bashing with his shield, each hit precise and powerful. The fishman, still disoriented from the unexpected assault and knockback of the shield charge, couldn't put up much of a fight. Its movements fluid and assured, his shield a blur as he struck again and again. This wasn't their first rodeo with a fishman. Their single interaction allowed them to easily understand the fishman movement and could capitalize on it, using that knowledge to their advantage. The fight, if it could even be called that, was over almost as soon as it began. With a final, decisive strike, knocking the fishman out cold. You have killed the fishman. You have earned 20 EXP. 45 slash 700. Asher stood there, catching his breath, his eyes scanning the horizon for the next wave of fishmen. As more fishmen clambered onto the shore, Asher slipped back into the shadows. He decided to use the environment to his advantage, leading the fishmen into the maze of rocks and cliffs that lined the beach. This would force them to split up, making them easier targets. Asher's strategy evolved as he adapted to the environment and the behavior of the fishmen. He set up multiple ambush points along the shoreline, utilizing the natural terrain to his advantage. Each location was chosen for its strategic value, behind large boulders or within narrow crevices, places where he could remain concealed until the opportune moment. In some instances, Asher himself became the bait. If the fishmen didn't separate on their own, he would intentionally draw their attention, leading them away from his guardian. This tactic allowed his guardian to engage effectively, keeping the numbers manageable while Asher carefully evaded and distracted the enemy. His approach was resourceful and varied. He threw stones to create noise and draw fishmen into his traps. He used higher ground to scout for approaching groups and to plan his next move. In a particularly clever maneuver, Asher utilized the sun's reflection off his guardian's shield, angling it to momentarily blind his adversaries as to make them deviate from their groups. Each encounter was a test of his agility and wit. Asher's tactics kept the fishmen off balance, unable to mount a coordinated response to his guerrilla warfare style. As the sun began to set, casting long shadows across the beach, Asher paused to catch his breath. He tallied his progress, satisfied with the dent he had made in the fishmen's numbers. The task was far from over, but he was proving himself capable and resourceful. EXP 645-700 As Asher took down the 30th additional fishman, he could feel the surge of experience points flowing into him. Despite the relentless pace of the hunt, there was a part of him that appreciated this grind. Each fishman defeated brought him closer to leveling up, narrowing the gap to the floor's level cap. He couldn't help but reflect on the monotony of it all, though. Hours had passed since he began this task, each moment filled with constant movement, strategy, and combat. 
It was a grueling process, both mentally and physically. His muscles ached from the continuous exertion, and his mind felt like it was running on overdrive, constantly calculating the best way to tackle each new wave of enemies. Pushing through his fatigue, Asher remained focused on reaching his objective. He knew the importance of completing the trial's mission, especially since it offered a way out a quick transport back to the lobby if things took a turn for the worse. This was more than just a task. It was his lifeline, his emergency exit. As he moved towards the remaining fishmen, counting down to the completion of his 50th target for the trial's objective task, the atmosphere shifted. The sea, which had been a source of constant fishmen adversaries, now seemed to churn with a new, ominous energy. Suddenly, the water's surface broke in a massive upheaval, and a creature unlike anything Asher had encountered emerged, dwarfing even the largest fishmen he had faced thus far. The beast Asher encountered was a formidable sight, a unique breed of fishmen reminiscent of a catfish, but with distinctly humanoid attributes. Standing upright on two powerful legs, this creature exuded an aura of primal strength and aggression. The twitching whiskers of the creature intrigued Asher. They seemed to give the beast an almost supernatural sense of its surroundings, detecting even the slightest movement or disturbance in the air or water. This meant Asher couldn't rely solely on stealth. This creature was too attuned to its environment. The weapon it wielded, though crude, was clearly effective. The way the creature held it, with a sense of familiarity and ease, indicated that it was no stranger to combat. Asher knew he couldn't underestimate this opponent. Every element of the creature, from its powerful legs to its muscular fins, suggested a being perfectly adapted for both land and sea combat. Asher's heart raced as he took in the sight of this new foe. This was not just another enemy to be dispatched. He knew he had to be cautious to approach this creature with a strategy that matched its size and strength. Asher stared in disbelief at the formidable creature before him. Its appearance was daunting enough, but what truly shocked him was its level. It was the first time he had encountered a creature above level 10. The display of its health points only deepened his astonishment. They were significantly higher than any of the elite mobs he had previously faced, rivaling even those of boss rank monsters, though this creature was not classified as such. The creature's elevated health points indicated that it would be a long, grueling battle. Chapter 43 The Title Clash Observing the creature's timely emergence, it became evident to Asher that the tower was not going to grant him an effortless passage. He had only one more fishman to conquer to achieve the objective of his current floor. Thought, Asher was determined not to leave the trial until he had completed his side quest. However, at this moment, the side quest was the least of his concerns. The formidable catfish before him posed the greatest challenge yet, especially when gauging its strength against the enemy levels he had previously encountered. Despite this, Asher had anticipated that the boss-ranked adversaries he had faced thus far presented a greater threat, even though they were of a lower level than this elite-ranked foe. It seems I have no other choice but to confront it directly, Asher concluded. He realized that the strategies he had used against the normal-ranked fishmen, who tended to cluster in groups, would be ineffective here. Facing this opponent head-on was the only viable option. Fortunately, the silver lining was that his adversary was alone, simplifying the battle for him. However, this did not imply that Asher would recklessly expose himself to the enemy, offering it an opportunity to counterattack. Given that he was still concealed and the creature remained unaware of his presence, an ambush seemed like the most strategic approach at this moment. By launching a surprise attack, he could inflict significant initial damage, thereby enhancing his odds of victory in this confrontation. Asher inhaled deeply, calming his nerves while carefully surveying his environment. The night draped everything in shadows, and the moon's faint glow cast a reassuring light over the scene. The beach's stone walls around him created an ideal setting for a covert approach. He moved with practiced silence as he had done it numerous times thus far, his animated guardian trailing close behind, seamlessly melding into the darkness. His gaze was fixed intently on the catfish that prowled ahead, unwavering in his focus. The creature, with its massive size and thick scales, seemed oblivious to their presence. It moved with a deliberate slowness, suggesting a specific intent or search. This piqued Asher's curiosity, 
What could have drawn such a beast from its aquatic domain? A sudden realization struck him. Could it be responding to the defeat of the numerous fishmen I've encountered so far? Perhaps it emerged from the water to investigate their disappearance. However, Asher quickly shelved this speculation, knowing that conjecture wouldn't aid his current mission. His mind refocused, he turned his attention back. Asher strategically placed his guardian behind a large pillar, taking a moment to assess the distance and angle for his attack. Precision was crucial in this endeavor. His heart raced, fueled by anticipation rather than fear. Once his guardian was ideally positioned for the ambush, Asher swiftly commanded it to infuse his shield with a necrotic touch, comma. The shield began to radiate a ghostly green hue, reminiscent of the netherworld. Had they not been concealed behind a rock, this eerie luminescence would have undoubtedly betrayed the guardian's location to the enemy. With a swift, fluid motion, Asher's guardian leaped from his hiding spot, his shield raised high as he rushed toward the beast while making use of his shield charge skill. The element of surprise was on his side as the creature turned, startled by the sudden attack. The guardian aimed for a vulnerable spot he had identified. Bam! The collision of forces resounded fiercely, reverberating across the open expanse. The Guardian's shield, pulsating with necrotic energy, hit its mark effectively. The massive creature recoiled in agony, momentarily disoriented by the shield-charged powerful knockback effect. It stumbled backward, but this was far from a decisive victory, the beast was still far from defeated. Regaining its composure with astonishing swiftness, the catfish unleashed a roar that seemed to shake the very foundations of the sea. The roar's intensity was such that it created ripples on the water's surface, emanating outward from the epicenter of its powerful vocalization. Whiskatus, the marauder has used, lethargic bellow, you and your guardian has been affected by the status debuff, sluggish, for 15 seconds. Asher was caught off guard when he realized that the roar from the fishman was not merely an expression of frustration, but a skill that inflicted a status debuff he had never encountered before. The notification alerting him of the debuff brought with it an overwhelming sense of pressure. He felt his movements becoming sluggish, as if an invisible force was restraining him, and his stamina seemed to drain away at regular intervals. Eager for understanding, Asher quickly glanced at the information about the status effect that was shown right below his health bar. Sluggish. Sluggish decreases movement speed by 10%, increasing by 0.5% every second the effect is remained active. The details that appeared were startling. The debuff was significantly more debilitating for his guardian than he had anticipated. It initially reduced their movement speed by 10%, and this reduction was set to become more severe over time, increasing by 0.5% every second the effect remained active. This progressive slowdown posed a significant tactical challenge, as it not only hindered their immediate maneuverability, but also threatened to increasingly impair their ability to dodge attacks or position themselves effectively in the ongoing battle. It was a strategic move by the creature, targeting not just the physical prowess, but also the very essence of their combat capabilities. While Asher remained relatively unscathed in his hidden position, the situation was starkly different for his guardian. The Guardian, a being whose combat effectiveness relied heavily on agility, was visibly suffering from the debilitating effects of the sluggish status debuff. This reduction in movement speed posed a significant disadvantage, particularly in a confrontation that demanded quick reflexes and swift maneuvering. With the debuff taking its toll on them, the catfish seized its opportunity to escalate the assault. Clutching a large spear, the beast moved with a surprising agility that belied its massive size. The spear, an extension of its formidable presence, glinted menacingly in the dim moonlight. Realizing the heightened danger, the guardian braced himself. The catfish charged forward, its spear slicing through the air with lethal precision. The thrust was aimed with calculated intent, forcing the guardian to rely on his shield to diminish the damage. The situation was precarious. The debuff had not only slowed him down, but also made each movement a struggle against an invisible force. As the spear lunged towards his guardian, Asher witnessed an astonishing transformation. A swirling vortex of water began to envelop the fishman's weapon, reshaping it right before his eyes. The spearhead, initially formidable in its own right, 
morphed into something far more daunting, a massive, water-formed spearhead that seemed to harness the very essence of the sea on the tip of the enemy weapon. The spear, now augmented with the power of water, presented a greater threat than before. Caught off guard and with no time to react appropriately, the Guardian had no option but to rely on its sturdy shield for protection. However, what happened next was beyond Asher's expectations. As the water-formed spear struck the shield, it cut through it with alarming ease, as if the shield were made of brittle, rusted wood. The sharp, water-crafted spearhead sliced through the defense as though it were insubstantial. The fishman's ability clearly possessed penetrative attributes that rendered traditional defenses ineffective. In that critical moment, his guardian's shield was proven utterly useless against this new form of attack. The fishman's spear, with its water-formed enhancement, wasn't just a physical threat, but also a magical one, capable of bypassing conventional physical protective measures. The attack dealt a substantial blow, inflicting nearly 100 points of damage to Asher's guardian. The once formidable shield was now severed in two. However, Asher had anticipated such scenarios when he chose this particular shield. Its unique ability to self-repair by drawing upon the user's own health points made it invaluable in dire situations like this. Activating the shield's regenerative ability, Asher watched as an extraordinary process unfolded. The edges of the shield, adorned with what appeared to be living flesh, began to stretch out. These flesh-like tendrils reached out like tentacles, straining towards each other with a singular purpose. It was a surreal sight, reminiscent of two separate organisms striving to become whole again. As the tendrils made contact, they began to fuse, seamlessly knitting the shield back into a single entity. It was as if the shield had a life of its own, guided by an innate desire to repair and protect. The process was not only a visual spectacle, but also a strategic advantage, allowing Asher and his guardian to quickly regain their defensive capabilities. Well, that's one way to avoid a repair bills. Aware of the health points sacrificed for this restoration, acknowledged the trade-off. Turning his attention to his guardian's health points, he quickly reassessed the situation. His eyes widened slightly in realization. It cost him a 100 points of health, he exclaimed, a hint of surprise in his voice. This was a significant amount, yet in the grand scheme of things, it was a price worth paying for maintaining their defensive edge in this intense battle. While recalibrating his strategy, Asher observed a significant change in the fishman's weapon. The water that had previously enveloped and enhanced the spear began to dissipate, trickling down to the ground as if it had never been part of the weapon. This observation was crucial. Looks like that skill is a one-time use, not a continuous buff, Asher noted to himself. The realization that the water augmentation of the spear was temporary, not permanent, shifted his tactics. I need to act fast, before it has a chance to use it again, he thought. Chapter 44, Sixth Trial Completed Asher didn't waste any time while the fishman's skill was on cooldown. He moved quietly towards his guardian while weaving through rocks to do so and signaled it to come closer without making any noise that might alert the fishman. Once they were together, Asher used his healing skill to help his guardian recover some of the lost health. It wasn't a lot, but every bit helped. The guardian's health started to go up. It went from 300 horsepower to almost 400 as the healing spell did its work and the guardian's natural health regeneration kicked in too. This was good news for them, as it meant the Guardian was still resilient enough to face whatever the fishman threw at them next. With his Guardian's health partially restored, Asher knew it was time to take the offensive. He gave his Guardian a nod, signaling that it was time to act. The fishman, still in the cooldown phase of its powerful skills, seemed momentarily less menacing. However, Asher knew better than to underestimate his opponent. He approached cautiously, eyes keenly observing any sign of the fishman's next move. As his guardian closed in, it brandished its spear once again, now devoid of its watery augmentation. It started swinging its spear. It seemed intent on inflicting as much damage as possible and keeping him away, almost as if it was trying to buy itself some time. Despite its large size, the fishman moved quickly, but its actions were predictable, lacking the element of surprise. 
Each swing of the fisherman's spear was met with the guardian's shield, expertly positioned to deflect the attacks. The guardian's movements were precise, turning what could have been damaging blows into harmless deflections. In a decisive move, the guardian parried the fisherman's spear with such force that it sent the weapon flying upwards, momentarily staggering the creature and creating a crucial window of opportunity. Without missing a beat, the guardian swiftly stepped back and, leveraging its shield throw skill, hurled the shield towards the fishman. The shield, empowered with the necrotic touch buff, glowed ominously as it sliced through the air like a comet, heading straight for its target. The fishman, caught off guard and unable to dodge, was struck squarely in the forehead by the incoming shield. The impact caused it to lose its balance, staggering backward. Despite its large size and weight lending it resilience, the hit visibly shook the creature. As the shield ricocheted back towards its owner, the guardian was already in motion for a follow-up attack. Taking advantage of the fishman's disoriented state, the guardian executed a shield charge with increased speed and ferocity thanks to the death caress effect amplifying its abilities due to its less-than-full health. The Guardian closed the distance rapidly, and with a powerful surge, rammed its shield into the fishman's torso. The force of the impact was tremendous. The fishman, already off balance from the shield throw, was unable to withstand the added pressure. It was pushed back further, finally losing its footing and collapsing to the ground with a heavy thud. This combination of skillful parry, precise shield throw, and relentless shield charge effectively neutralized the fishman's threat. With the formidable fishman now grounded, Asher knew that they had to finish this quickly, seizing the opportunity for a decisive blow. Without hesitation, the Guardian pounced on the downed creature. The Guardian, armed with its shield, began to relentlessly smash it down onto the fishman. Each strike was a testament of the urgency of their situation. The sound of the shield repeatedly hitting the fishman echoed through the area, a rhythmic yet forceful sound. The fishman, already weakened from the previous onslaught, could do little to defend itself against this aggressive barrage. Its attempts to ward off the attacks were feeble and ineffective as it was pinned down by the guardian. The fishman, in a display of sheer willpower and resilience, began to resist the guardian's onslaught with a frenzied effort. Despite its weakened state, it summoned every ounce of strength it had left to fight back. With great effort, it managed to push the guardian away, momentarily freeing itself from the unrelenting attacks. However, this act of defiance took its toll on the fishman. The time and energy expended in pushing the guardian away were significant. This delay proved to be costly, as it allowed the guardian's cooldowns to reset, setting the stage for a repeat of the effective combat pattern. As the fishman struggled to rise, barely making it halfway to its feet, the guardian, recovering quickly from being pushed, seized the moment. With precise timing, it launched its shield throw skill once again. The shield, like a boomerang, flew through the air and struck the fishman, halting its attempt to stand and sending it staggering back into a vulnerable position. Before the fishman could recover from this new blow, the guardian charged forward, using its shield charge skill with decisive force for a second time. The impact of the charge pushed the fishman back down to the ground, thwarting its efforts to get back up. Once again in control, the Guardian resumed its previous tactic of smashing its shield into the fishman's face. Each strike was delivered with calculated brutality, ensuring that the fishman could not mount another resistance. From the sidelines, Asher watched this display of combat efficiency and raw power. He couldn't help but be in awe of his Guardian's prowess as this act of his wasn't one he had commanded. Could this be a result of the helmet's emotional intelligence effect? Asher pondered. The Guardian displayed an unprecedented level of adaptability and strategy in combat, autonomously executing tactics. This level of independent decision-making was a new development, suggesting a significant enhancement in its cognitive capabilities, possibly linked to the helmet's influence. The Guardian maintained its relentless assault, each strike methodical and unyielding, until the fishman's resistance was completely shattered. The creature lay there defeated, its face marred by blood. Asher's display flashed with a triumphant notification. You have killed Whiskertus, the marauder. You have earned 300 EXP. 275-800. 
Congratulations for reaching LV.8. You have acquired five attribute points. As he was savoring this feeling, something caught his eye near the defeated fishman. There, lying beside the fallen creature, was its weapon, the spear. It lay there almost invitingly, as if beckoning Asher to claim it. He approached it, his curiosity piqued. The weapon, despite being used by an enemy, held a certain allure. Asher remembered a key rule of the tower, items found within, even those equipped by enemies, could be claimed. Unlike crystallized hearts and other loot that might materialize after defeating an enemy, there were no restrictions on utilizing the equipment they left behind. He reached out and picked up the spear. It felt heavy and powerful in his hands, though worthless in his hands. As Asher was trying to examine the spear closely, noting its craftsmanship and the potential it held, the system prompt appeared indicating the completion of his trial objective. You have completed this trial of awakening sixth trial. You have earned 600 points for clearing the sixth trial. For clearing the sixth floor of the trial, you will be rewarded with a random, common magic, skill. Congratulations. You have been rewarded with agony, magic. Upon seeing the notification, Asher's eyes widened in intrigue. The name itself evoked a sense of ominous power, suggesting a skill that was both formidable and potentially dark in nature. Agony, huh? Asher mused aloud, a hint of curiosity in his voice. He pondered what capabilities a skill with such a name could possess. Could it be a type of damage overtime spell? Perhaps it inflicts continuous pain on its target. Hopefully not. Since I can't use offensive abilities, he hypothesized, envisioning a spell that slowly saps the strength and health of its enemies. Or, he considered, agony might be more defensive, a skill that reflects pain back onto those who attack him, turning their own aggression against them. The possibilities were intriguing, and the very thought of having such a tool at his disposal filled him with a mix of excitement and caution. With the acquisition of the spear and the newly gained skill, his excitement was palpable, he couldn't wait to explore this new development. First, he turned his attention to the spear, keen on understanding its properties and potential, hoping it could offer him strength in his journey. Chapter 45 River Reeve and Agony Asher picked up the spear, turning it over in his hands to get a good look at it. This is quite heavy, he remarked, struggling to lift it based on his tone. The spear had a rustic yet menacing appearance. Its shaft was a dark, sturdy wood, wrapped in places with what seemed to be withered leather strips, giving it a rugged grip. Protruding from the sides of the shaft were sharp bones, likely meant to intimidate the adversaries that would come in contact with this weapon. The spearhead itself was of impressive size. It was a large, asymmetrical flint blade, almost leaf-shaped, with a viciously sharp edge, a stark contrast to the primitive or tribal look of the shaft. The blade was attached with more of the leather-like material, wound tightly to hold it securely in place. It looks ancient but deadly effective, though I doubt I would be able to make use of it based on how heavy it is to wield. Asher concluded, Whoever made this knew a thing or two about weapon making with the most basic of materials. It's not just for show. Asher looked through the stats of the spear on his display, his eyebrows arching in response to the information presented. Not bad at all, he whistled softly, impressed by the capabilities of the weapon. A magic rank with a decent attack damage, and that bonus damage to sea creatures could have been really handy in this fight. Then, his gaze landed on the strength requirement. Twenty strength, huh, he said, a bit deflated. This was his first time encountering an item that required specific stats to be filled. He gave the spear a few experimental swings, feeling its weight and balance. It was clear the weapon was designed for someone with significant physical strength. It figures. Asher sighed, holding the spear out and feeling its heft. This thing is too heavy for me to wield effectively. The realization that he lacked the necessary strength to use the spear was disappointing, but Asher was not one to dwell on setbacks. But then, an idea sparked in Asher's mind. What if my guardian could bypass the strength requirement, he thought, his spirits lifting with this possibility. His guardian, perhaps wasn't bound by the same limitations as he was. 
Asher approached his guardian, spear in hand. Let's see if you can make use of this, he said, attempting to equip the spear onto his steadfast companion. But as he tried to do so, his guardian visor displayed a sudden icon displaying his inability to equip the item, X. And then as to provide more context, a system notification abruptly materialized in front of Asher. Unable to equip River Reaver due to limitation of two-handed weapon types. Current offhand sanguine shield equipped. Two-handed weapons require both equipment slots. Asher stared at the message, frowning his brow. It made sense, but he had been so caught up in the excitement of the new weapon that he hadn't considered the Guardian's current equipment setup. Right, he muttered, the shield. His Guardian was still clutching the shield that had been integral to their victory. The rules were clear, as long as the Guardian wielded an offhand item, it wouldn't be possible to equip a two-handed weapon like the spear. A moment of silence passed as he processed this information. Then, with a shrug, Asher said, Guess we're both out of luck for now. He patted the guardian's head, a silent thanks for its efforts, and stowed the spear in his inventory. He couldn't help but smile at the foresight of his recent purchase. Glad I got that inventory skill, he said with a hint of satisfaction. It's already proving its worth. We'll figure out what to do with this item later. For now, let's see what this agony skill is all about. Asher gazed at the skill icon for agony, the image was haunting. A ghoul-like visage, set against the backdrop of what seemed like magic patterns, giving it an almost ethereal quality. From the open mouth and eye sockets, there were wisps or drips that cascaded downwards, suggesting a leaking away of power and essence. Asher's eyes scanned the description, absorbing every detail. So it's a curse that slows enemies down and weakens their attacks, he murmured to himself. The tactical implications of such a skill were vast. It could change the tide of a battle, giving him and his guardian the upper hand by crippling their opponent's effectiveness. Then something else caught his eye, causing his eyebrows to lift in surprise. Necromancer exclusive, it says. I had no idea the system would grant class-specific skills as rewards. The skill agony not only expanded his combat strategy, but also hinted at the depth and complexity of the system governing his progression within the tower. Asher allowed himself a moment to ponder the possibilities. This means the rewards are tailored, maybe even personalized to some extent. The system isn't just throwing random skills at us as it implied in the reward text, but rather at a random reward based on the best suitable options. There's a method to it. Meaning that whichever skill the system provides me will be something I can make use of based on my current skills set, he thought, a strategic gleam in his eye. Would you like to learn agony, magic, yes slash no? The system's prompt hovered before Asher, should he assimilate agony himself or allocate it to his guardian? The choice seemed clear to him. As the lead strategist and the support within his composition, the skill was tailor-made for his role. Assigning it to his guardian would be an inefficient use of the skill's potential, burdening his companion with abilities that lay outside its primary function. Asher understood the delicate balance of skill acquisition. While there was the freedom to learn a multitude of skills, overloading oneself could dilute effectiveness. Specialization was key. It was essential to hone a particular set of skills to their utmost potential. The old saying rang true, jack of all trades, master of none. An adept necromancer cluttering their repertoire with unsuitable skills would be as out of place as a mage on the front lines, brandishing a sword. It was a strategic misstep that could lead to a disadvantageous outcome. Therefore, Asher chose to learn agony for himself, ensuring it augmented his role rather than detracted from it. He pictured a mage, not out of place and struggling in melee, but commanding his guardian from a distance. That was the image he aspired to, and with this new ability, he was one step closer. Congratulations. You have learned, Agony, magic. Now, I'm truly evolving into a my supporter role in the composition I've made. I own a healing ability to mend wounds, a porter ability for swift inventory management, and with Agony, I add a debilitating skill to my arsenal. Asher reflected. What am I missing now? 
I guess I wouldn't be against a defensive skill that boosts my resilience and that of my guardian, or even a movement skill to escape danger, he pondered, considering the balance of his abilities. His contemplation was interrupted by the system's prompt. Having completed the sixth trial, do you wish to remain in the floor in order to acquire additional EXP, achievement points, or complete unfinished quests? Yes slash no. Asher made his choice quite quickly as he had already made his decision long ago. Yes, I'll stay, he voiced out. There's still a side quest I need to wrap up here. He understood the importance of completing every task available to ensure he was as prepared as possible for the challenges ahead. The side quest, though secondary to the main objective of the floor, was an opportunity for additional growth. It could provide him with more experience, additional items, or even unlock further secrets of the tower, benefits that could be invaluable in the long run. Chapter 46 Aqua Vitae Capsule Asher looked through the holographic interface that projected in front of him, checking the progress of his side quest. Let's see, halfway done already, he murmured, pleasantly surprised. The completion bar for the side quest was filled to the midpoint. He tapped on the quest details, expanding the information. Fifty more fishmen, huh? Asher spoke aloud, considering his next move. The solitude surrounding him allowed him the comfort of thinking out loud without the concern of prying ears. That's manageable, especially now with agony in my arsenal. The side quest, a seemingly simple extermination task, had turned into a more significant task. It wasn't just about the numbers, each fishman defeated was another piece of experience, another step toward greater mastery, and the reward of the side quest was also one of those steps. I've got the sixth floor objective completed, and that's given me a good push on this side quest. Asher reasoned, scrolling through the list of completed tasks. Fifty more, that means I need to find their gatherings, or maybe there's a spawning ground around here somewhere. Affirming his target, Asher felt a surge of urgency. Rest was a luxury he could not afford, not when he was this close to completing the side quest and his companion back on Earth were waiting for them. With a clear goal in mind, he decided to press on and finish the task immediately. However, the shores, once teeming with his aquatic adversaries, now lay eerily silent and devoid of their presence. As he traversed the shoreline, his shoes sinking slightly into the wet sand, Asher's sharp eyes scanned the environment. Curious, he said, not a single one in sight. The absence of fishmen was as conspicuous as it was sudden, a stark contrast to the plentiful encounters he had faced earlier. A thought clicked into place in his mind, forming a theory. Whiskertus, the marauder, he wasn't just another enemy. He was a scout, a strong one at that. Asher realized, piecing together the events, and his failure to return would have certainly raised alarms. He paused, looking out over the waters, where the reflections of the moon danced across the surface. They're on high alert now. They know something's wrong here at the shore. They must be regrouping, reassessing their strategy, he deduced. This new understanding presented a challenge, but also an opportunity. If they're lying low, they might be gathered somewhere nearby, possibly planning their next move. That's where I'll find them. Asher concluded. Asher's steps followed the curve of the shore, his eyes sweeping the terrain for any sign of the fishmen. The hush of the waves against the sand provided a rhythmic backdrop to his focused search. He knew better than to expect the fishmen to make an appearance so openly after the loss of Whiskertus and the numerous other fishmen. They were cunning creatures, and this sudden disappearance suggested a strategic retreat rather than a full-on flight. As he patrolled the edge of the water, the first light of dawn began to seep into the sky, the darkness receding. The rising sun painted the horizon with strokes of amber and gold, and it was against this light that Asher noticed an anomaly. There, some distance from the shore, was a small island. It stood alone in the vast expanse of water, an isolated clump of land that seemed too singular to be a mere feature of the landscape. Suspicious, he muttered to himself, squinting against the growing light to get a better look. The island was an irregularity that beckoned for investigation. Could that be their stronghold, he pondered, considering the likelihood of the fishmen using it as a base or a gathering point. He weighed his options. 
Swimming could be dangerous, but if the fishmen were indeed using the island, it was a risk he had to take. The reward of completing the side quest and potentially uncovering more secrets far outweighed the risk. Asher stood at the water's edge, the sea stretching out before him. He considered the swim, the island beckoning him from afar, but his instincts held him back. No, he said firmly. It's too risky. There's no telling what lies beneath these waters, or if the fishmen have set traps for infiltrators. Turning his back to the sea, he decided on a safer, more strategic approach. The sea elves, he thought out loud. They'll have insight, perhaps even a solution. These waters once used to be their homes. With the island etched in his mind as a place of interest, he made his way back into the dense foliage of the jungle, seeking the sea elves who called this part of the floor their home. The jungle was alive with the sounds of the morning, birds singing, leaves rustling, and the distant sound of the ocean waves. Asher moved with purpose, his eyes alert for any sign of the sea elves as he followed the same track he used last time. They were reclusive beings, but he hoped that the urgency of his predicament would prompt them to aid him. After a trek through the thick underbrush and towering trees, Asher finally came upon a clearing he had met the sea elves. He called out, his voice carrying through the jungle, Is anyone here? There was a rustling in the foliage, and a moment later, a group of sea elves emerged, their expressions a mix of curiosity and caution. Asher met their gaze with respect and explained his situation, the defeat of Whiskertus, and the mysterious island. The whispers among the sea elves grew louder as Asher shared the details of his recent encounters and victories. The elder, a figure of both wisdom and authority within their community, stepped forward with an expression that was a mix of disbelief and awe. You, you have defeated Whiskertus, the elder stammered, his voice tinged with a mix of respect and incredulity. This scourge of the seas, this bringer of terror? He paused, his gaze fixed intently on Asher. Forgive my skepticism, but Whiskertus has long been a nightmare to our people. He has slain many of our kin and was a key force in driving us from our ancestral waters. His fall, that is a matter of great significance to us. The elder's words hung heavy in the air, underscoring the magnitude of Asher's achievement. It was clear that Whiskertus was more than just another adversary. He was a symbol of oppression and fear for the sea elves. Asher felt an understanding and empathy for the sea elves. His defeat was a challenge, but knowing now the pain he has caused, I'm glad to have been the one to end him. Asher reached into his inventory, retrieving the massive spear he had claimed from Whiskertus. As the weapon emerged into the light of day, a collective gasp rippled through the group of sea elves. The spear, unmistakable in its design and aura, was a well-known symbol of Whiskertus's reign of terror. The elder's eyes widened at the sight of the weapon, now in Asher's possession. The very object that had once been a tool of fear and oppression in the hands of Whiskertus was undeniable evidence of Asher's triumph. This, this is indeed the spear of Whiskertus, the elder spoke, his voice a mixture of shock and reverence. To see it here, not in his vile grasp, but in yours, it is more proof than we could have asked for. The sea elves, now fully convinced of Asher's victory, looked at him with newfound respect and gratitude. The fall of Whiskertus was not just a personal achievement for Asher, but a significant turn of events for the sea elf community. In their eyes, Asher had transitioned from a formidable warrior to a liberator, someone who had unknowingly avenged many of their losses. I believe the fishmen may be using that island as a stronghold, he concluded. I seek your wisdom and, if you're willing, your assistance in reaching it without risking the dangers of the open sea. Your deed has lifted a great burden from our hearts, the elder continued. We will honor our word and aid you. In defeating him, you have done us a great service. The atmosphere shifted from one of skepticism to one of alliance and mutual respect. With the sea elf's support secured, the elder sea elf reached into the pocket of his flowing robe, retrieving a small object that caught the light with a subtle shimmer. He held it out towards Asher. It was a small pill. This, the elder began, is a gift. This pill will allow you to navigate underwater with the ease of a fish, and more importantly, breathe as if the water were air. Though be careful as the duration of this pill is limited. 
Asher accepted the pill with a sense of wonder and appreciation. The thought of swimming freely beneath the waves, exploring the underwater world without the constraints of human limitations, was exhilarating. This is remarkable, Asher said, examining the pill. With this, I can approach the island undetected. Chapter 47 Beneath the Sea Asher returned to the shore, the pill given to him by the sea elf elder secure in his grasp. The morning sun had climbed higher, casting a golden glow over the water. He stood at the water's edge, the gentle waves lapping at his feet, and gazed out toward the distant island. He took a deep breath, feeling the weight of expectation and the thrill of the unknown. With a resolute nod, Asher placed the pill on his tongue and swallowed. Almost immediately, he felt a subtle change coursing through his body. It was as if a wave of calm and clarity washed over him, a connection to the sea that was both foreign and natural. Stepping into the water, he braced himself for the usual resistance and chill, but was met instead with a sensation that was entirely new. The water embraced him, not as a barrier, but as an extension of himself. He took a tentative breath, and to his amazement, the water filled his lungs not with the suffocating rush of drowning, but with life-sustaining air. It was a surreal experience. He was breathing underwater as easily as he did on land. With each step, he delved deeper, the ocean floor beckoning him onward. The light from above danced in patterns through the water, illuminating an underwater world that was both beautiful and mysterious. Fish darted around him, unbothered by his presence, their scales glinting like jewels. Asher marveled at the sensation of weightlessness, the freedom of movement. He moved with a grace he had never known, each stroke and kick propelling him effortlessly forward. The ocean's depths, once a realm of silence, were now a playground for exploration. As Asher swam gracefully through the water, a thought crossed his mind about his guardian. He glanced upwards, through the clear blue, wondering if his spectral ally could follow him into this aquatic realm. To his relief, although the guardian couldn't submerge itself in the water, it floated effortlessly on the surface, mirroring Asher's path below. It seemed to possess an innate sense of where Asher was. Asher was reassured. The guardian's presence, even just above the water, was a comfort. As long as it's with me, that's all that matters, he thought, content that his guardian could accompany him to the island. With his focus back on the island, Asher increased his pace, cutting through the water with newfound urgency. He was aware that the pill's effect was finite, and every moment under its influence was precious. The island seemed to grow larger with each stroke. Asher calculated the time it would take to reach the island, considering the duration of the pill's effect. I should make it there just in time, he estimated. The thought of the pill's magic wearing off while still in the water was a risk he was aware of, but the reward of completing the side quest outweighed the danger. As Asher neared the island's shore, the anticipation of finally setting foot on the mysterious land was palpable. But just as he was about to reach the sandy beach, he sensed movement in the water around him. In a flash, he realized he was not alone, an ambush had been set. For fishmen, armed with tridents, had been lurking in the waters near the island. Their presence was a clear indication that they were guarding the island against intruders. Asher's arrival had not gone unnoticed. Underwater, Asher was at a distinct disadvantage. His movements, though aided by the pill, were no match for the natural agility of the fishmen in their element. Moreover, his guardian could not assist him beneath. Adrenaline surged through Asher as he made a split-second decision. He swam with all his might towards the shore, the fishmen in hot pursuit. They were faster, their bodies streamlined for aquatic combat, but Asher had a head start. He pushed himself to the limit, his muscles burning with the effort. Finally, with a burst of effort, Asher emerged from the water onto the island's shore. His guardian, who had been mirroring his path above the surface, landed beside him, ready to join the fight. The four fishmen soon followed, emerging from the water with menacing grace, their tridents gleaming in the sunlight. Asher stood up, water dripping from his clothes, his heart racing. He was back on his turf now, and with his guardian by his side, he was ready to face this new challenge head-on. The fishmen spread out, encircling Asher and his guardian, their tridents at the ready. Asher's eyes darting between his four adversaries. 
With a nod to his guardian, Asher prepared to engage the fishmen, the clash of battle imminent. As the fishmen closed in, Asher knew this was the moment to unleash his newly acquired skill. He focused intently, channeling his necromantic energy into the curse of agony. The air around him seemed to ripple with dark energy as he extended his hand towards the fishmen. Asher released the curse. Dark, ethereal tendrils snaked out from his hand, weaving through the air and latching onto each of the four fishmen. The effect was immediate and striking. The fishmen, once agile, suddenly slowed as if moving through thick mud. Their once fluid movements became labored and sluggish. It was as though an invisible weight had been anchored to their limbs, dragging them down and sapping their strength. Their attacks came in slow, weakened thrusts. Their tridents felt heavier in their hands, and their strikes were easily dodged by Asher and his guardian. The fishmen's expressions turned to ones of confusion and frustration as they struggled against the debilitating effects of the curse. Asher could see the curse of agony at work. Not only did it reduce their speed and weaken their attacks, but it also seemed to drain their resolve, casting a pall of despair over them. They were no longer the confident predators that had emerged from the sea. They were now the prey, hindered and vulnerable. With the fishmen slowed by the effects of agony, Asher's guardian sprang into action, capitalizing on this temporary advantage. Aware that the debilitating effect would only last for a brief ten seconds, the guardian moved with a sense of urgency, aiming to reduce their numbers as swiftly as possible. The guardian first invoked the necrotic touch buff. Dark, eerie energy crackled around the guardian's form, lending a sinister green aura to its already formidable presence. The Guardian launched into its shield throw skill. The shield, empowered by the Guardian's strength, flew through the air with incredible speed. It struck the first fishman with a resounding impact, knocking him to the ground. Then, as if guided by an unseen force, the shield ricocheted towards the next fishman, repeating the process. One after another, each fishman was hit and subsequently toppled over like dominoes, their slowed state rendering them unable to dodge or counter the assault. In moments, all four fishmen lay on the ground, momentarily incapacitated by the forceful blows from the Guardian's shield. Wasting no time, the Guardian immediately followed up with a shield charge. It targeted the nearest fishman, rushing forward with its shield leading. The impact was lethal, the sheer force of the charge proving too much for the already weakened fishman, who succumbed instantly. You have killed the fishmen. You have earned 20 EXP. 295-800 As the last effect of agony faded, the three remaining fishmen began to stir, slowly regaining their strength and speed. The brief period of vulnerability had passed, and they were now aware of the threat Asher and his guardian posed. They picked themselves up, gripping their tridents tightly, ready to engage once more. Recognizing that Agony was now on cooldown and unavailable for immediate reuse, adjusted his stance, preparing for the fishmen's counterattack. The advantage they had gained was significant, but the fishmen were still opponents to not take lightly. The Guardian, standing steadfast beside Asher, readied its shield and braced for the renewed assault. Chapter 48 The Helix Pathway as the battle with the three remaining fishmen intensified, Asher quickly assessed the situation. He knew he needed to gain control of the fight to efficiently dispatch his foes. With a strategic mind, he called out to his guardian, instructing it to use its provoke skill. The guardian, understanding Asher's command, unleashed its provoke ability. It let out a challenging shout, carrying a magical compulsion, an irresistible call to battle that targeted the fishmen directly. The effect was immediate. The fishmen, their attention now forcefully drawn to the Guardian, redirected their assault. They charged towards the Guardian, their tridents aimed with lethal intent. With the fishmen now preoccupied with the Guardian, Asher tactically retreated into a nearby large rock. He understood his role in this battle. As a support, his presence on the front line was not only unnecessary, but potentially detrimental. His strengths lay in strategy and support, not direct confrontation. Asher watched from his concealed position, confident in his guardian's resilience. He knew that the guardian was more than capable of handling the attacks from these common-ranked enemies. 
its robust defense meant that these assaults were unlikely to pose a serious threat. The Guardian, standing firm, blocked as many of the fishermen's attacks, its provocation not just a mere distraction but a tactical ploy to control the flow of battle. The Guardian's ability to mitigate damage was impressively efficient. As its health decreased, the effect of death carapace kicked in, enhancing its defensive capabilities and a direct response to the damage sustained. This level of resilience was a crucial factor in its ability to withstand the barrage from the fishmen. Congratulations! Goblin's Rejuvenator has leveled up. LV 2 3. Regan 2.5% 3%. Status Elements Duration Reduction 12% 14%. Asher couldn't help but smile at the timely upgrade. Perfect timing, he said, glancing at his guardian. This will make you tankier. The Guardian was equipped with the Goblin's Regenerator Effect, a potent passive skill that steadily replenished its health pool. This continuous regeneration of health, combined with the increased defense from Death Carapace, made the Guardian a formidable tank, capable of sustaining itself through prolonged engagements. The increase in regeneration rate from 2.5% to 3% meant that the Guardian's ability to recover health during combat was now enhanced. Even a seemingly small increment like this could have a significant impact in prolonged battles. Asher, observing from his concealed position, recognized that he did not need to expend his own mana to heal the Guardian under these circumstances. The threat posed by the fishmen, though not insignificant, was well within the Guardian's capacity to handle. This allowed Asher to conserve his mana for more critical situations that might arise. Every bit of extra rigging and resistance makes a difference. Asher mused. As Asher watched the battle unfold, he kept a keen eye on his cooldown timer. The moment it hit zero, signaling that his agony skill was ready for use again, he stepped out from his hiding spot, ready to turn the tides once more. Time to end this. Asher muttered to himself. With a swift gesture, he unleashed agony again, channeling the dark necromantic energy toward the three remaining fishmen. The tendrils of dark energy swirled and struck the fishmen, who immediately slowed, their movements becoming sluggish and their attacks less coordinated. The curse's debilitating effect was as effective as the first time, sapping their strength and speed. With the fishmen impaired, Asher called out to his guardian, Now's our chance. Finish them. The Guardian, responding to Asher's command, surged forward. It engaged the fishmen with powerful strikes, capitalizing on their weakened state. Each blow from the Guardian was precise and forceful, quickly overwhelming the fishmen. The ambush, which had initially posed a significant threat, was swiftly turning into a rout. The fishmen, unable to match the Guardian's strength and hampered by agony, were easily taken down. One by one, they fell, until the last of them lay defeated on the sandy shore. You have killed three ex-fishmen. You have earned 60 EXP. 355-800. Congratulations. Shield charge has leveled up. LV 2-3. Movement speed increased, 11%-12%. Base damage, 55-60-65-70. to to Congratulations. Shield throw has leveled up. LV 2-3. Base damage 15 to 20 20 to 25. Asher side, a mix of relief and satisfaction in his breath. Well done, he said, nodding at his guardian. That could have gone much worse. The failed ambush was a clear reminder of the dangers that lurked on the island. Asher knew that caution and strategy would be essential as he continued his exploration. With the immediate threat neutralized, Asher and his guardian proceeded further inland. While venturing deeper into the island, the terrain shifted from sandy shores to a more rugged, dense landscape. The island, while small, had a surprising diversity of environments. The foliage thickened as they moved inland, creating a canopy that dappled the ground with shadows. Despite Asher's careful search, they encountered no other fishmen. The absence of adversaries was peculiar, given their initial aggressive presence. Asher kept his guard up, knowing all too well that a lack of enemies on the surface often hinted at something more ominous lurking beneath. 
Finally, they reached the heart of the island. There, nestled among the dense trees and underbrush, lay a large cave entrance. It loomed like a gaping maw, dark and foreboding. The cave's presence on such a small island was out of place, and its size suggested it was more than just a natural formation. Asher paused at the entrance, surveying it cautiously. This has to be it, he said quietly. The remaining fishmen must be inside. The setup was all too familiar, a hidden stronghold, possibly housing not just enemies, but also clues relevant to his quest. He turned to his guardian, we need to be prepared for anything in there. Lead the way the guardian following his master's command, it stance ready and protective. With a deep breath, Asher stepped into the cave, the cool, musty air of the interior enveloping him. The interior of the cave was distinctly aquatic in nature, a clear reflection of its inhabitants. The walls were damp, with moisture seeping through the porous stone, creating a slick, wet surface that glistened in the dim light. Puddles of water collected in small basins on the uneven floor, and the air was heavy with the scent of the sea that permeated the cave. However, what truly caught Asher's attention was the unexpected source of illumination within the cave. The darkness he had anticipated was offset by a soft, radiant glow emanating from the walls and ceiling. Embedded within the rock were clusters of shiny blue ores, emitting a luminescent light that bathed the cave in a surreal, underwater-like ambience. These bright ores, scattered but plentiful in the cave, provided enough light to navigate without the need for torches. The way they lit the cave created a serene atmosphere that contrasted sharply with the potential danger lurking within. His eyes quickly adjusted to the dim light, and he proceeded with careful steps. The guardian followed suit, its heavy presence a constant reassurance. The cave stretched deeper than Asher had anticipated, its walls narrowing as they progressed. The sound of their footsteps echoed softly, the only noise in the otherwise silent expanse. Asher knew that this quietude could be shattered at any moment by the emergence of their foes. Unexpectedly, the straightforward passage he had been following came to an abrupt halt, giving way to a spiraling path that descended into the depths of the cave. The sight of the descending spiral was both intriguing and daunting, suggesting that the heart of the cave, and potentially the key to completing his side quest, lay below. The spiral path wound down around a central column of stone, like a giant helix carved into the earth. The walls of the descent were adorned with the same luminous blue ores, their glow intensifying as the path delved deeper, almost as if guiding their journey downward. Asher peered over the edge, trying to gauge the depth of the spiral. It seemed to extend far below, disappearing into the shadows despite the ethereal light from the walls. The air grew cooler as the path descended, and the sound of distant, echoing drips of water suggested the presence of underground pools. Looks like we're going deeper. Asher said, his voice resolute yet cautious. He knew that descending into the unknown posed risks, but it was a necessary step that has to be taken. Chapter 49 Updated Side Quest Asher and his guardian continued their cautious trek downward, descending into the depths of the cave. The spiral path leading them deeper made the air heavier. As they progressed, the blue light from the ores seemed to pulse with a rhythm of its own, illuminated their path. Eventually, the spiral path leveled out, opening into a vast cavern. The sight that greeted them was a subterranean world. Stalactites hung from the high ceiling like stone icicles, some dripping with mineral-rich water that formed colorful, luminescent pools on the cavern floor. But the most striking feature was at the center of the cavern, holding both a macabre and startling sight. The vast chamber was dominated by a large pool at its center, but contrary to Asher's expectations, the water did not shimmer with the tranquil blue of the oars. Instead, it was a chilling, crimson red, the color of blood. The eerie glow from the oars cast a haunting light over the pool, revealing a gruesome scene. Floating atop the blood-red waters were the bodies of numerous fishmen, their forms still and lifeless. Each corpse was decapitated. Asher stood at the edge of the pool, his heart pounding in his chest. The sight was shocking, sending a shiver down his spine. What happened here, he murmured, his voice barely a whisper in the oppressive silence of the cavern. The guardian, standing by his side, seemed to emanate a sense of alertness, as if sensing the ominous nature of the scene. 
What or who could have done this? Asher wondered aloud. The fishmen, fierce in their own right, had been reduced to lifeless driftwood in their own domain. This was no ordinary skirmish, it was a vicious extermination. He stepped cautiously around the pool, his eyes continuously scanning the shadows and recesses of the cavern. The possibility of a greater threat within these depths was very real, and Asher knew he needed to be prepared for any eventuality. Asher's gaze swept over the pool, the grim tally of corpses floating in the water rising to over twenty. His attention was then drawn to a figure on the far side of the pool, distinct from the others. This fishman was different, unique in its appearance, much like Whiskerdus had been. It lay at the water's edge, unmistakably lifeless in its seated position, with a significant portion of its upper body savagely torn away. Blood pooled around it, tainting the water with a darker hue. Curiosity peaked, Asher activated his inspection skill, focusing on the fallen figure. The information that appeared before him caused his eyes to widen in shock. Their king, the king of the fishmen, he murmured in disbelief. The guardian turned towards Asher, sensing the gravity of the revelation. Their king, Asher repeated, taken down by something even more formidable. What happened here? He took a moment to process this. The king of the fishmen, the ruler of the fishmen species, the very same race that had pushed away the sea elves, laid low in such a brutal manner. It suggested a predator or a force of immense power within the cavern, one that could effortlessly overpower such a formidable creature. This changes everything, Asher said, his voice low but firm. Whatever did this is still likely here. We need to inform the sea elves. The atmosphere in the cavern seemed to grow heavier, the weight of the unknown pressing down upon them. The eerie stillness of the cavern was abruptly shattered by a startling occurrence. Asher watched in disbelief as the corpses of the fishmen, which had been floating motionlessly, suddenly began to sink one by one into the depths of the blood-red pool. It was as if an unseen force was pulling them down, dragging them to the cavern's pool-hidden depths. As each body descended, more blood clouded the water. Asher's heart raced, sensing an impending threat. Then, he saw it, a shadowy figure moving within the water. It moved with a speed and agility that was astonishing. The figure swam through the water with such velocity that it created ripples and currents, further disturbing the once still pool. What is that? Asher whispered, his eyes intently focused on the moving shadow. The guardian, sensing Asher's tension, positioned itself protectively. The figure moved too fast to be clearly discerned, but its size and the fluidity of its movements suggested it was a creature of considerable power and danger. Asher realized that this creature might be responsible for the carnage in the cavern. Stay alert, Asher warned his guardian. Whatever that is, it's not just a simple fishman. We're dealing with something much more dangerous. The shadowy figure continued to circle in the depths, occasionally coming closer to the surface before diving back down. Asher knew that an encounter with this mysterious predator was inevitable. He readied himself, mentally preparing for a confrontation. Splash! Suddenly, from the crimson waters of the pool, a tall figure leaped out with a formidable splash, landing on the shore in front of Asher. Water cascaded off the creature. The being before Asher was a towering fishman, but unlike any he had encountered before. Its scales were a deep, iridescent blue that shimmered even in the absence of light. Adorned with intricate golden ornaments, it carried an aura of majesty to it. The creature's eyes were a piercing yellow, like a lure of a deep-sea predator, filled with malice. In its hand, it wielded a trident which pronged sharp and menacing. Asher, taken aback by the sudden appearance and the imposing figure of this fishman, steadied himself. With a flicker of his intent, he activated his inspection skill, keen to gauge the true measure of his adversary. The details that materialized before him confirmed his growing realization this was no ordinary foe. With the data from the inspection flowing before his eyes, Asher pieced together the chilling truth of the scenario. This was no fishman from this world, as he had first assumed, but something far more sinister. The creature before him was an abyssal fishman, summoned from the darkest depths through a blood sacrifice made by the fishman in the pool. Its presence here was the result of a dark and desperate ritual. 
an abyssal minion, then. Asher concluded, the pieces of the puzzle snapping into place. Brought here through the lives of its own kind, a creature of the abyss. The dwindling numbers of his fishmen foes, and the absence of Whiskertus, had driven the fishmen king to a point of desperation. In a last-ditch effort to protect his territory and his subjects, the king had resorted to a dark ritual, a blood sacrifice potent enough to call forth an ally from the abyss. The king, lying dead at the edge of the pool, bore witness to a plan gone terribly wrong. In seeking aid against the relentless enemy decimating his people, the enemy that was Asher and the Sea Elves, he had unwittingly summoned a being with no allegiance but to its own hunger. The drowned had emerged not as a savior, but as a new predator. Its appetite for blood had led to the king's demise and the slaughter of his subjects. The abyssal fishman, it seemed, was indiscriminate in its feeding, recognizing only the call of blood from the surface dwellers. The gruesome turn of events added a chilling and unpredictable situation. Something unexpected was unfolding. Objective updated. Side quest objective the sea elves stand has updated. Diminish the fishmen's numbers on the shore, 54 slash 100 dash defeat the drowned, abyss fishmen sentry. The twist of fate in the cavern transformed Asher's side quest into a grimmer and more dangerous task than he could have anticipated. A new objective crystallized on his interface, reflecting the dire turn of events. Asher glanced at his guardian. This changes our course, but not our objective. The creature's gills flared, and suddenly, it let loose an ear-piercing screech that reverberated off the cavern walls. Screech Chapter 50 Echoes from the Abyss The screech from the abyssal horror still hung in the air. The cavern's luminescent light pulsed with rhythm, casting an otherworldly hue on the combatants. Asher could feel the anominous aura emitting off of the abyss sentry, a cold, deep call that was as alluring as it was terrifying. With a sudden burst of speed that belied its size, the drowned lunged forward, its trident slicing through the air towards Asher. He rolled to the side, narrowly avoiding the deadly prongs, and his guardian countered with a swing of its shield, aimed at the creature's side. The drowned's uncanny perception was unsettling. It felt like its eyes pierced beyond the physical realm to the very essence of beings. The guardian's protective stance in front of Asher seemed almost futile as the creature discerned the true source of its life force. With an almost dismissive agility, it dodged the guardian's attacks, its focus locked unwaveringly on Asher. Asher's heart skipped as the drowned surged past the guardian, its intention clear, it was aiming for him, the nexus of the guardian's existence. He had not expected to encounter a creature with such a profound understanding of their bond, a creature that saw the guardian not as a separate entity but as an extension of Asher's ability. Just as the drowned closed in, the guardian acted with desperate speed, unleashing its provoked skill. The creature's charge came to an abrupt halt, its attention snapped back to the guardian. Asher felt a momentary rush of triumph, believing he had regained control of the situation. However, the feeling was short-lived. In the depths of his memory, Asher recalled his battle with the zombified warden, a being impervious to taunts due to its innate resistance. The drowned, the abyssal fishman sentry, has activated sentry stance. All status effects currently impacting the user are now purged. Sentry stance. Of course, he had to also have one. Asher realized as the drowned shook off the effect of the provoke skill with chilling indifference. Asher understood he was facing an opponent with capabilities that rivaled boss rank monster. This was no mere beast acting on instinct, but a creature with the intelligence to discern and counteract strategies. Asher's encounters with champion rank monsters were few, but each had been a harrowing testament to their might, far eclipsing the power of Floor's respective bosses. He recalled his battle with the Widowblood, a formidable foe birthed from the Birdmother's sacrifice, a creature that wielded powers which defied explanation. In this heightened difficulty, the hard mode, Asher had learned to expect the extraordinary, where the impossible became the norm. The evidence was clear and present, the champion before him possessed strength that transcended the Floor's requirement. It had not just bested, but personally executed the boss of its own kind, a demonstration of its superior strength. 
With the gravity of the situation pressing upon him, Asher's voice cut through the cavern's tension, clear and commanding. Stay with me, fight smart, he called out to his guardian. This creature knows our bond, if I fall, you fall with me. The guardian, responding to Asher's voice, adjusted its stance, ready to adapt to the fluid dynamics of this unprecedented battle. Their enemy was not just another adversary, it was a being that recognized the interconnected fates of Asher and his guardian. This understanding made it a far more dangerous opponent than any they had faced before. The guardian, ever vigilant, stayed unwaveringly close to Asher, using its shield to deflect each of the fishmen's fierce attacks. The creature's strikes were powerful and precise, but the guardian's defense was a formidable barrier, its shield moving with precision to protect Asher. Asher, meanwhile, found himself in a precarious situation. He was unable to launch any offensive skills to assist his guardian, forcing them into a defensive posture, with the guardian absorbing the brunt of the onslaught and Asher thinking of an opportunity to turn the tide. Despite the Guardian's committed defense, Asher knew they couldn't maintain this passive stance indefinitely. They needed to shift the dynamics of the battle. As the Guardian parried another blow, Asher spotted his chance. Time to change the game, Asher muttered. He focused his energy, summoning the dark tendrils of agony once more. With a swift motion, he unleashed the curse towards the drowned. The sudden shift in the situation was like a cold shock to Asher. As the tendrils of agony that were meant to weaken his enemy changed color from dark purple to a sinister dark green, it became evident that something had gone terribly wrong. The curse, intended to debilitate, was instead being absorbed and transformed, empowering the very creature it was meant to hinder. Asher's heart sank as a system notification appeared, clarifying the grim reality. The drowned, the abyssal fishman sentry, has activated reverse flow. All action speed debuffs will have their effects reversed. Reverse flow. This revelation hit Asher with the force of a physical blow. The drowned, already a formidable foe, was now enhanced by Asher's own skill. The creature's movements, which should have slowed, became alarmingly faster. Each strike, more forceful and swift, turned him into a whirlwind of deadly efficiency. A counter ability. Asher muttered, realization dawning on him. He had walked into a trap of his own making, his reliance on agony backfiring spectacularly. The Guardian, sensing the shift in his enemy power, adjusted its tactics, moving to intercept the faster, more potent attacks. But even its reliable defense struggled under the relentless and now enhanced assault. Asher knew they were at a critical juncture. The advantage they thought they had gained had turned the battle into an even more perilous struggle for survival. His mind raced, searching for a new strategy, a way to counteract the unexpected turn of events. Think, think. Asher urged himself. He had to find a weakness, a chink in the abyssal creature's armor. Asher's mind raced, but every strategy he conjured seemed futile against the empowered might of the drowned. His skill set, though diverse, offered no clear solution to the predicament they now faced. The creature's newfound speed and strength, a direct consequence of his own actions, had tipped the scales dramatically. In a blur of motion, the drown struck with overwhelming force. The Guardian, despite its best efforts, was caught off guard by the sheer power of the attack. With a mighty blow, it was sent reeling through the air, crashing into Asher. Thud! Agar. The force of the impact propelled them both across the cavern, their bodies slamming into a nearby wall with a bone-jarring thud. Pain shot through Asher's body, his breath knocked out of him. He lay there, dazed. As he struggled to regain his senses, the grim realization settled in they were outmatched. The drowned, already a formidable foe by nature of its rank and level, had become an insurmountable adversary. The moment of reckoning was upon him. The harsh truth that he had bitten off more than he could chew loomed large in his mind. Asher had faced many dangers in the tower, but this was different. This was a champion-ranked creature, a being that surpassed the very concept of a boss monster. And now, with its abilities enhanced further by his own skill, it seemed invincible. Despair crept into Asher's heart, the weight of inevitable defeat pressing down on him. 
He had pushed his limits, challenged the odds, but this time, it seemed the tower had the upper hand. As the embodiment of the abyssal raised its trident for the final blow, Asher's guardian, unwavering in its loyalty, positioned its battered shield to protect its master one last time. The guardian stood firm, a silent sentinel even in the face of certain defeat, taking the barrage of sharp, penetrating attacks that unleashed with relentless fury. Each strike diminished the guardian's health points, visibly draining its vitality with each successive blow. Asher, witnessing the guardian's steadfast defense, felt a surge of resolve mixed with anguish. He couldn't let his guardian, his companion through countless trials, fall like this. His hand moved instinctively towards his healing ability, ready to pour his mana into sustaining the guardian's fading life. But in that moment of desperate struggle, a spark of inspiration struck him. Amidst the chaos and the looming shadow of defeat, a new strategy began to form in his mind. It was a gamble, a last-ditch effort born from the urgency of their plight. Asher realized that conventional tactics were futile. To turn the tide, Asher needed to gamble with their own lives. His decision was made in a heartbeat. He lowered his hand, abandoning the intention to heal his guardian. Instead, he focused all his energy on a single, decisive gamble, a last resort born out of desperation and the slim hope of turning the dire situation around. Death's caress, you are our last hope, he declared.